foreword of the stone axe of berkamuk this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in september 2014 the stone axe of berkamuk by mary grant bruce foreword year by year the old black tribes are dying out and many of their legends and beliefs are dying with them these legends deal with the world as the blacks knew it with the bush animals and birds the powers of storm flood fire thunder and magic and the beings who they thought controlled these powers with the sun moon and stars and with the life and death of men and women many of the old tales are savage enough but through them runs a thread of feeling for the nobler side of life so far as these wild people could grasp it the spirit of self-sacrifice is seen in them and greed selfishness and cruelty are often punished as they deserve we are apt to look on the blacks as utter barbarians but as we read their own old stories we see that they were boys and girls men and women not so unlike us in many ways and that they could admire what we admire in each other and condemn what we would condemn the folk tales of a people are the story of its soul and it would be a pity if the native races of our country were to vanish altogether before we had collected enough of their legends to let their successors know what manner of people lived in australia for thousands of years before the white man came some valuable collections have indeed been made but they are all too few and there must even today be many people especially in the wilder parts of australia who are in touch with the aborigines and could if they would get the old men and women to tell them the stories which were handed down to them when they were children in the hope of persuading all young australians who have the opportunity to collect and preserve what they can of the ancient life and legends of australia i have put into modern english a few of the tales which may still be had from some old blackfellow or gin m g b end of forward Section 1 of The Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk. Chapter 1 the camp lay calm and peaceful under the spring sunlight berkamuk the chief had chosen its place well the whirlies were built in a green glade well shaded with blackwood and pubiala trees and with a soft thick carpet of grass on which the black babies loved to roll not a hundred yards away flowed a wide creek a creek so excellent that it fed a swamp a little farther on the blacks loved to be near a swamp for it was as good as a storehouse of food the women used to go there for lily pads and sedge roots and the men would spear eels in its muddy waters while at times big flocks of ducks settled on it beside other waterfowl berkamuk was a very wise chief and all his people were fat and therefore contented as blacks count wealth, the people of Berkamuk were very well off. They had plenty of skin rugs, so that no one went cold, even in the winter nights, and the women had made them well, sewing them together with the sinews of animals, using for their needles the small bone of a kangaroo's hind leg, ground to a fine point. It was hard work to sew these well, but the men used to take pains to get good skins, pegging them out with tea-tree spikes, and dressing them with wood ashes and fat, which they rubbed in until the skins were soft and supple. 
and so the women thought that the least they could do was sew them in the very best way. Being particular about the rugs made the women particular about other things as well, and they had a far better outfit than could be found in most camps. Each woman had a good pitchy, a small wooden trough hollowed out of the soft wood of the bean tree, in which food was kept. When the tribe went traveling, the peachy was as useful as a suitcase is to a white Australian girl. The lubras packed them with food, and carried them, balanced on their heads, or slung to one hip by a plate of human hair, or a fur band, and sometimes a big pitchy was made by a proud father, and beautifully carved with a stone knife, and used as a cradle for a fat black baby. Then the women used to weave baskets made of a strong kind of rush, ornamented with colored patterns and fancy stitches. And each one had, as well, a bag made of the tough inner bark of the acacia tree, or sometimes of a messmate or stringy bark, in which she kept food, sticks and tinder for starting a fire, wattle gum for cements, shells, tools, and all sorts of charms to keep off evil spirits. They had a queer kind of cooking pot, in which they used to dissolve gum and manna. These pots were made out of big, rough lumps that grow out of old gum trees, hollowed out by a chisel made of a kangaroo's thigh bone. The women used to put gum and manna in these and place them near the fire, so that water gradually heated without burning the wood. There was no pottery among the blacks, and so they could never boil food but they contrived to make pleasant warm drinks in these wooden pots. When it came to baking, however, the women of the tribe were well able to turn out toothsome roasts. Their ovens were holes in the ground, plastered with mud, and then filled with fire until the clay was very hot. When the temperature was right, the embers were taken out, and the holes lined with wet grass. The food, flesh, fish, or roots, were packed in rough rush baskets and placed in ovens, and covered with more wet grass, hot stones, gravel, and earth, until the holes were quite airtight. The women liked to do this in the evening, so that the food cooked slowly all night, and often all the cooking was done in a few big ovens, and next morning each family came to remove its basket of food. And if you had come along breakfastless, just as the steaming baskets were taken out, and had been asked to join in eating a plump young bandicoot, or wallaby, or a fat black fish. Well, even though there were no plates, or knives, or forks, I do not think you would have grumbled at your meal. The men of Burkamuk's tribe were well armed. Their boomerangs, spears, and throwing sticks were all of the best, and they had, in addition, Knives made of splinters of flint or sharpened mussel shell lashed into handles. Some had skinning knives made of the long front teeth of the bandicoot, with the jaw left on for a handle, and they worked kangaroo bones into all kinds of tools. But Burkamuk himself had a wonderful weapon, the only one in all that district, a mighty axe. It was made of green stone, wedge-shaped and sharply ground at one edge, this was grasped in the bend of a double piece of split sapling, and tightly bound round with kangaroo sinews, and the handle thus formed was additionally strengthened by being cemented to the head by a mixture of gum and shell-lime. It was not a very easy matter to make that cement. First, mussel shells were burned to make the lime, and pounded in a hollow stone. Then wattle gum was chewed for a long time and placed between sheets of green bark, which were laid in a shallow hole in the ground and covered with hot ashes until the gum was dissolved, when it was kneaded with the lime into a tough paste. The blacks would have been badly off without that cement, but not all of them would go to the trouble of making it as thoroughly as did the men of Burkamuk's tribe. All the best workmanship had gone to the manufacture of Burkamuk's axe, and the whole tribe was proud of it. Sometimes the chief would lend it to the best climbers among his young men, who used it to cut steps in the bark of trees when they wanted to climb in search of monkey bears or possums, or he would let them use it to strip sheets of bark from the trees to make their whirlies. 
Those to whom the axe was lent always showed their sense of honor done them by making payment in kinda. The fattest of the game caught, or a finely woven rush mat would be laid at the chief's door. If this had not been done, Burkamuk would probably have looked wise next time someone had wished to borrow his axe, and would have remarked that he had work for it himself. Even though he occasionally lent the axe, Burkamuk never let it go out of his sight. It was far too precious a possession for that. He too went hunting when the axe went, or watched it used to prize great strips of thick bark off the trees, and he probably worried the borrower very much by continually directing how it should be handled. Not that the young men would have taken any risks with it. It was the chief's axe, but its possession brought dignity upon the whole tribe. Other chiefs had axes, more or less excellent, but there was no weapon in all the countryside so famous as the axe of Burkamuk. I doubt whether the king of England have valued their crown jewels so highly as Burkamuk valued his stone treasure with sapling handle. Certainly they cannot have found them half so useful. On this spring afternoon, Burkamuk was coming up from the swamp where he had been spearing eels. He had been very successful. Koron, his wife, walked behind him carrying a dozen fine specimens, and thinking how good a supper she would be able to cook, and how delighted her little boy Tumbo would be. For of all things Tumbo loved to eat ill. Just at the edge of the camp Burkamuk stopped, frowning. A hunting party of young men had evidently just returned. They were the center of a group in the middle of the camp, and still they were carrying their spears and throwing sticks. They were talking loudly and gesticulating, and it was clear that those who listened to them were excited and distressed. There were anxious faces, and the women were crying, Yakai! Alas! The chief strode up to the group. What is the matter? he asked. The men turned, saluting him respectfully. We have fallen on evil times, chief, their leader answered. Little game have we caught, and we have lost Congarn. Lost him? How? There is a great and terrible beast in the country to which we went, answered Tulum, the young warrior. The men of the friendly tribe we passed told us of him, and we thought they were joking with us, for it seemed a foolish tale, only fit to make women afraid. They told us of a great kangaroo they called Kupuri, larger than a dozen kangaroos and fiercer than any animal that walks on the earth, and they warned us not to go near his country. A kangaroo as large as a dozen, said Burkamuk. Kai, but I would like to see such a beast the whole tribe could feed on him. Ay, they might, if one had the luck to be able to kill him, said Tulum sorrowfully. But a kangaroo of that size is no joke to encounter. What? said Burkamuk. Do you mean me to believe that there is truly such a kangaroo? There is indeed, Tulum answered. We also did not believe. We went on, thinking that the other tribe merely wished to keep us away from a good hunting ground. We took no precautions, and we came upon him suddenly. And he was a big kangaroo, do you say? Tolum flung out his hands. There are no words to tell you of his bigness, O chief, he said, and his voice shook with terror. Never has such an animal been seen before. Black is he, and huge, and fierce, and when he saw us he roared and rushed upon us. There was no time to do battle. He was honest almost before one could fling a spear. Congarn was nearest, and he went down with one blow of the monster's foot, his head crushed. Me he struck at, but luckily for me I was almost out of his reach. Still, he touched me. See? He moved aside his possum skins and showed long wounds running from his shoulder to his wrist wounds that looked as though they had been made by great claws. Burkamuk looked at them closely. No small beast did that, he said. You are lucky to be alive, Tolum. Aye, said Tolum briefly. Indeed, I thought for a while that I was as dead as Congarn, but I managed to dodge behind a tree, and the bush was thick, so that by great good fortune I got away. Kupari gave chase, but we all scattered, and luckily the one he chose to follow was Woma, 
who is the swiftest of us all, and Woma gave him the slip without much trouble, for Kuperi is so great that he cannot get through the trees quickly. So we came together again after a day and a night, and travelled home swiftly. And none of you went back to avenge Kongarn? the chief asked sternly. Tolum looked at him with a curious mixture of shame and defiance. Nay, he said, none of us have ever been reckoned cowards, and yet we did not go back. An ordinary enemy would not have made us afraid, but there is something about Kuperi that turns the very heart to water. We hated ourselves, we hate ourselves still, for not going back. The blood of Kongarn cries out to us for vengeance on his slayer, and in our sleep we see our comrade with his head crushed by that terrible foot, and yet we could not turn. We have come home to you like frightened children, and shame is on our heads. We know not how to face Kongarn's wife, who sits there and cries, Yakai, before her whirly. Another of the warriors, Woma, the swift-footed, spoke up with sullen anger in his voice. We are shamed, he said, but there is magic in it. No true animal is Kupari, but an evil spirit. No man could possibly stand before him. To put anything they could not understand down to the score of magic and evil spirits was the usual custom of the blacks. But this time it seemed more than usually likely to be true. The Mekigar, or medicine men, nodded wisely, and the women all shuddered and wailed afresh, while the men looked anxious and afraid. Berkamuk thought for a moment before replying. He was a very wise chief and while he was just afraid of magic as any other black fellow, still he had the safety of his tribe to consider. "'That is all very well,' he said at length. "'Very likely it is true, and it may not be true after all. Kupari may be no more than a very wonderful kangaroo who has managed to grow to an enormous size. If that is so, he will want much food, and gradually he will hunt farther and farther.' all over the country, until at last he will come here. Then we shall all suffer. Aye, said the men, that is true, but what can we do? I will not sit down quietly until I know for certain that Kupari is magic, said Berkamuk, striking the ground with the butt of his eel-spear. If indeed he be magic, then it will be the part of the Makigar to deal with him. But first I would have my young men prove whether they cannot avenge Kongarn. It is in my mind that this Kupari is no more than a huge animal, and I want his blood. Who will shed it for me? There was no lack of brave warriors among the men of Burkamuk. A shout went up from them, and immediately forty or fifty sprang before him waking all the bush echoes with their yells of defiance against Kupari or any other giant animal, whether kangaroo or anything else. Only Tullum and the hunters who had been with him hung back, and they were unnoticed in the general excitement. "'Ye are too many,' Berkamuk said, surveying them proudly. Ten such men should be a match for any kangaroo.' He ran his eye over them rapidly and counted out half a score by name. Then he bade the other volunteers fall back, so that the chosen warriors were left standing alone. "'It is well,' he said. "'Namba shall be your leader, and you will obey him in all things. Find out from Tulum where to look for this Kupari, and see that you go warily, and that your weapons are always ready. Go!' Seek Kupari, and ere seven sleeps have gone, bring me his tail to eat. He stalked towards his whirly. The young men, shouting yells of battle, rushed for their weapons. In ten minutes they had gone, running swiftly over the plain, and the camp was quiet again, save for the cries of Kongarn's wife as she mourned for her husband. But alas, within a few days the wife of Kongarn was not the only woman to bewail her dead. In less than a week the hunting party was back, and without three of its bravest warriors. The survivors told the same story as Tolum and his men. They had found Kupari, this time roaming through the bush in search of food, 
and he had uttered a roar and rushed upon them. They had fought, they said, but unavailingly. Spears and throwing sticks seemed to fall back blunted from the monster's hide, and two of the men had been seized and devoured, while the third, Namba, who rushed wildly in, frantically endeavoring to save them, had been crushed to the earth with one sweeping blow. Then terror, overwhelming and unconquerable, had fallen on the seven men who remained, and they had fled, not stopping until they were far away. Weaponless and ashamed, they crept back to the camp with their miserable story. Burkamuk heard them in silence. Other chiefs might have been angry, and inflicted fierce punishments, but he knew that to such men there could be no heavier penalty than to return beaten and afraid. He nodded when they had finished. "'Then it would surely seem that Kupari is magic,' he said. "'Therefore no man can deal with him save only the medicine men. Go to your whirlies and rest.' The Mekigar were not all anxious for the task of ridding the earth of Kupari, but since their art, like that of all medicine men, consisted in saying as little as possible, they dared not show their disinclination. Instead, they accepted Berkamuk's instructions in owl-like silence, making themselves look as wise as possible, and nodding as though giant kangaroos came their way and were swept out of it every day in the week. Then they withdrew to a lonely place outside their camp and began their spells. They lit tiny fires and burned scraps of kangaroo hide, throwing the ashes in the air and uttering terrible curses against Kupari. Also they secretly weaved many magic spells. Sitting by their little fires and keeping a sharp lookout lest any of the tribe should see what they were doing, an unnecessary precaution, since the tribe was far too terrified of magic to go anywhere near them. When they had been at work for what they considered a sufficient length of time, they packed up all their charms in skin bags and returned to the camp, where they told Berkamuk that Kupari was probably dead as a result of their incantations. "'But if he is not,' said their headman, then it is because we have nothing belonging to Kupari himself to make spells with. If we had so much of a hair of his tail, or even one of the bones that he has gnawed, then we could make such a spell that nothing in the world could stand against it. As it is, we have done wonderful things, and he is very likely dead. Certainly no other Mekigar could have done as much." Berkamuk thanked the Mekigar very respectfully. He did not understand their magic at all, and he was badly afraid of all magic. Still, he knew that the Mekigar did not always succeed in their undertakings, and he felt that though their spells were, no doubt, strong, there was quite a chance that Kupari was stronger. He would have felt much happier had the Mekigar been able to prove that the enemy was dead. If I could give them a hair of his tail, thought he, there would be no need for spells, since Kupari would certainly be dead before he allows anyone to meddle with his tail. It was with them some bitterness that he dismissed the wise men, giving them a present of roasted wallaby. It was not long before proof came that the magic of the Mekigar had been at fault. Berkamuk's young men, out hunting, met a hunting party of a friendly tribe, from whom they learned that the great kangaroo was fiercer and more powerful than ever, and had slain many men in the country to the north. As Berkamuk had foreseen, he was ranging farther and farther afield, so that no district could feel safe from him. It could only be a question of time before Kupari would wander down to his country. Berkamuk held a council of war that night, at which all the warriors and the Mekigar were present. The chief wanted to lead his best men against the monster, but the Mekigar opposed the suggestion vigorously, saying that it was not right for the head of the tribe to run into a danger such as this. An ordinary battle was all very well, but this was magic, and against it chiefs were just as ordinary men 
and where would the tribe be without its mighty head? The warriors supported the Mekigar, and they all argued about it until Berkamuk was ready to lose his temper. He had no wish to see his best hunters grow fewer and fewer. Already two expeditions had ended in disaster and loss. The discussion was becoming an angry one when suddenly the chief's two eldest sons, Inda and Pilla, rose and spoke. They were young men, but already they were renowned hunters, famous at tracking and killing game, and besides their skill with weapons, it was said that they had learned from the Mekigar much wisdom beyond the knowledge of ordinary men. Straight and tall as young rushes, they faced their father. Let us go, Inda said. Pilla and I. Numbers are useless against Kuperi. It is only cunning that will slay him, and for that two men are better than a score. Give us a trial, and if we fail, then will be time enough to talk of a great expedition. The chief looked at them with angry unhappiness. And if you fail, he said, then I shall have lost my sons. What of that? asked Pilla. You have other sons, and we will have died for the tribe. That is the right of a chief's son. Other men's sons have tried, and some of them have died. Now it is our turn. A murmur of dissent ran round the circle, for Pilla and Inda were much loved, and they were very young. But Berkamuk looked at them proudly, though his face was very sad. They say rightly, he said. They are the chief's sons, and it is their privilege, if need be, to die for the tribe. Go then, my sons, and may Pondagel make your hearts cunning, and your aim steady when you meet Kuperi. There is one thing we desire, Inda said. Will you lend us your stone axe, my father? It seems to us that Kuperi will fall to no ordinary weapon, and a dream has come to us that bides us to take the axe, but that is for you to say. It is a great thing to ask, but if we live we will bring it back to you in safety. Berkamuk signed to a young man who stood near him, and bade him fetch the axe from his whirly. When it came he handed it to his sons. It is a great treasure, but you are my sons, and you are worthy to bear it, he said. Never before has it left my sight in the hands of any warrior, and I would that I were the one to wield it against Kuperi. Good luck go with it, and with you, my sons. So Inda and Pilla made themselves ready to go, preparing as if they were to take part in a splendid korobori. They painted themselves with white stripes and over and under their eyes and on their cheeks drew streaks of red ochre. Round their heads they wore twisted bands of fur, and in these bands they stuck plumes, made of the white quill feathers of a black swan's wing. Kangaroo teeth were fastened in their hair, and necklaces of the same teeth hung down upon their breasts. From their shoulders hung the tails of young dingoes, they wore belts and aprons of wallaby skin, and fastened behind to these belts stiff upright tufts of the neck feathers of the emu, like the tail of a cock. They bore many weapons, and each took it in turn to carry the stone axe of Berkamuk. The whole tribe came out to watch them go, and while the men were envious, the women wailed sadly, for they were young, and it seemed they were going forth to die. End of section one. Section two of The Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce Chapter 2 
Pilla and Inda traveled swiftly through the bush for the first two days of their journey. They passed through good hunting country, where they were tempted by the sign of much game, but they would not allow themselves to turn aside, greatly as they longed for fresh meat. They carried a little food with them, and were fortunate in finding much boombol, which the white people afterwards called manna, a sweet, white substance rather like small pieces of loaf sugar, with a very delicate flavor. Boombol drops from the leaves and small branches of some kinds of gum trees, and the blacks loved to eat it, so Pilla and Inda thought themselves very lucky. They met friendly blacks now and then, as they traveled, and heard many stories of the ferocity of Kupari. Some of the reports were very terrifying. It was difficult to find out how huge he was, for he seemed to grow in size according to the terror of the men who had seen him, some of whom said he was as large as any gum tree. But all were agreed as to his fierceness. He devoured men in a single gulp. He struck them down as one might strike a eucherne or lizard. His swiftness in pursuit was terrible to see. The man he chased had no chance whatever, unless he managed to reach thick timber, where Cooperie's size prevented his taking the gigantic leaps which so quickly ended a chase on open ground. And about all the tales hung the sense of blind fear which the great beast seemed to inspire. No matter how brave a fighting man might be, the sight of Cooperie seemed to turn his heart to water, making him long only to flee like a frightened child. Their voices shook with terror as they spoke of him. It seems to me, said Inda, as they journeyed on after having talked to some of these hunters, that our first thought should be for ourselves. All these men have thought themselves very brave, and have gone out to meet Kupari, never doubting that they would not be afraid, and they have become very afraid indeed. Now, you and I are no cowards in ordinary fighting and we have had no fear of ourselves. But I think we had better make up our minds that we certainly shall become afraid, and decide what to do. I do not wish to lose my senses and run away like a beaten pickaninny. That is good sense, said Pilla. Perhaps if we manage to keep our heads during the first terror, it might pass after a time, so that we should again be as men. That is my idea, Inda answered. And if Cooperi did not happen to see us while we were afraid, so much the better for us. I do not believe that fear will be with us always, but still we are no better than all these other men. I believe we will get an attack of it, and then it will pass off, like an attack of sickness, if we treat it properly. Yes, said Pilla, nodding. But if we run away, we shall be afraid forever, always supposing we are not dead. If we run away, the one that Cooperi runs after will certainly be dead, Inda said. Therefore, let us go warily, and perhaps we can manage so that he does not see us during our first fear. It is a queer thing, Pilla said, laughing, for hunters to go out making certain of being afraid. I think it is a safe thing just now, said Inda shortly. This hunting is not like other hunting. So they went on, keeping a very sharp lookout, and having their weapons always ready. The stone axe of Berkemuk was rather troublesome to them, for their hands were encumbered with spears and throwing sticks, and they were not used to carrying an axe. So, at last, Inda twisted strings of bark and slung it across his shoulders, where it felt much more comfortable. Soon they came upon traces of the great beast they sought. The forest began to be full of his tracks, and the saplings had been pulled about and gnawed by some creature larger than anything they had ever seen. And then, one evening, they heard running feet, and, leaping to one side, spear in hand, they saw half a dozen men racing through the bush, blind with terror. One slipped and fell near where they were standing, and rolled almost to their feet. Pilla and Inda drew him into a thicket. Is Cooperie after you? they asked. The man rolled his eyes upwards. He has slain two of us, and is now in pursuit of us all, he panted. Let me go. 
he scrambled to his feet and dashed away. Pilla and Inga crouched low in the thicket, seeing nothing. But presently they heard a mighty pounding through the trees fifty yards away, and though nothing was visible, the sound of those great leaps was so terrifying in itself that they found themselves trembling. The pounding died away in the direction in which the blacks had gone. Kai, what a tail he must have that makes the earth shake as he goes, Inda muttered. Never have I heard anything like it. Art afraid, Pilla? Very much, I believe, said Pilla. But it will pass, I feel sure. Brother, it seems to me that Cooperee's den must not be far off, and it would be safe to try to find it, since he has gone southward for his hunting, and most likely he will return slowly. Let us push on, while we can go quickly. That is good talk, Inda answered. Perhaps we can hide ourselves near his den, and watch him without being seen. I should like to get my terror over in a high tree. I, too, said Pilla. I fancy the attack might pass more quickly. Let us hurry. They pushed onward as fast as possible. It was not hard to find the way, for the blacks had fled too madly to trouble about leaving tracks, and the marks of their running made a clear path to native eyes. Soon, too, they came upon Cooperie's tracks, great footprints and deep depressions in the earth where his enormous tail had hit the ground at every bound. Then the bush became more and more beaten down, as though some great animal roamed through it constantly, and at last they found the body of a hunter struck down from behind as he ran. It was no playful tap that killed him, said Pilla with a shudder. The other, I suppose, was eaten as Cooperie loves to eat men, in one gulp. See, Inda, is that not where he sleeps? They were near a cleared space where the ground was much trampled. Bones lay here and there, and in the shadow of a dense lightwood tree in the middle of the grass showed clearly where a great body had often lain. No kangaroo has any kind of hole, for they love the bush to sleep in, and Cooperi was evidently like other kangaroos in this. Probably he changed his home often, but this was a good place, ringed about with bushes that made it quiet and hard to find, so that no enemy was likely to come upon him too suddenly, while from his lair under the lightwood he could see anything approach. Men, or animals, or leaves, it does not seem to matter to him what he eats, said Inda, looking at the lair. No wonder he grows huge. Pilla, I am very afraid, but I feel I will not always be afraid. Let us climb up into the lightwood tree. He will never see us among its thick leaves. Then he will come home tired, and perhaps we can spear him as he sleeps. They climbed into the dense branches, mounting high and choosing stout limbs to lie on where they could peer down below, and they fixed their spears and other weapons so that they could use them easily. The stone axe of Berkamuk was much in Inda's way in climbing, and finally he untied it from his shoulders. I do not see how I can use this in the tree, he said, so I will strike it into the trunk, so that we can get at it handily if we need it. He smote it against the trunk, and the wood held it fast. Then he and Pilla took their places and watched for the coming of Kuperi. They had not long to wait. Presently there came, far off, the sounds of great bounds and breaking saplings, not as they heard it last, in the fierceness of pursuit, but slowly, as a man may return home after successful hunting. The brothers felt their hearts thumping as they waited. Nearer and nearer came the sound, and soon the bushes parted, and a mighty kangaroo hopped into the clearing. So huge was he, so black and fierce, that they caught at each other in terror. Never had they dreamed of any kangaroo like this. His fur was thick and long, and of a glossy black, his head carried proudly aloft, his great tail like the limb of a tree, and in his gleaming eyes, and on his fierce face, was an expression of cunning and ferocity that, even more than his size, made him unlike any animal the bush had ever known. Something of mystery and terror seemed to surround him. It was indeed clear that he was magic. 
Pilla and Inda trembled, so that they feared that the lightwood would shake and reveal them to the monster. He sat down, out on the clear space, and rubbed his mouth with his forepaws, sniffing at the air so that they fell into a further terror, thinking he had smelt them out. But one black fellow smells much like another, and Coopery had recently dealt with three blacks. If he noticed any unusual odor, he put it down to his late meal. He felt sleepy and well fed. He had enjoyed both his run and his meal. Now he only wanted sleep. He hopped towards the lightwood, and, at his coming, Pilla and Indeth felt themselves gripped by overmastering fear. Their teeth chattered, their dry tongues seemed to choke them. They clung to their boughs, dreading lest their trembling hold should loosen, bringing them tumbling at his feet. So, gripping with toes and fingers, with sweating cheeks pressed closely to the limbs, with staring eyes that peered downwards, they watched the dreadful beast come. He came in under the tree and lay down, stretching himself out to sleep, and in a few moments his heavy breathing showed that he had passed quietly into slumber. As they watched, something of their terror left the brothers. Asleep, Coopery was not so horrible. He looked, indeed, not so unlike any other kangaroo, with his fierce eyes veiled and the strength of his great body relaxed. "'I believe my time of fear is passing,' Inda whispered. "'He is but a kangaroo, after all.' "'Yes, but what a terrible one,' murmured Pilla, as well as his chattering teeth would let him. "'Still, we are mighty hunters, and no fools. Unless he is really magic, we should be able to subdue him. I am beginning to feel a man again.' We do not know for certain that he is magic. Let us believe, then, that he is not, and that will help us," Inda whispered. Why should we not spear him as he lies? We might easily do it. Let us creep to the lower boughs, where we shall have more room to move our arms. Art afraid any longer, Inda? Not as I was, Inda replied, at least not while he sleeps. Then let us try to arrange that he shall never wake, Pilla murmured. Very softly, with infinite caution, they crept down the tree, until they came to the great lower limbs. Here they had space to swing their arms, and they made their weapons ready. Below, the huge kangaroo never stirred. His deep breathing, telling of sound slumber, was music in the ears of the brothers. They nodded a signal to each other as they poised their first spears. So swiftly did they throw that before Coopery was aroused from his sleep, a shower of throwing sticks and spears had hurtled through the air. Not one missed. The mark was easy, and the brothers were proved hunters. The weapon sped fast and true. But a terrible thing happened. Each point, as it struck Coopery's fur, became blunt and, instead of piercing him in fifty places, the weapons fell back from him, spent and useless. With a groan of fear, the brothers grasped at the branches and swung themselves aloft. Below, Coopery's roar of fury drowned all other sounds. He sprang to his feet, his eyes blazing. He had received no injury, but he had been touched. That, in itself, was an indignity he had never suffered before. With another earth-shaking roar, he looked about for his foes. To be attacked from the air was a new experience for Coopery. All his other enemies had come upon him out of the bush, and it never occurred to him, in his rage, to look upward, where the shaking of the branches would certainly have revealed the terrified Pilla and Inda. Instead, seeing nothing, Coopery made sure that the trees concealed the attackers. He roared again, dreadfully, and bounded across the clearing. The bush closed behind him, but the sky rang with the echo of his terrible voice and the thud of the leaps that carried him rapidly away. Coopery sleeping and Coopery awake and angry were two very different beings, and with the first movement of the monster all their fear had come back to Pilla and Inda. 
As roar succeeded roar, they became more and more weak with terror. Their grips on the bows relaxed with the trembling of their hands, and even as Coopery bounded away, they lost their hold and tumbled bodily out of the tree. It was not far to the ground, but Pilla happened to fall first, and Inda fell on top of him, and they managed to hurt each other a great deal. They were in that excited and overwrought state when anything seems an injury, and each lost his temper. "'You did that on purpose!' Pilla said, striking at his brother. "'Take that!' "'Would you?' said Inda between his teeth. "'I'll teach you to hit me!' He stooped and picked up one of the throwing sticks and flung it at his brother. It hit Pilla violently on the nose and made him furiously angry. He gathered an armful of the fallen spears and, running back, threw them at Inda so swiftly that there was no time to dodge. They hit him all over his body, and though they had all become blunt, they hurt very badly. The blood was streaming from Pilla's nose and when he had thrown all his spears he stopped to wipe it off with a tuft of grass. The paws gave them time to think, and they stared at each other. Suddenly they burst out laughing. "'What fools we are!' they said. "'Yes, we are indeed fools,' said Inda, rubbing his bruises. "'Coopery may be back at any moment, and here we will be found, fighting each other like a couple of stupid boys. I am sorry I hurt you, brother.' "'You have certainly done that,' said Pilla, caressing his nose gently. "'There will be a dint down my nose forever. The bone is broken, I think. Why don't you hit Coopery as hard as that?' "'I will if I get the chance,' Inda said. "'And you yourself are no child when it comes to throwing spears. A good thing for me that they were blunt.' "'Yes, brother, we are the biggest fools in the bush. Now what are we to do?' "'Save yourself!' screamed Pilla. Here comes Coopery. The great kangaroo came bounding back through the bush, and the brothers, wild with terror, flung themselves at the lightwood tree. Up they went, but only just in time. Inda's heel was grazed by Coopery's claw as he gained the safety of the lower branches. He climbed up swiftly, and, clinging together, they looked down at their foe. He cannot climb, gasped Pilla. No, but he will have the tree down, cried his brother. Coopery was flinging himself against the tree until it rocked beneath the blows of his great body. Again and again came the dull thud as he drew himself back and came dashing against the trunk. Gradually it yielded, beginning to lean sidewards. Lower and lower it came, and Coopery, rising high on his hind legs and tail, clawed upward at Inda. As the hunter, with a cry of despair, he tried to pull himself higher. Pilla, leaning from an upper branch, thrust something into his hand. "'It is the stone axe of our father,' he gasped. "'Strike with it, brother!' Inda grasped the handle and smote downward with all his might. The keen edge of the stone caught Coopery in the forehead and sank into his head. He fell back, wrenching the axe from Inda's hand. One more terrific roar rent the air, a cry of pain and anger fearful to hear. Then, with a dull groan, the monster sank sidewards to the grass. He was dead. It was long before Pilla and Inda dared to quit the shelter of the leaning tree. They could scarcely believe that their enemy was dead, until they saw the mighty limbs stiffen and beheld a crow perch unmolested on Coopery's head. Then the brothers came down from the tree and clasped each other's hands. "'That was a good blow of yours,' said Pilla. "'Ay, but it would never have been struck had you not put the axe into my hands,' said Inda. "'I had forgotten all about it. Our names will live long, brother.' "'That will be agreeable, but I wish my nose were not so sore,' said Pilla. "'And your bruises? How are they?' "'Sore enough.' but I had almost forgotten them. Kai, but I am hungry, Pilla. I too, said Pilla, looking with interest at the great dead body. Well, at least we have plenty of food. Berkamuk said long ago that Coopery should be enough for the whole tribe. Let us skin him carefully, for his hide will be a proud trophy to take back to our father, if we can but carry it. 
— We shall eat him while it is drying, Inda said. And then the skin will be lighter, and we shall be exceedingly strong. Come, brother, my hunger grows worse. They fell to work on the huge carcass with their sharp skinning knives, made of the thigh bones of kangaroos. And then befell the most wonderful thing of all. End of section two. Section three of the Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. Chapter 3 Inda and Pilla took off the black hide of Kuperi and pegged it out carefully with sharp sticks. Then they came back to the body, and their eyes glistened with satisfaction. Meat is the best thing in the world to a black fellow, and never before had either seen so much meat. It was almost staggering to think that it was theirs, and to be eaten. All they had feared and suffered became as nothing in the prospect of that tremendous feast. Ya Kai, mourned Pilla. We shall never finish it before it goes bad, not though we eat day and night without ceasing, as mean I to do. And I also, agreed Inda. Let us make ovens before we begin to cut him up. We shall waste less time that way. Some of him will certainly go bad, but we will do our best. They were turning aside to gather sticks when Pilla suddenly caught at his brother's arm. He happened to seize a bruised part, and Inda was justly annoyed. "'Take care, you blockhead,' he said, shaking him off roughly. "'I ache all over. Is it not enough for you?' Pilla took no notice. He was staring at the skinned body of Kuperi, with eyes that were almost starting from his head. "'Look!' he gasped. Look, he moves! Inda leaped to one side. Moves? he uttered. Are you mad? I saw his side move, Pilla repeated. See, there it is again. Something bulged under the stripped skin of the monster. The brothers leaped backward. But he is certainly dead, gasped Inda. Have we not skinned him? Can a skinned animal move, even if he be coopery? Let us leave him and go home, muttered Pilla. He is very bad magic. But that was more than Inda could bring himself to do. Leave him, he exclaimed. Leave the most wonderful feast ever heard of in all the bush? No, I will not. Magic or no magic, he is dead, and I will see what moves. He sprang forward, knife in hand, and with a quick movement slit open the body. Out popped a head a black head, with fear and pain and bewilderment on its features. Inda sprang back, raising his knife to defend himself. "'Let me out!' begged the head. "'It is horrible in here. No air, no light, nothing but dead men. Let me out, I say!' "'Are you magic?' gasped Inda. "'Magic? I?' The wild eyes rolled in astonishment. "'I am Kanalka of the Crow tribe.' But an hour ago Cooperi swallowed me at a gulp, when he came upon me in the forest. I do not know why I am not dead, but I live yet, though I was wishing to die when suddenly you let the light into my prison. Make your hole larger, friend, and let me out. Do you say there are dead men there? demanded Pilla. He is full of them. I only am alive, I suppose because I was the last eaten. Be quick, be quick! Half doubting, half afraid, Inda opened the great body and helped Kanalka out. He staggered and fell helplessly to the ground. Pilla and Inda did not trouble about him. One after another, they took from Kuperi ten black hunters, laying them in a row upon the grass. Last of all, they took out Kongarn and three others of their own tribe and wailed over them. Kanalka who had somewhat recovered, came and looked curiously at the row of men. Would you not say they were alive? 
he asked. They do not look as though they were anything but asleep. I think it is magic, said Inda, very much afraid. Two moons have gone by since Congarn, who lies there, was eaten. And yet he looks as though asleep. Cooperie was a strange host, truly, to keep you all in such good condition. The gaze of Kanalka wandered to the stone axe of Berkamuk, which lay on the grass near Cooperie. Instantly he became interested. He had seen many dead men, but no such axe as this had come his way. Is this the mighty axe which all the tribes have heard? he asked eagerly. Kai, what a beauty! Never have I seen such a one. I should like to handle it. He picked it up and tested its weight, while Pilla and Inda watched him carefully, for they knew that the axe was a treasure beyond anything in the bush, and that a man would risk almost anything to possess it. They need not, however, have feared Kanalka. He was a simple-minded fellow, and was merely lost in admiration. A beauty indeed, he exclaimed. It will be something to tell my people that in one day I escaped from the body of Kuperi and handled the stone axe of Berkemuk. Was it with this that you killed the monster? Aye, said Inda. It clove his skull. One blow was enough, though our spears had fallen blunted from his hide. A marvel indeed, cried Kanalka. It would be a mighty weapon at close quarters in a fight. One would swing it round, thus and bring it down upon the enemy's head. He illustrated his meaning, swinging the axe aloft and bringing it down over the head of the silent form of Congarn. Just before it reached the head, he checked it, letting it do no more than touch Congarn, a touch no heavier than the sweep of a butterfly's wing. Congarn yawned, sneezed, and sat up. With a yell of terror, the three blacks started backwards tripped over each other, and fell in a heap. Congarn surveyed the struggling mass calmly. "'Where am I?' he asked. "'And what is all this about? Is it you, Pilla, and Inda?' They struggled to their feet and looked at him distrustfully. "'You are dead,' Pilla said firmly. "'Why do you talk?' "'I do not know why. Indeed, since it is evident that I am talking to fools,' said Congarn rudely. What has happened to you, that you and this stranger have suddenly gone mad? Kai, how hungry I am! Have you food? The brother suddenly began to laugh helplessly. Food? said Inda. There is more food than you ever saw before, Kongarn, and a few minutes ago you were a part of it. That is a riddle I am too tired to guess, said Kongarn crossly. I only wish that any food were part of me, for I feel as though I had never eaten in my life. It is certainly two moons at least since last you ate, Pilla told him. I already said that you were mad, and I grow more sure of it every minute, said poor Congarn. Who are these who lie beside me? They are dead men, and a moment ago you too were dead, Inda said. Congarn became afraid, as well as cross. It was clear that everybody was mad, and he had heard that it was wise to humor mad people, or they might do you an injury. So he hid his feelings and looked at the brothers as kindly as his bewilderment and hunger would let him. "'Dead was I,' he said. "'Then how did I come to life?' "'This man touched you with the stone axe of Berkemuk," Inda answered. "'Dear me, how simple,' said Congarn. None of our Mekigar know anything half so easy. But why does he not go on, and bring all these other dead men to life, too? Indeed, said Kanalka suddenly. I do not know. He flung himself upon the stone axe, which he had let fall in his terror, and touched another still form with it. Instantly the black hunter came to life. Kanalka uttered a wild yell of amazement and triumph. Then Inda snatched the axe from him and ran along the line, touching one man after another. And when he had come to the end, there were ten black fellows sitting up and rubbing their eyes, and most of them were asking eagerly for food. The brothers drew back a few paces and looked at them. It is clear, said Pilla, that Kuperi was magic. 
and that when our father stone axe entered his skull it became magic too more than ever we must guard it carefully since it seems to have the power of life and death he lowered his voice speaking to inda i will lash it to your shoulders brother we are among strangers and it will be safer so he lashed the stone axe to inda's shoulders firmly and the other men looked on each knew exactly why he was doing it and respected him for his caution since each knew that had chance thrown in his way the mighty stone axe he would not have been proof against the temptation of trying to get possession of it then they all talked together and were very amazed at what had happened to them but since they were able to put everything down to magic nothing worried them much and they were quite relieved to find themselves alive and to think of seeing their wives and children again. More than anything, they were overjoyed at the magnificent feast that awaited them. And what a feast it was! Never again in all their lives did such a chance come to them. The wild black never asked for any trimmings with his food. He would, indeed, eat anything that came his way, but meat, meat only, and still more meat, was what his soul most desired and now meat awaited them in a huge mountain, and they were hungry beyond belief. "'We will cut up coopery,' said Pilla and Inda, "'since we alone have knives. The rest of you must make fire and prepare ovens.' The men scattered to their tasks. Some gathered sticks. Others scooped out holes in the ground for the ovens. Others teased dried messmate bark for tinder for the man who was making the fire. This was Congarn, and he did it very quickly. Pilla lent him one of his most useful household necessaries, which he always carried with him, a piece of dry grass tree cane, having a hole bored through to the pith on its upper side, and a pointed piece of soft wood, and these were just as useful to the blacks as a box of matches would be to you. Congarn sat down on the ground, holding the bit of grass tree firmly down with his feet, and pressed the point of the soft wood into the little hole. Then he held it upright between his palms and twirled it rapidly. Within two minutes smoke began to curl round the twirling point, and another man carefully put some teased bark, soft and dry, round the hole and blew on it. A moment more, and a thin tongue of flame licked through the tinder. More and more was fed to it, and then leaves and twigs, and in five minutes there was a blazing fire, while Congarn restored to Pilla his two flame-making sticks, very little the worse for wear. The blacks did not usually light a large fire, after the fashion of white men, who liked to make a campfire so big that they roast their faces while their backs remained cold. The way the blacks preferred was to make two little fires, and to sit between them, so that they were kept warm on both sides. But on this occasion they made a very big blaze, so that they should quickly have enough fire to heat the ovens, and then they made the big fire long and narrow, so that they could sit on each side of it and cook. While the ovens were getting hot, they took small pieces of the kangaroo meat and speared them on green sticks, holding them before the coals. They were all so desperately hungry that they did not care much whether the meat was properly cooked. As soon as the first pieces were warmed through, they stuffed them into their mouths, and then ran to Pilla and Inda for more. Pilla and Inda were working hard at cutting up coopery and though they did not mind the hungry men beginning without them, they became annoyed when they came again and again for fragments. "'Do not forget that we are hungry, too,' Pilla growled. "'We have travelled far before we killed Coopery and let you all out, and now we are cutting up your meat for you. If you do not bring us some cooked pieces, we must go and cook for ourselves.' That made the others afraid for the cutting up of so huge an animal as Coopery was no light work, and none of them had knives. So they fed the brothers with toothsome morsels as they worked, and the cutting went on unchecked, until the ovens were hot and there was a pile of joints ready to be put in. This was done, wrapping the joints in green leaves. 
Then they carried to the fire the great heap of small pieces of meat left from the cutting up, and cooked and ate, and ate and cooked, all through the night. Even in ordinary life, it would have astonished you to see how much meat a black could eat. A well-fed black fellow, with a wife who kept his worldly well supplied with roots and grubs, and all other pleasant things they loved. But these blacks had no food, some of them for weeks, and it seemed that they would never stop. The great pile of pieces dwindled until there were none left, and then they hacked more off, and cooked and ate until the ovens were ready and the smoking joints came out. They were so hot that you would not have cared to touch them without a knife and fork. But the blacks seized them and tore them to pieces and gnawed them, until nothing remained but well-picked bones, and then they cooked more. Pilla and Inda were the first to give in, and they had eaten enough for twenty white men. They waddled off to a thicket and flung themselves under a bush, sleeping back to back, so that the stone axe of Brickamuck was safe between them. But the others had no thought for anything but kangaroo and even the mighty axe could not have tempted them from that tremendous gorge. They ate on, all through the day. Towards night some of them gave in, then, one by one, they could eat no more, and most of them went to sleep where they sat before the fire. But dawn on the next day showed the steadfast Congarn, rotund beyond belief, and eating still and by that time Pilla and Inda had slept off their light repast, and were ready to begin all over again. They camped for more than a week by the carcass of Kuperi, and ate it until it was no longer pleasant to eat, even for a black fellow. Then they began to think it was time to return to their tribes. So they greased their bodies comfortably all over, and set off through the forest, a peaceful and happy band, far too well fed to think of quarrelling. When they came near the headquarters of each tribe, they marched to its camp in a proud procession, returning the warriors who had been mourned as dead, and great were the rejoicings throughout the country, and rich rewards of fur and weapons and food were showered upon Inda and Pilla. The stone axe of Berkamuk became more famous than ever, and every one wanted to look at the wonderful weapon that had slain Kuperi. Songs were made about the two heroes, and, for ages afterwards, mothers used to tell their children about them, and hope that their boys would be as brave as Berkamuk's sons. At last they drew near to their own camp. They halted the night before, a few hours' journey away, and, by good luck, met a couple of boys out hunting, and sent them in to tell the tribe that they were coming. They had no idea of coming in unheralded, for they knew that they had done a great deed, and they meant to return in state. Besides, although the rescued men were with them, the load of presents they had received was far too heavy to be carried comfortably. They got up early and painted themselves in stripes and put on their finest feathers and furs. Inda carried the stone axe of Berkamuk, and Pilla had only a spear. Long before they were ready to start, they were met by some of the men of the tribe who had come out to welcome them. These loaded themselves with gifts, and with Pilla and Inda stalking in front, and the rescued men behind, they formed themselves into a procession and marched for home. Near the camp, another procession came out to meet them. Berkamuk, their father, marching at the head of all his tribe. First came the Mekigar, very solemn, and inwardly very disgusted that the honor of slaying Kuperi had not fallen to them. Then came all the warriors and the old men, then the boys, and lastly the women and children. They were shouting greetings and praises and singing songs of welcome. Berkamuk halted as his sons drew near. They came up to him and knelt before him, and Inda laid the stone axe at his feet. "'We bring you back your mighty weapon, my father,' he said. "'It has slain your enemy.' Then all the tribe shouted afresh, and the warriors leaped in the air, and the whole country was filled with the sound of their rejoicings, 
and they bore Pilla and Inda home in triumph, naming them the most famous heroes of all the tribes of the bush. But the magic of Kuperi was not done with them yet. They feasted late that night, and the sun was high overhead before they woke next day. They were in a whirly by themselves, but outside the boys of the tribe were clustered, peeping in to see the mighty warriors. Pilla stretched himself and flung out an arm, which struck Inda. "'Take care,' Inda said, angrily waking up. "'You hurt me.' "'Why, I hardly touched you,' Pilla answered. "'You must have been dreaming.' "'Well, it is no dream that I am very sore,' said Inda. All my body seems covered with bruises, just as it was after our fight under the tree with Kuperi. That is queer, said Pilla, for my nose also feels terribly sore. That must have been a mighty blow that you dealt it. He felt it tenderly. It feels queer, too. Does it look curious? There is a furrow down it. But then there always has been, since our fight, said Inda. You look not much worse than usual. But I see, is there anything wrong with me? He flung off his wallaby skin rug and sat up. Pilla uttered a cry. Kai, you are all over spots. Did I really hit you in all those places? You must have done so, said Inda crossly. Lucky for me that the spears were blunt. I feel most extraordinary, said Pilla suddenly. It is just as though I were shrinking. And, indeed, I have no cause to shrink, seeing how much I ate last night. But my skin is getting all loose. And mine, too, cried Inda faintly. There is magic at work upon us, my brother. Then a mist drifted over the whirly, and strange cries came out of it. The boys, watching outside, clutched at each other in fear. And presently, when the mist blew away, Pilla and Inda were not to be seen nor were they ever seen more. Instead, within the whirly, crouched two little animals, new to the blacks, which uttered faint squeaks and scurried away through the camp into the bush. There they live now, and through them are the sons of Berkamuk remembered. Pilla is the plump possum, who has always a furrow down his nose, and Inda is the native cat, whose skin is covered all over with spots. For the magic of Kuperi lived after him, so that the blunt weapons that had struck him had strange power, just as there was power of life in the stone axe that had killed him. But though they lived no longer as men, the names of Pilla and Inda were always held in great honor, since through their courage and wisdom the tribes lived in security, free from the wickedness of Kuperi. End of section three. Section four of The Stone Axe of Bergamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce Waung the Crow Chapter 1 Very long ago, so long that the oldest blacks could not remember anything about it themselves, there was a legend of the first coming of fire. Fire came with a group of seven strange women, the Karak Aruk, who brought it from some unknown country. They dwelt with the blacks, and showed them how to use the new and wonderful thing, but they were very selfish, and would give none away. Instead, they kept it in the end of their yam sticks, and when the people begged for it, they only laughed at them. They alone knew how to make it, and they never told the secret to anyone. So the blacks took counsel together. We might as well have never learned that there was fire at all, said one. Better, said another. Before it came we were content, but now everyone is sighing for it, and cannot get it. My wife is weariness to me, said a third. 
She always pesters me to bring fire to her, and makes my mouth water by telling me of the beautiful food she can cook if she had it. It is almost enough to make a man lose his appetite. But who that has once taste cooked food can forget it, said another, licking his lips. Such flavor, such juiciness. Twice the Karak Aruk gave fire to my wife, and let her roast wallaby and snipe, and since those glorious meals it is hard to eat them raw. Ay, that is so, said one. To my woman also they gave fire twice, and she cooked me wombat and iguana. Kai, how much I ate, and how sick I was afterwards, but it was worth it. And fish, said another. No one who eats raw fish can imagine what a wonderful difference fire makes to it. It is indeed a wonderful thing. The first time I saw it, I picked it up, admiring its pretty color, and it stung me severely. In my wrath I kicked it, but its sting was still there, and it gave me a sore foot. Now I know that it is magic, and must not be touched, save with a stick. And then the stick becomes part of it. It is all very curious. It is worse than curious that such a thing should be, and be held only by the power of women, said an old man angrily. If we had fire, the winter cold would not strike so keenly to old bones. Why should we submit to these women, the Karakaruk? Let us kill them, if necessary, and take it from them for ourselves. But no one moved, and all looked uneasy. The women are magic, said one at length. The magic men know that. Yes, and the women's magic is stronger than theirs, another answered. They have weaved spells, but what good have they done? Now they say that unless they let some fire drop by accident, we can never get it from them. And if they do let it fall, then they will be just like other women, and have no power at all. I would like to see that, said a big fellow eagerly. It would be very good for them, and they would make useful wives for some of us, for they know all about cooking food. I would not mind marrying one of them myself, he added in a patronizing tone, at which everybody laughed. Another big man spoke. His name was Waung. He was tall and powerful. It is all very ridiculous, he said. No woman lives in the world who can get the better of a man. I have half a mind to get fire from them myself. You, said the others, and they all joined in roars of laughter. For Waung was a lazy man and had never done much good for himself. You! You would go to sleep instead of finding a way to get the better of the Karakaruk. This made Waung very angry. You are all fools, he said rudely. I will certainly take the trouble to get fire, and will make one of the women my wife, and she shall cook in my whirly. But then I will have their magic, and none of you will get any fire from me. Of that you may be sure. Then you will all be sorry. But this only made the men laugh more. And the noise of their mirth set the laughing jackasses shouting in the trees. Very seldom had the camp heard so fine a joke. Waung was filled with fury. He strode away from them with his head in the air, shouting fierce threats. No one took the least notice of them, because he was known to be a boaster and a talker. But it was very amusing to see him go and the blacks were always glad of a chance for laughter. Even after Waung had gone into his whirly, he could hear the echo of their merriment, and whenever two or three went past, they were still talking about him and laughing. A pity Waung is such a fool, they said, but perhaps it is all well, for if there were no fools, we would not have such good jokes. And that did not make Waung feel any better. Next day he went to the Kar Ak Aruk's whirly, and met them going out to dig for yams. Their dilly bags were on their shoulders, and they held their yam sticks, and he could see fire gleaming in the hollow tops. Waung looked at the digging ends of the sticks, and saw that they were very blunt. He said, I will sharpen your yam sticks for you. The Kar Ak Aruk thanked him with a twinkle in their eyes. They knew there was some reason for such politeness from Waung. 
They held the yam sticks for him to cut, and though once or twice he tried to make them fall, as if by accident, so long as they had even a finger upon them they did not move. So Waung realized that fire was not to be obtained in that way. When he had finished the point, he stood up. I am sick of the tribe, he said angrily. They are silly people, and they turn me into a joke. If you like, I will come out and help you to get food. And, I can tell you, I know where to hunt. Will you hunt with me? Now the Karak ar -uk were suspicious of Waung, but they were lazy women. It did not amuse them at all to go hunting by themselves every day, for they were not clever at it, and it took them a long time to find enough game to cook. Moreover, they were fond of food, and never had enough. They knew that no one could take away their yam sticks so long as they held them, and so they were not afraid of Waung. Perhaps what you say is true, one answered slowly. At any rate, I do not care. You may come with me if you wish, and sometimes we will give you some cooked food. So the camp got used to the sight of Waung and the women going out to hunt together, and after a while they forgot that they used to laugh at them, and they had to find another joke. They envied Waung very much if they saw him eating scraps of cooked meat given him by the women, and you may be sure that Waung did not give any scraps away. He became quite good friends with the women, though they were always suspicious of him, and gave him no chance of handling their yam sticks. The fire in the hollow tops never went out. Waung could not guess how they managed to keep it alive, and it puzzled him very much. But he never forgot that he had vowed to take it from them, and he made many plans that came to nothing, because the Kar Ak Aruk were always watchful. At last Waung hit upon an idea. Out in the scrub he found a nest of young snakes, and these he managed to tame, for he was a very cunning man. Even when they were nearly full-grown, they would do his bidding, and he taught them many queer tricks. Then he went in search of an ant hill and sought until he found a very large one. For the Karakaruk had told him that they loved ants' eggs more than any kind of food. One night, Waung took his snakes and buried them in the ant hill, saying, Stay there until I send to let you out. They looked at him with their fierce beady eyes, and wriggled round until they made themselves nests in the soft earth, which caused the ants very great inconvenience and alarm. Then Waung covered them up and went home, taking the Karakauk, a little kangaroo rat that he had killed. The women were hungry, and the sight of Waung's offering did not please them. "'It is very small,' they said discontentedly. What is the matter with you? You have brought us scarcely any food for three days. Waung laughed, swinging his spear. Hunting has been bad, he said carelessly. I have been lazy, perhaps, or the game was scarce, but I have a treat for you tomorrow. What is that? they asked, eagerly looking up from skinning the kangaroo rat. What would you say to ants' eggs? We like them more than anything else, they cried. Have you found some? I have found a very big hill, Wang said. It should be full of eggs. And will you take us there? Wang did not want to seem too eager. He hesitated. I do not want the eggs, he said at length. A man wants something he can bite. Eggs are for women. But will you cook me a wallaby if I take you there? Where is the wallaby? asked the Karakaruk. I have not caught it yet, but I have set a snare in a track I know, and while you dig ants' eggs, I have no doubt I can get one. That does not matter, however. I can get one some time. Will you cook it for me if I show you the ants' nest? The Karakaruk promised, for the temptation of ants' eggs was very strong. They ate all the kangaroo rat, and found it quite too small for their appetites. So they went to sleep hungry, and were still hungrier when they awoke in the morning. They had only a few yams for breakfast, 
and so they were very eager to start when Waung sauntered up to their whirly. They all went a little way into the bush, and then came upon the great ant hill. At the sight, the Karak ar -uk ran forward with their sticks ready to dig. Waung said, I will go to my snare and come back to you. But he went slowly. The women had not taken any notice of what he said. They plunged their yam sticks into the hill and began throwing out the earth quickly. Then they uttered a loud scream, for the snakes came tumbling out of the loosened earth and ran this way and that, hissing fiercely, and some ran at them. Waung turned back at their cries. Hit them with their sticks, he shouted. Kill them. The Karak ar -uk hit furiously at the snakes with the pointed end of their yam sticks. But a stiff pointed stick is not much use for killing snakes, as Waung well knew, and he called to them roughly. That is no good. Use the thick ends. The women swung their sticks round at his cry and brought the thick ends down across the snakes' backs. The blows were so strong that many of the snakes were killed at once, but that was not the only thing that happened. Fire flew out of the hollow ends of the sticks, and in great coals rolled down the side of the ant hill. The coals met and joined, so that they were all one very large coal. Waung had been watching like a cat. He had picked up two flat pieces of green stringy bark, and now he leaped forward, snapped up fire between them, and fled. Behind him came the Karak Auk, screaming. But as Waung stole the fire, their magic left them, and they were helpless. Then Belen Belen, the musk crow who carries the whirlwind in his bag, heard the voice of Pundjel speaking to him out of the clouds, commanding him to let loose his burden. So Belen Belen, obedient, but greatly afraid, untied the strings of his bag, and the whirlwind leapt out in a wild rush. It caught the Karak Aruk and whirled them up into the sky, where you may still see them clustered together, for they were turned into stars. Now they are called the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. But the blacks know that they are the Karak Aruk women, that they live together in the sky, still carrying fire on the ends of their yam sticks. End of section four. Section five of the Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce Waung the Crow Chapter 2 Waung went proudly back to the tribe, and when they saw that he had actually stolen fire from the women, they were both glad and astonished, and clustered round him, calling him many pleasant things. Waung was quite ready to listen to them, but he had no intention of being generous now that he had brought fire with him. He saw his way to a lazy life, and he was not the man to lose such a good chance. So, after they had praised him loudly and sung loud songs about his bravery and wit, he went off into his whirly and put fire in a hole in the ground. Then he sat in the door and carved a boomerang. The people looked at each other, not knowing what to do next. How is this? they said. Will he not give fire to us all? No one could answer his question. They chattered together for a while. Then one said, what is worth having is worth asking for. And he went up to Waung's whirly and greeted him civilly. Good day, Waung, he said. Will you give me some fire to do my cooking? I have enough for myself, said Waung, and went on with his carving. But fire grows, if you will let it, said the man. Will you not make it grow, so that each of us may have some? I cannot spare any was all that Waung would answer. So the man went back to his friends and told them what Waung said. Then one after another came to Waung, 
and begged him for a little bit of fire. But the reply was always the same, and they went away, very sorry they had ever laughed at Waung. For now he remembered the laughter, and he determined to have his revenge. In the morning, when the tribe was astir, they found that Waung had made a very large oven in front of his wurley, and had hid fire there. Also he had caught a wallaby in his snare, and all the air was full of the fragrant smell of cooking. It made all the people's mouths water, and they hated Waung exceedingly, but they feared that with the Karakaruk's fire, Waung had also captured their magic, and so they did not dare to attack him. So they held a council together, and all talked very fast and angrily, but at the end of it there was nothing accomplished. Talking did not mend the matter at all, and against magic what could anyone do? Then a woman came running, and said she had a message, and though women were not supposed to speak in council, she was told to deliver it at once. Waung says he will cook our food, she said, and stopped for breath. A great shout of joy went up from the men. "'But he will not do it for nothing,' went on the woman. At this all their faces lengthened suddenly. The blacks stopped in the middle of their joyful shout, and waited with their mouths wide open to hear what was to follow. "'He says that he will cook for us, but we are to supply him with food and firewood and all that he wants, and he will keep for himself all the food he likes best.' and if we do not perform all that he tells us to do, he will take fire away altogether. There was silence when the woman had finished speaking, and then a deep groan of anger went up from the people. They all talked very fast again, each trying to speak more loudly than the others, all except the husband of the woman who had brought the news, and he was busy beating her with his waddy because she had brought so insolent a message, and had allowed them to think at first that it was good news. The poor Lubra tried to say that they had not given her time to say it all at once, but the husband was too busy to listen. But neither talking nor beating made the matter any better. So Waung became the real ruler of the tribe, in everything but name, since food is the most important thing in the world to the blacks and the greater part of their food became dependent upon him. Nothing could be cooked unless Waung would do it, and they soon found that unless he were in a good temper he would not do it at all. He took the best parts of all that they brought to him to cook, so that no man knew what he would get back, and when one took a fat young wallaby or a black duck, it was quite likely that Waung would give him something tough and stringy when he went back for his cooked meal, declaring that it was what he had left over in his oven. Neither would he take any trouble over the cooking. The people brought their food and put it in the oven themselves, and Waung took it out when it pleased him. Sometimes he did not take it out until it was burned, black and tasteless, while at others they would find it only half-cooked and cold. But no amount of talking would make Waung alter his ways, and at last he became so proud that if anyone argued with him, he would refuse to cook for a week, except for himself. This naturally stopped all argument in the camp, but it did not make the people love Waung any better. He grew fat and lazy, for he ate huge quantities of food, and very seldom went out of his whirly. When he did, he carried fire with him in a little hollow stick, and no one dared to go near him, or near his whirly, for fear of his enchantments. As a matter of fact, Waung had no enchantments at all, and no magic. But he was very cunning, and he knew how easy it was to make the blacks think he had amazing powers. The magic men, too, found that none of their spells had any effect upon Waung and so they told the tribe that he certainly had magic help. It was very convenient to be able to say this when they were beaten, for magic was a thing that could not possibly be argued about. The months went by, and the people became very unhappy. Waung's evil temper made them all miserable and afraid. There have been many bad kings in history, 
but only Wawung ever had the power of depriving all his people of their dinner, if they failed to please him. It is a very terrible punishment when it is inflicted often, especially when dinner is the only meal of the day. Now that the people had grown used to cooked food, they did not like raw meat, so they depended on Wawung's mercy. And Wawung had very little mercy. It amused him greatly to see the people hungry, and to have them come begging to him to cook their food. He would laugh loud and long, reminding them of the time when they had jeered at him about fire. Afterwards, he would go into his whirly and sleep, saying, Fire is asleep today, and I cannot wake it. At last, Pondagel, maker of men, looked down at the world, and saw how unhappy the blacks were at the cruelties of Waung. It made him very angry. He was stern and hard himself, but he saw no reason why this fellow, lazy and ill-natured, should make his people hungry and miserable. So he sent a message to the ear of each man in the tribe, telling him what to do. The blacks thought they had dreamed the message. They woke in the morning, confused and angry. They hardly knew why, and each man said to his neighbor, I have dreamed about Wawung, and the other would answer, I too have dreamed about him. They gathered into groups, talking about Wawung and the dream that had come to them, and then the groups began to drift towards Wawung's whirly. Wawung looked out and saw them coming. At once he became uneasy for he knew that he had never seen such threatening faces and angry eyes. It made him afraid, and he began to put fire to heat his oven, which had been cold for five days. The blacks came close to the whirly, growling and muttering. They circled round, still half afraid. Then one, suddenly becoming brave, shouted a word of angry abuse at Waung, and that was all the others wanted. They joined the first man in loud and threatening shouts and fierce abuse, casting at him every evil name they could think of, and saying that the time had come for him to answer for his bad deeds. Then one picked up a stone and flung it at him, hitting him on the shoulder. Waung had no weapons outside his whirly. He became terrified, gazing round him with hopeless eyes that saw no way of escape. Then he stooped to his oven and saw that fire lay there in a mass of red coals. "'I will give you back fire!' he shouted. He thrust a flat stone into the coals, and with it flung fire far and wide among the blacks. Some of it hit the men and burned them, as he hoped, but others picked it up and ran with it to their whirlies, so that they might never again be without it in their homes. To and fro in the air the burning pieces flew as Waung hurled them from him. So fast they fell that the people were afraid again. It seemed as though Waung were making fire, so that he might fight them with it. And then a strange thing happened. All the coals that had fallen in the dry grass nearest the whirly turned and began to burn back towards Waung. They met in a circle of flame. Gradually it burned until it came to the whirly, and there it wrapped Waung and his oven and all that belonged to him in a sheet of flame. Out of it came Waung's dreadful cries for help, but no man dared go near the fire, nor would any one have lifted a finger to help Waung. The people huddled together, watching in great fear. Soon the cries ceased, and then the smoke and flame died away, so that they saw the body of Waung lying across the stones of his oven. He was quite black, like a cinder. The tribe uttered a long shout of triumph, for they knew that he could trouble them no more. Then they heard the voice of Pund Jel, speaking to the thing that lay across the stones. "'Fire has made you black,' said the voice. "'Now you shall be black forever, and no longer a man. Instead you shall be a crow, to fly about forever and utter cries.' so that when the people see you they will remember how they were foolishly in bondage to you and your cruelties. The people cast themselves down, in terror at the voice. A drifting cloud of smoke floated from the smoldering ashes of the whirly and blotted everything out. 
When they looked again, it had lifted and blown away into the skies. The thing that had lain on the stones was no longer there. But from the limb of a bubiala tree close by came a harsh croak, and looking, they saw a big black crow that flapped its wings and looked at them with sullen eyes. And then it said, Wah! Wah! And, rising from the tree, it flew lazily across to a great black butt, where it perched on the topmost bough, still croaking evilly, and the people, glad, yet afraid, clustered together, muttering, See, it is Waung! End of Section 5《Section Six of the Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. The Emu Who Would Dance. Long ago, Kari the Emu was superior to all other birds. She was so superior that she would not live on the earth. Instead, she had a home up in the clouds, and from there she used to look down at the earth and the queer antics of all the things that lived there. It gave her much food for thought. At that time, there were no human beings at all. All the earth was inhabited by animals, birds, and reptiles, and they lived very happily together, as a rule. There were no wars, and everyone had enough to eat. While there were no men, fear did not live on earth either. All the world was a big feeding ground, where even the smallest and weakest could find a peaceful home. Kari, sitting in her great nest up in the clouds, watched the animals below, both night and day. She thought them strange creatures, and wondered very much how they could be so contented with so many other creatures about them. She was so used to living alone that it seemed to her rather unpleasant to have one solitude broken upon by others, all of whom might be peculiar enough to think their little affairs as interesting as one's own. Carrie thought that nothing could possibly be so interesting as her great lonely nest in the clouds. In reality, it was a very dull old nest, and she was a big, dull bird. She knew no one, and spoke to no one, and thought only her own queer thoughts. But she did not know she was dull, and so she was quite happy. One day she sat in her nest, watching the cloud masses drift about between her and the world. They cleared away after a while, and she looked down upon a great forest over which she found herself, for as her nest was in a cloud, it used to float about, and so she never knew what country she might see when she looked down. Sometimes it was a lake, sometimes a mountain, and sometimes the great rolling sea, which always made her feel rather giddy, because it would not keep still for a moment. But on this day it was a wide forest, green and peaceful. Kari's sight was very keen, and she looked through the treetops to the ground below, and saw all the animals. It was really almost as good as a circus. But then Kari knew nothing about such a thing as a circus. She watched them with great interest, leaning her long neck over the edge of the cloud in which her nest was built. Suddenly she saw a sight that made her lean forward so far that she very nearly overbalanced and fell out. Far below her was an open space near a bright spot that she knew was water, in a little swampy place in a hollow. The grass there was green and soft. There were trees all round it, and it was a very secluded place, except for anyone looking from above, like the inquisitive Kari. But Kari was not looking only at green grass and shining water she saw a little group of birds that had come out of the swamp where they had been waiting and had begun to dance. They were native companions, Puralkas, but Kari did not know that. All she knew was that they were very beautiful creatures, the most beautiful, she thought, that she had ever seen. 
and they were doing the most interesting things. Very gracefully they danced to and fro on the patch of green grass. They were tall, slim birds, looking a kind of dim gray color when seen so far away. Their legs were very long and thin, for they belonged to the tribe of birds called waders, who get their food by walking in swamps and morasses. And they had neat bodies, not fluffy like some of Kari's own feathers, with which she immediately felt very dissatisfied. Their queer thin heads with long beaks were carried on long necks, which twisted about as they danced. They pranced up and down, giving little runs, backwards and forwards, marching and stepping in the most curious manner. Never had Kari seen so charming a sight. It made her suddenly envious. Until now she had regarded all the animals and birds as so much beneath her, in every way that it never occurred to her to wish to be like them, or to do anything that they did. But this was the first time that she had seen the native companions dance. Kari's cloud drifted away presently, and she could no longer see the queer gray company of long-legged birds prancing on the green spot in the forest. But nothing that now came within her sight interested her at all. She saw the lyre-birds building their mounds in the bush and making them gay with all sorts of odd things, bright stones, bits of quartz, gay feathers, and they also danced on their mounds but it did not please Kari as much as the dance of the Puralkas. The moon showed her the animals that come out at night. Wombat, wallaby, wild dogs and opossums, native bears climbing up the highest trees, and flying foxes that trailed like clouds between her and the treetops. She saw the lizards that live in rocks and on the ground, and the hideous iguanas that run up the trees. Great flocks of screaming cockatoos made the air white as they flew, the sun gleaming on their yellow crests. There were snakes, too, in the bush, great carpet snakes, evil-looking brown and black fellows, and the wicked tiger snake, with its yellow patterned back and its quick, cruel movements. Once it had amused Kari very much to see the jackass, Merkin, swoop down upon a snake and carry it struggling back into a tree. The jackass was a silent bird then, and never made any fuss over his captures. Still, it was exciting to see him catch snakes. But now Kari found that none of these things interested or amused her any more. All she wanted to see again was the Puralkas come out of their swamp and dance upon the grass. She watched for a long time, hoping always to catch sight of them again. But though her cloud drifted over all kinds of country, she could not find the Puralkas until at last one day, as she leaned out to her great joy, the little green space came below her again, and there were the long-legged birds dancing backwards and forwards as they had done before. She watched them breathlessly until her cloud began to float away, and then she decided in her mind that she could not bear to let them go again. Indeed, she knew now that unless she could do as they did, she would never feel happy any more. I have seen all there is in the world, she said, and nothing is half so beautiful as dancing. I know I could dance far better than the Puralkas if I only knew the way. I will go down and get them to teach me how to dance. Then I can fly back to my cloud, and forever after I shall not need to look at the world, for I shall be too happy dancing on the clouds. And so Kari spread her great wings, and floated down the sky, until she came over the little green space among the trees. Then she dropped gently, and finally landed in the swamp, which she did not like at all, because she had never before had her feet wet nor were they made for wading in the soft mud of a swamp. She scrambled out as quickly as she could, folding her wings over her back. The Puralkas had run back to the edge of their little dancing ground when they saw the great brown bird coming down from the sky. At first they were inclined to fly away, but they were inquisitive birds, and they waited to see what she would do though they were quite prepared for flight if she proved to be alarming. But the emu looked so simple and meek, 
and she was so comically upset at getting her feet wet that the Puralkas saw at once that there was no cause for fear. As they were not afraid, they became rather angry, for they did not like strangers to see them dancing. And so they clustered together and watched her with unfriendly eyes as she struggled out of the mud and wiped her feet upon the grass. How are you? she said rather breathlessly. I have been watching you all from my home in the clouds, and I think you are nice little birds. Now this made the Puralkas exactly seventeen times more angry than before. They believed that they were quite the most beautiful birds that ever wore feathers, and it made them furious to be addressed in this patronizing manner. Who was this awkward brown monster of a bird to drop out of nowhere and to talk to them as if she were a queen? They chattered among themselves in a whisper. She is as ugly as a Jew lizard, said one. Did ever anyone see such great coarse feet? Another whispered. And her legs? Ha <laughs> ha! Why, they are as thick as the trunk of a tree fern. And what a great silly head! She is larger than a big rock, but she is more foolish than a coot, said another. One look at her will tell you that she has no sense. And what is that ridiculous thing she said? about a home in the clouds one asked as if we did not know that there is nothing in the clouds except rain why the big eagle flew up nearly to the sun the other day and yet he saw nothing of nests in the clouds said another she must think we are very simple to come to us with such a tale no one could possibly think us simple unless she were mad said another everyone knows that we are the wisest birds in all the bush she means to insult us, and they all glared at the emu, much as if she were a tiger snake. Poor Kari felt very puzzled and unhappy. She felt that she had done a kind and condescending thing in coming down to earth and talking so sweetly to these smaller birds, and she could not make out why they should look at her with such angry eyes. She rubbed her muddy feet on the grass and began to wish that she had never left her nest in the cloud. "'Do you not speak my language?' she asked at last. "'Why do you not answer me?' The Puralkas put their heads together again and whispered. Finally an old Puralka stepped forward with mincing steps and looked her up and down so that Kari actually blushed. "'We know what you say, but we do not know why you say it,' said the old Puralka. "'Why should you want to know?' how we are and how dare you call us nice little birds we do not know what you are you're something like a bird to be sure but in most ways you are a kind of freak at any rate we have no love for strangers the unfortunate kari moved her big head from side to side and looked at the bad-tempered old puralka in amazement her beak opened slowly but she was too surprised to speak Nothing like this had ever occurred to her when she lived in the sky. As for your extraordinary remark about a home in the clouds, we would like to remind you that we were not hatched yesterday, went on the old Puralka. Not even the swallow's nest in the clouds. You're only wasting your time, and we have none to waste on you. Would you mind going away? We want to get on with our dancing. Kari did not know what to say. Her bewildered eyes glanced from one Puralka to another, and finding no friendly face, came back to the old bird, who stood waiting for her to answer or go away. She had never dreamed of anything like this among her drifting clouds, and her first instinct was to spread her wings and fly back until she found her own peaceful nest. But the Puralka's mention of dancing reminded her of what had brought her to earth and she felt again all the old longings to watch the gray birds dance. So she summoned up her courage, of which she possessed surprisingly little, considering her size. I'm sure I don't know why you should be so annoyed, she said meekly. I mean well, and it grieves me that I have offended you. It was because I thought you were nice little birds that I called you so. But of course I do not think so now. That is, I mean, I... She broke off, for the old Puralka had uttered something like a snort, and was regarding her with a fixed expression of wrath. 
and all the other Puralkas had bristled alarmingly. Oh, I don't know what I really do mean, said poor Kari helplessly. You all look at me so unpleasantly, and it is quite true that I have a nest in the clouds. If you will come up, I will show it to you. I live there always, and I have only come down because I hoped that you would teach me to dance. And there was silence for a moment, and then all the Puralkas began to laugh. They laughed so much that they could not stand. They went reeling round the little green patch, and at last they sat down with their legs sticking out straight in front of them, and laughed more and more. Meanwhile, Kari stood looking at them stupidly. She felt that it was not pleasant laughter. At last they ceased to laugh, and putting all their heads together began to whisper. And this went on so long that after a while Kari grew tired of standing, and so she sat down and watched them, feeling very unhappy. Overhead a jackass perched on a big gum tree, and looked at the group with his wise old head on one side. When they had whispered for a long time, the Puralkas got up and stood in a row, with their wings tightly folded over their backs. The old Puralka came forward. You must excuse us for laughing, she said. Her voice was not rude now, but there was something in it that made Kari feel as uncomfortable as she had felt when they had been rude before. We did not mean to hurt your feelings, but we all thought of something funny we saw last month, and so we had to laugh. If Kari had been less simple, she would have known that this was only said out of politeness. But she was very anxious to make friends, so she looked gratefully at the old Puralka and said timidly that she was glad they were so merry. Quite so, said the Puralka. It is a poor heart that never rejoices, but about dancing, that is a different matter. You see, you have wings. Eh? said the emu stupidly. Why, of course I have wings. Why not? Well, that is the difficulty, said the Puralka. Dancing like ours is the most beautiful thing in the world, of course, but no one with wings can learn it. You see, we have none ourselves. The emu gave a quick look at the Puralkas, standing in a row. They had folded their wings so tightly over their neat bodies that it looked as though they had really none at all. And she looked so hard at their bodies that she did not notice how cunning their eyes were. Why, I never noticed that yours were gone she said. Dear me, how sad. Do you not find it very uncomfortable and awkward? No. Why should we? snapped the Puralka. Wings are really not much use when you once get accustomed to doing without them. Dancing is so much better. But why cannot one have both? asked Kari. Simply because, said the old Puralka crossly. We do not know why these things are, and we never ask foolish questions about them. But if you wish to learn our beautiful dancing, you must give up your wings first. Give up my wings? I could never do that, cried Kari. Well, dancing is better, but it's for you to say, said the old Puralka. As she spoke, she made a sign to the others, and they began to dance, swaying forward until they almost touched Kari, and then backwards again. And then the line broke up into circles and figures, and they danced round the emu until her head grew dizzy with their movements, and she felt that to dance so well was even better than to have wings. To and fro they went, faster and faster, until she could scarcely distinguish one from another, and their long thin legs she could hardly see at all. And then quite suddenly they all stopped, and Kari blinked at them and could not speak. Well, asked the old Puralka, watching her closely, do you not think that wings are only a small price to pay for such dancing? Could you teach me? Kari asked. Easily, if you give up your wings. Kari gave a great sigh. Very well, she said. I cannot live without knowing how to dance as you do. Then spread your wings out on this stone, said the Puralka. And so Kari spread her great wings across the stone, and the Puralkas cut them off quite close to her body with their sharp beaks. Then they said, Stand up. Kari stood up, feeling very naked and queer without her wings, 
and then the Puracas began to dance again, faster and faster, and they danced upon her wing feathers that had been cut off, scattering them with their feet until there were not two left together. The wind came and took the feathers so that they floated away over the tops of the trees and mounted out of sight. And then the Puralkas laughed again, just as they had laughed before, until Kari's head rang with the noise of it. When will you teach me? she asked timidly. Teach you? cried the Puralkas. What a joke! What a joke! They burst out laughing again, and then to Kari's amazement, they unfolded their wings and shook them in her face. The whole green patch of grass was full of the fluttering of the long gray wings. You said you had none, she cried. What a joke! What a joke! screamed the Puralkas, flapping her with their wings. They spun around and round her, their long legs dancing madly, and their wings quivering and fluttering. Then they suddenly mounted into the air, circled about her once or twice, and flew away through the trees. The sound of their wicked laughter grew fainter and fainter until it died away. Kari sat down and put her head down on the ground. After a while she got up and tried to fly, but the little stumps of her wings would not raise her an inch from the earth, and very soon she ceased to try. She sat down again. Later on she stood up and began to try to dance as the Puralkas had done. She moved her great feet in the same way and tried to sway about, but it was useless. She looked so comical, hopping round on her thick legs, that the jackass, which had all the time sat in the gum tree overhead, broke into a great shout of laughter, and all the bush rang with the sound. Ha, 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 ho, 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 screamed the jackass. Kari is trying to dance. Look at her. There never was anything half so funny. Ha, 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 ho, ho, ho. And then Kari knew that she had lost her wings for nothing that she could never dance like the Puralkas, and that, worst of all, she could never go back to her nest in the clouds. She could not bear the harsh laughter of the jackass. And so she ran away, her long legs taking great strides, crashing into the undergrowth of the bush. And then the jackass flew away, still chuckling to himself that anyone could be so stupid. Soon the little green patch of grass was quite deserted, until the sun set, when the cruel Puralkas came flying back to it and danced again. But Kari never came to it. And so the emu lives on earth, and has forgotten all about the nest she once had in the drifting clouds. She has no friends among the birds, for though she is a bird herself, she has no wings and cannot fly. She has taught herself to run very fast, and to kick with her big feet, so that it is not wise to make her angry, because she used to live in the clouds, and had no proper training. She will eat the most extraordinary things, stones and nails and pieces of iron and glass, which the blacks have brought into the bush, but they never seem to disagree with her. She is not a very happy bird, for all the time she keeps hoping that her wings will grow long again, and that she will be able to fly back to find her cloud nest. But they never grow. Always since then, Merkeen, the jackass, has been able to laugh. He is called the laughing jackass because of this. He has been a merry fellow ever since he sat on the gum tree and watched Kari trying to dance after the cruel Peralkas had robbed her of her wings and left her far away from her nest in the white clouds. End of section six. Section seven of the Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. Buran the Pelican. Chapter 1. Long ago, black people were scattered all over the earth, and the forests and plains were full of them. But a great flood came 
For weeks it rained all day and all night until nearly all the plains were great swamps Then the snow was washed from the hills and the rivers and creeks overflowed their banks and swept over the country There was scarcely anything to be seen except the tops of the tallest trees sticking out of the waters that covered the land all the camps were washed away and nearly all the people were drowned in one tribe the only people left alive were a man and three women their camp was near a river and when the flood came and the river rose and washed away the whirlies they clung to a great log that lay upon the bank it was so huge a log that they did not think any flood would ever move it but they had seen only little floods and they did not know what the river could do when it rose in its wrath the water crept higher and higher as they clung to the log and at length they felt its great length give a little shiver beneath them presently it shifted a little and the water slipped below it and soon it swung right round until one end pointed over the bank still the flood came rising and rising and presently a wave flowed right over the log and washed off some of the people who were clinging to it but the man and the three women dug their fingers into knot holes and cracks and held on desperately and then a fresh rush of water took the log and it bumped heavily three times on the bank and slid off into the water at first its weight took it under the surface and the four blacks feeling the cold dark water close over their heads were sure that death had come for them still they gripped the log and presently it rose and the current whirled it round and sent it off downstream it bumped heavily on a snag and one of the women fell off crying for help as she went the man leaned over quickly and by good chance gripped her by the hair somehow half pulled half climbing she managed to scramble back and got another grip upon the sodden wood then the flood carried them into the darkness all through the cold blackness of the night they held to their rocking place of refuge sometimes it went aground with a jar that shook it through its great length and hung a while before a fresh spurt of water washed it off again to float away into the storm riven night once more then there would come bends in the river when the current would fail to take the log round quickly enough because it was so long and it would sail on and ram its nose into the bank running so far into the soft mud that perhaps an hour would creep past before the washing of the water worked it loose again then the log would swing right round shaking in the eddies until it seemed that numbed fingers could hold no longer but still the terrified blacks held on while their raft spun down the stream once more with the cold waves splashing over their shivering bodies dawn broke slowly in the midst of a driving rain and showed them a country covered as far as they could see with water on either side of the river the topmost ridge of the high banks still could be seen but soon these were almost submerged and the log floated in the midst of a great brown sea about two hours after sunrise a sudden swirl of water took the log and floated it out upon the top of the left-hand bank it came to rest with a shock and one of the women loosened her grip and fell off with a mournful little cry that she could hold on no more but to her surprise the water was only up to her knees and the log lay at rest beside her its voyage over the man whose name was carwin grunted as he straightened his stiffened limbs slipping down into the water beside the woman that was good luck for you merla he said if the water had been any deeper you would have gone forever for there is no strength left in me to pull you out i thought it was the end said merla her teeth chattering with cold and as far as i can see it might as well have been the end for it is better to die quickly than slowly and we shall never get out of this dreary place that is very likely said carwin but still i am glad to be able to let go of that shaking log and stand upright once more the other women had scrambled to a sitting position on the log and were rubbing their stiffened limbs i think those who stayed in camp will have died more comfortably than we shall said one how are we to get any food oh there will be no food carwin answered unless the flood goes down very quickly we shall certainly starve 
I do not even know where we are, and I have no weapons. Kai, none of our forefathers ever knew such a flood. It is something to have seen it. That will not do us much good when we're lying dead in the mud, said Merla shortly. I would rather have a piece of kangaroo now than see the biggest flood that ever was in the world. I have had enough of floods. Do you think the water will come any higher? How can I tell? answered Carwin shortly. And then, because they were all tired and frozen and hungry, they quarreled about it and became almost warm in the discussion. After a while, Carwin laughed. If I had a waddy, I would give all three of you something to argue over, he said. What is the use of becoming angry when there is nothing to be gained by it? It will not take us off this bank, that is certain. No, but it keeps us from thinking, Merla said. When I was angry just now, I quite forgot that I was hungry. All women are a little mad, said Carwin scornfully. No amount of talking could ever make me forget that I was hungry. It is the most important thing in the world. He looked about him. Behind the ridge of the river bank on which their log lay, the current of the flooded stream swept by, deep and swift. Before, the sea of brown water stretched as far as he could see, broken only by clusters of storm-washed leaves that were the tops of submerged trees. There no current ran, but the wind fled along the surface of the water and blew it into ripples and little waves. I wonder how deep that is, said Carwin thoughtfully. I will go and see. He took a few careful steps forward, then his foot slipped, and he slid off the mud of the crest of the bank and immediately disappeared with a loud splash. The women set up a dreadful screaming, crying, Come back, which under the circumstances was a very stupid thing to say. For a long moment the world seemed empty before them. Then Carwin's head suddenly popped up out of the water, with his face very wet and angry. He swam to the ridge, but it was not easy to get upon it, for the crest was sharp and very slippery, as Carwin already knew to his cost. Several times he clawed at it, only to slide back into the deep water, spluttering and wrathful. Hold on to the log, said Merla quickly to one of the women. Then give your sister your other hand, and she can hold mine. The three formed a chain, and found that by stretching as far as they could reach, Merla could just touch Carwin with her hand. He made a great effort and caught it in a firm grip. Then they pulled all together, and so managed to tug him over the edge of the ridge. Carwin was very angry, and not at all grateful to them. You might have thought of that sooner, he growled. Kai, the water is cold, and I sank down into a clump of prickly bushes so that I am stuck with prickles all over. There is no getting away from this bank, that is certain. We had suspected that, said Merla, laughing. At this, Carwin became worse tempered than ever, for a black fellow does not like to be laughed at by a woman any more than a white man likes it. He threatened to beat them all, and even struck out at one of the women who was grinning. But Merla spoke to him severely. Don't do that, she said boldly. We're all in the same fix together, and we will not be beaten by you. If you strike one of us, we will all push you off into the deep water, and this time we will not pull you back. Therefore, you had better be warned. Merla looked so fierce as she spoke that Carwin stopped the hand he was lifting to strike the woman and scratched his head with it instead. It was quite a new experience for a black fellow to be ordered about by a lubra, and you can fancy that he did not like it. Still, the other women were clearly prepared to back up Merla, and he did not forget how he had struggled in the water at the edge of the bank before they pulled him in. So instead of hitting the woman, he growled unpleasantly and waded to one end of the log, where he sat down and gave himself up to a very bad temper. This time, however, he kept it inside him, and so it did not hurt anyone. The sisters looked at Merla with great respect. But Merla only laughed at them. She was a pretty woman for Lubra. Her hair was long and very black and curly, and she was much fairer than most of her tribe with a fine flat nose and a merry smile. None of her teeth had been knocked out, which happens to many lubras, and so there were no holes in her smile. 
She was little more than a girl, but she was tall and strong and very clever. And she was not at all afraid of Carwin. For two days the four castaways sat on their log and watched the flood. Once it rose higher when a fresh mass of snow was washed from the distant hilltops and came down to swell the river, and they thought their log was again about to be carried downstream and gave themselves up for lost, for they knew that now they were too weak to hold on for very long. But the log held firm upon the bank, and the danger passed. It was very cold. They plastered themselves all over with a thick coating of mud, hoping that when it dried it would keep them warmer, and this helped them against the cold wind, though it was not at all comfortable in other ways. But worst of all was hunger. On the second day they began to break pieces off the log and chew them, and that, as you can imagine, did very little good. Carwin became more and more bad-tempered, and looked at the women as if it was their fault. Also, he was very sore from the prickles, and the two sisters and Merla spent quite a long time in picking them out of his back, though he was only a little grateful to them. On the second day, the water began to go down. The river still roared and raced past them, bearing on its breast all kinds of things, trees, logs, bushes, interlaced fragments of ruined whirlies, drowned animals, and even dead blacks but its water slipped back from the bank where their log lay until it left them on a little mud island with the brown sea still rippling about them in every direction. The tops of the trees came farther and farther out of the water, and the new treetops came into view with their boughs laden with mud. Often they saw little living animals in the brushwood that went drifting by them in the river, and nearly all the floating rubbish was alive with snakes that had taken refuge from the flood. Sometimes the brushwood would break up in the current, and they would see the snakes swimming wildly until the river carried them out of sight. Two came ashore on their island, and Carwin killed them with a stick he had taken out of the river. They ate them and felt a little better but they knew that they must soon die if they did not get more food. They watched the river anxiously, hoping that it might bring them something else. Towards evening they were gazing upstream when Merla cried out suddenly, "'What is that?' she said, pointing to a dark spot on the water. "'It is a bush,' said one of the women in a dull voice. "'No, I am certain it is an animal,' Merla said. "'It is floating towards us. Let us try to get it.' And so they held hands, as they had done when Carwin fell in, and Carwin slipped into the current, holding Merla's hand tightly. He had found a stick with a sharp hook on one end, where a branch had broken off, and when the dark object came bobbing downstream, he thrust at it fiercely, savage with hunger. The hook caught in it, and very carefully they drew it ashore and managed to get it on their island. It was a harder matter to get Carwin back. But they managed that, too, and then they all lay on the mud and panted, and except for Merla's fair face, they looked as if they were part of the mud. Their find was a plump young wombat, and it probably saved their lives. Of course, they had no way of cooking it, but at the moment that scarcely troubled them. Neither did they at all object to the fact that it had been dead for a good while. They ate it all, and long after the moon had come out to cast her white light into the flood, it showed them sitting on the log, happily crunching the bones. End of section 7For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. Buran the Pelican, Chapter 2. Buran was a very clever bird. He was bigger than most of the waterfowl and very strong. He was also very proud, partly because of his great wings, which would carry his heavy body skimming over the lakes and swamps and partly because of his beautiful white plumage. All his feathers were perfectly white, 
and he was so vain about it that he scorned every bird that had colored or dark plumage. He used to look at his reflection in deep pools and murmur, How beautiful I am! If by any mischance he got a mud stain on his feathers, he was quite unhappy until he had managed to wash it off. Some people might not think a pelican a very lovely bird, but Booran was completely satisfied with himself. Besides being beautiful and white, Booran at that time owned a bark canoe. It made him prouder than ever. It was not a very big canoe, but it was as much as a pelican could comfortably manage. He used to sit in it and paddle it along with his strong wings. There was really no reason why he should have had a canoe at all, for he was quite able to swim about in the water with far less labor than it needed to paddle his boat with his wings. It was only part of his great pride. Still, no other bird had ever thought of having a canoe, so it pleased Booran to think himself superior to them all. No other bird wanted one at all, but he forgot that. The emu laughed at him openly. And when Booran offered him a trip in his canoe, he asked rudely what Booran thought he could do with his long legs in such a cockle shell. Well, that made Booran more indignant than he had ever been since two black swans had risen suddenly under the canoe one day and upset both it and Booran in a very muddy part of a lake. He vowed that no other bird should ever enter it. Sometimes a meek little bird such as a honey-eater or a bell-bird would perch on the edge of the canoe and ask to be ferried about But Booran never would allow it. He used to catch fish And when he had stored all he could in his pouch He would put the rest in the canoe so that soon it became all one dreadful smell Not that any people in the country of the blacks were likely to object to that they were brought up on smells when the big flood came, Booran enjoyed himself thoroughly. The river was too swift for him to attempt in his canoe at first, but he paddled about in the water that covered the plains, and poked into a great many things that did not concern him in the least. Sometimes he ran aground, when it was always an easy matter for him to jump overboard and push the canoe off with his great beak. He found all kinds of new things to eat floating round in the flood water, and some of them gave him indigestion rather badly. But on the whole it was a very interesting time, and he was very glad that he had a canoe, so that he could go about in a stylish manner. It was on the afternoon of the third day after the water had begun to go down that Booran was first able to try the canoe on the river. The current was still swift, but he kept in the quieter water near each bank, and did not find much difficulty in getting about. He saw a number of strange blacks on a rise near the water, busily building whirlies, but they did not see him, for he dodged under cover of the wattle trees fringing the bank. Then he pulled downstream for a little while, until he came to where the banks were lower, and not many trees were to be seen out of the water. He rounded a bend, and came upon Carwin and his companions. Buran's first instinct was to get out of sight. He was afraid of all black fellows, especially when they had spears and throwing sticks. But before he could go, the woman Merla saw him, and uttered a great cry of astonishment. At once they believed that it was magic. So many strange things could be explained that way. They watched the big white bird in his bark canoe, and waited to see what would happen, hoping that he was not an evil spirit who would do them any harm. Seeing them so quiet and realizing that they were unarmed, Booran allowed his natural curiosity to get the better of him. He paddled across the river, swept down a little by the current, and stopped his canoe in a quiet pool near the mud island where the castaways sat miserably on their log. They looked so forlorn and unhappy that even his cold and fishy heart was stirred. Good day, he said. Good day. Carwin answered. This is a big flood, Buran remarked. Yes, it is a very big one. All the land has gone away. Yes, but it will come back. Fish are scarce now that the river is high. That is very likely, said Carwin. 
and then having made all these stupid remarks as all men do before they come to business they stopped and looked at the sky and Buran said I wonder if more rain will come Merla struck in suddenly men are very strange she said they are always ready to jabber how is it that you go about in that little boat because I like it said Buran shortly for he did not approve of women talking so freely and neither did he like the question about his canoe Merla laughed you look very funny when you're cross she said I never saw such a dignified pelican but the other women shuddered for they thought that Buran might be an evil spirit in which case he would certainly object to such free and easy remarks but Buran looked at Merla and saw how pretty she was and suddenly he did not wish to be angry instead he smiled at her and no one who has not seen it can imagine how peculiar a pelican looks when he smiles it is a very useful canoe he said I have been all over the floodwaters in it and have seen many wonderful things have you any food asked Merla eagerly no for I have eaten it all but I may come across some at any time would you like it like it said Merla why we have only had two snakes and a wombat between us for four days and the wombat was only a little one I could eat the quills of a porcupine dear me said Buran looking at her with his foolish little eyes very wide oh, that would be very unpleasant would it not I quite regret that I ate an old fish that I found in the stern of my canoe this morning uh, not that it would have made much of a meal for four people it would have given me a breakfast said Carwin rudely but as there is no food there is no use in talking about it tell me pelican have you seen any of our people we do not know if there are any left alive I have seen some blacks but I do not know if they are your people Buran answered there across the river where they're building themselves new huts can't you go and see if they belong to our tribe Buran shook his big head decidedly not I he said most blacks are very uncivil to pelicans and these had weapons close at hand I have no wish to be found with a spear sticking in my heart or in any other part of me did you notice what they were like Merla asked eagerly I saw a fat woman and a thin man said Buran stupidly how should I know what they were like they're not beautiful like pelicans oh and I saw a very tall man with a red bone through his nose he was sitting idly on a stump while the others worked that was my husband said Merla with a faint shriek alas I thought he was drowned and the fat woman may be your wife Guma she said to Carwin very likely said Carwin did you notice if they had food I do not know but it is likely for they had fire and there was a pleasant smell if my wife Guma has food and fire while I have nothing there will be trouble said Carwin wrathfully that may be but we will die here without ever knowing Merla said long before the water goes down we will have starved to death and then nothing will matter she broke off a bit of wood and flung it into the swirling river I wish we had never tried to save ourselves or seen that hateful log now Buran had been watching Merla and he thought she looked very capable and he thought that she could be very useful to him if he could get her away to some place where she could catch fish for him so that he might spend all his time admiring himself and paddling about in his canoe but he did not quite know how to manage it Carwin and the woman went on wrangling they had not been happy before Buran came with his tidings but now they could only think of their fellow blacks feasting and making a warm and comfortable camp and it made them feel very much worse than they had felt before they shouted long and loudly in the hope of making the others hear but no answer came and the river rushed by them without pity and they hated their little mud island all the time Buran gazed at Merla and at last he made up his mind that he could not possibly do without her whatever happened he must get her away and sail with her in his bark canoe to an island where the blacks could never find her 
The others were talking so fast that he had time to think out a plan, and when they stopped for lack of breath, he spoke. I think, if you sat very still and got in and out very carefully, that I could take you across the river one at a time, he said, speaking in a great hurry. That thing would sink, said Carwin sulkily, looking at the little canoe with eyes of scorn. No, it does not sink easily. You would have to be very careful, but it would be safe. Carwin looked at the canoe, and then he looked at the trees that showed round the bend when the high banks were quite clear of water. It was very tempting to think of getting there. Such a little way, he thought hard, and then he said, You can take Kari first. She is the lightest, and if the canoe does not sink with her, perhaps I will go. Buran did not care which he took first, so long as it was not Merla. But the woman Kari objected very strongly, and made a great outcry, for she thought she would be drowned. However, the others were all agreed that she should go, so there was no use in objecting, and she had to give in. Crying and trembling, she stepped into the canoe which Buran brought close to the bank. The canoe went down a good deal, but it did not sink and Buran paddled gently up the stream, keeping very close to the bank, so that the current did not sweep him down. He disappeared round the bend, and for a while Carwin and the two women who were left watched anxiously, fearing to see the upturned canoe float back empty. But in about ten minutes they saw Buran turn the corner and paddle swiftly down, evidently very pleased with himself. When he got near the mud island, he called out, All is well. I landed her easily on the bank, and she has run to the camp. Well, that made the others eager, and Merla stepped forward to get into the canoe. But Buran stopped her, saying, Not now, next time. And before she could argue, Carwin twisted her out of his way and stepped into the canoe so hurriedly that it nearly sank and Buran called out very angrily to him to mind what he was doing. However, the canoe righted itself, and presently Buran had paddled it out of sight again. Merla began to feel a little uneasy, although she scarcely knew why. There was something wrong about the way that Buran looked at her, with his cold eyes that were so like a fish's. She felt she would be glad when she was out of his canoe and safely on the same side as her people. She did not want to get into the canoe at all, but as it was necessary to do so, she decided to get it over as soon as possible. So she said to the other black woman, I will go next, Mary. All right, said Mary, shivering under her little possum rug and her coat of mud. But tell the pelican to hurry back, or I shall certainly die of cold. Merla waited impatiently until Buran appeared and when the canoe came alongside the bank she was ready. But Buran looked at her queerly and said, Not now, next time. Why? asked Merla angrily. Oh, this is my turn. Not now, next time, was all Buran would say. And beckoned to Mary, who was not slow to obey, for she was very tired of waiting. She stepped in, and the canoe moved away from the mud island. Suddenly, Merla was very much afraid, although as a rule she did not know what fear meant. She felt that she must not get into Buran's canoe, that there was danger coming very close to her. In a few minutes he would be back for her. A quick resolve came to her mind. Whatever happened, Buran must not find her there when he came back. She slipped off her possum rug and wrapped it round a log that had come ashore on their island. It was just as long as she was, and when the rug was wrapped about it, it looked as if she were lying asleep. And then she slipped into the river and began to swim across. Buran and Mary were out of sight round the bend, and what she wanted to do was to get to the other side before the canoe came back. But it was not an easy matter. The current was swift, and though she was a very strong swimmer, it took her downstream and once she thought that she must be drowned. However, just as she was on the point of giving up, she felt the ground under her feet, and scrambled out upon a bank that was nearly all under water. Then she waded along it until she got near the bend. 
Just then she heard the noise of Booran's wings brushing in the water. She flung herself down on her face, just in time, for the canoe came round the bend and passed quite close to her. Booran heard the swirl in the water and glanced round, seeing the ripples. But just then he caught sight of what looked like Merla, lying on the mud island, and he said, oh, it was only a water rat, and paddled on. Merla lay still in the water, holding her breath, until he had floated down the stream. Then she got up very quietly and waded, sinking in the soft mud of the bank until it grew higher, and trees and dry land could be seen. She ran then, casting her eyes wildly about her, until she saw ahead a little drift of smoke. And presently, toiling up a steep rise in the bank, she came upon the blacks, where already Carwin and Mary and Kari were jabbering loudly, telling all their experiences and hearing those of the others at the same time. They cried out with astonishment when they saw Merla coming along the bank and asked her why Booran had not brought her in his canoe. When she told them she had been afraid of him, they all laughed at her. But her husband, the tall man with the red bone through his nose, was very angry because she had left her possum rug behind, and asked her if she thought rugs like that grew on wild cherry trees. He went off at once to see if he could get it back, telling her, as he went, and if he failed, she need not think she was going to have his. Of course, Merler had known that already. Meanwhile, Mooran had paddled down to the mud island, and seeing the form in the possum rug lying under the shelter of the great log, he called to it several times, saying, Come on now, it's your turn. But no movement came. And at last he grew angry, and hopped out of the canoe, and went on to the island, still calling. There was no answer and he lost his temper and kicked the figure very hard, with the result that he hurt his foot very much, and then he pulled the rug off roughly and found only a log underneath. Buran became furious. He had been made to look a fool. For a while he stamped about the island, screaming in his rage, and when the blacks got to the opposite bank, that is how they saw him. Then Buran made up his mind that he would look out, fight, as the blacks do and kill the husband of the woman. So he took some mud, and smeared it on himself in long lines, so that he might be striped, as the blacks are when they go fighting. For a black fellow does not consider himself dressed for battle until he has painted himself in long white streaks with pipe clay. He was so busy painting, and planning how he would slay Merla's husband, that he did not see a black shadow in the sky. It was another pelican, and he came nearer puzzled to know what could be this strange thing, so like a pelican, and yet striped like a fighting man. He could not make it out, but he decided it could not be right, and so he drove at Boran and struck him in the throat with his great beak, killing him, and then he flew away. Now the blacks say there are no black pelicans any more. They are all black and white just as Buran was when his death came to him suddenly out of the sky. The blacks across the river were very much amazed, but when the great black pelican had sailed away, Merla's husband swam across and got her possum rug, which he brought back, tied on top of his head. He gave it back to Merla, and then beat her with his waddy for having been so careless as to leave it behind, and so they lived happily ever after. But the river took Buran's little canoe and whisked it away. It bobbed upon the brown water like a walnut shell, spinning in the eddies and sailing proudly where the water was clear and free. At each mile the river grew wider and fuller, and the little canoe sped onwards on its breast. And then ahead came a long line of gleaming silver, and the river sang that it had nearly reached the sea. The light canoe rocked over the waters of the bar, but came safely through them, and then it floated away westward into the sunset. But the tide brought it back to shore, and the breakers took it and flung it on the rocks, pounding it on their sharp edges until it was no longer a canoe, but only a twisted bit of bark. The waves went back and left it lying on the beach and some blacks who came along hungry and cold were very glad to find it and use it 
to start their fire when it was dry. And so Buran's canoe was useful to the blacks until the very end. End of section 8、section、9 of the Stone Axe of Berkhamik. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke David Johnson. LukeDavidJohnson.com. The Stone Axe of Berkhamik by Mary Grant Bruce. The Story of the Stars. Hunjel, who was the maker of men, sat in his high place one day and looked at the world. The blacks believed that in the very long ago he had made the first men and women out of clay. And from there they had spread over all the earth. Punjal had made them to be good and happy, and for a long while he had been satisfied with them. But now it was different, and he was angry. All over the world he could see his black people. They had grown tall and strong, and he thought them beautiful. They were skilled in hunting and fierce in battle. The women were clever at making rugs of skins, at cooking, at weaving curious mats and baskets of pliant rushes. The forests were full of game for them birds, beasts, and reptiles, all good to eat. There were fish in the lakes and rivers, fat mud eels in the creeks and swamps, and gum and manna to be found on every hillside. The world was a good, green world, and there should have been only happiness. But the people themselves had grown wicked. Punjal bent his brows with anger as he looked down upon them. Instead of being peaceful and content, his people had grown fierce and savage. They thought only of fighting and conquest, and were too lazy to work. The laws that he had made for them were as naught in their eyes. They said, Oh, Punjal is very far away. He would never come down into our world to see what we do. Why should we obey him? So they did just as they pleased, and all the world was evil because of their wickedness. Punjal thought gravely as he looked down into his world, and all the sky was dark with the blackness of his frown. My people have grown too many, he said. When they were few, each helped the other. There was no time for feuds or fighting, for all had to work together in order to live. Now all is changed. They are many and powerful, and they overrun the world, and each man hates his brother. It were better if I made them fewer and scatter them far and wide. I will send my whirlwinds upon the earth. So Bunjal caused storms and fierce winds to arise often, and they swept across the world. In the flatlands there came suddenly whirlwinds of great force. That twisted and eddied through the plains, carrying men aloft in their choking embrace, and letting them fall broken and dead, miles away from the places where they had lived. On the mountains, great hurricanes blew shrieking from peak to peak, tearing up the largest trees by their roots and tossing them into the fern strewn gullies far below. Huge boulders were loosened and went crashing down, and often a landslip followed them. When all the soil would be stripped from a hillside and fall, thundering, carrying with it hundreds of people, and leaving the bare rock behind it, like a scar upon the side of the mountain. Thunder and lightning came and shook the world with terror. Mighty trees were riven and shattered, and fires swept through the forest and plain, leaving blackness and desolation behind. Then came floods that covered the low lying parts of the earth, and made the rivers roaring torrents that ran madly to the sea. The world trembled in terror of the wrath of Punjal. And yet men had grown so wise and cunning that not very many died. When the whirlwinds and hurricanes came, they crept into holes in the hillsides or sheltered themselves in deep gullies. They strengthened their houses so that the wind would not blow them away. Sometimes they floated down the rivers in bark canoes, and a great number found refuge in caves. Those who were killed were the careless ones, who would not take the trouble to protect themselves against the fury of the storms. Thinking that they would only be ordinary gales. But though they died, innumerable people were left. Just for a little while, they were afraid. They knew they were wicked, and that Punjal must be angry with them. And the thought that possibly the storms were the message of his wrath made them careful for a while. But as time passed, they forgot the storms and the whirlwinds, and the fate of their brothers and sisters who had been killed. And they went back to their wickedness, becoming worse than they had been before. And then there came a day when Punjal's anger broke anew. One morning a blackness came out of the sky, and in the blackness a flame of gleaming fire. The people clustered together in terror, and there were cries of Punjal, Punjal is coming. Then the magic man began to chatter and make magic, hoping to turn the wrath of the maker of men. 
and the people flung themselves upon the ground, crying aloud and calling upon the good spirits to save them. The blackness swooped down upon the earth. In the air were strange whisperings and mutterings, as if even the rustling leaves in the boughs of the trees were crying, Punjal is coming. And then, out of the glowing heart of the clouds, came Punjal himself, that he might see these men and women that he had made. He spoke no word. His glance was like lightnings, playing about the stricken eyes of those that gazed. But he trod amongst the black multitudes, and the noise of the trampling of his feet shook the earth. In his hand he carried his great stone knife, and the sight of it was very terrible. Those who looked upon it fell back blindly. But as he walked on, he cut his way among the people, with great sweeps of the cruel weapon, sparing none that came in his way, and cutting them into small fragments. And then the blackness of the cloud received him again, and hid him from the people of the world. But the pieces of the slain were not dead. Each fragment moved, as Tur the worm moves and from them rose a cry. It came from the fragments of those who had been good men and good women, and yet who had met death at the knife of Punjel with the guilty ones. Then a great and terrible storm came out of the sky, sweeping over the places where Punjel had trod, and with it a whirlwind that gathered up the pieces of those who had been men, women, and children, and they became like flakes of snow, white and whirling in the blackness of the air. They were carried away into the clouds. And when they came to where Punjal sat once more looking down upon the world, he took the flakes that had been bad men and women, and with his hands scattered them so far over the earth that no man could say where they fell. So they passed forever from the sight of man, and now they lie in the waste places of the world, where there is neither light nor day. But Punjal took the snowflakes that had been good men and women, and he made them into stars, Right up into the blue sky he flung them, and the sky caught them and held them fast, and the light of the sun fell upon them, so that they caught some of his brightness. There they stay forever, and you would not know that they are in any way different from the other stars that twinkle at you on a frosty night when the sky is all blue and silver. Only the magic men, who know everything, can tell you which among the stars were once good men, women, and children, before Punjal had left his high seat to punish the wickedness of the world. End of section 9. Recording by Luke David Johnson. LukeDavidJohnson.com Section 10 of the Stone Axe of Burkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. The Stone Axe of Burkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. How Light Came, Chapter 6. The blacks believed that the earth was quite flat, with the sky arched above it. They had an idea that if anyone could get beyond the edge of the sky, he would come to another country, with rivers and trees where lived the ghosts of all the people who have died. Some thought there was water all round the edge of the earth. They were taught that at first the sky had lain flat on the ground, so that neither sun, moon, nor stars could move. But the magpies came along and propped it up with long sticks, resting some parts on the mountains near the edge. And sometimes word was sent from tribe to tribe, saying the props were growing rotten, and unless the people sent up tomahawks to cut new props, the sky would fall. In its falling it would burst and all the people would be drowned. This used to alarm the blacks greatly and they would make the magic men weave charms so the sky should not fall. At first all the earth was in darkness, and at that time there lived among the blacks a man called Ditchi. In his tribe was a very beautiful woman whose name was Mitjin, and she became Ditchi's wife. At first Ditchi and Mitjin were very happy. They had plenty to eat, and the camp was warm and comfortable, and they loved each other very much. There were no white men at that time. The blacks ruled all their country, which they thought was the whole world. The forests were full of game and the rivers of fish. Everyone had enough, so there was no fighting. And Dit Yi thought he was the luckiest man in the world, because he had won the love of Mitjen. But a stranger came to the camp, a tall, dark-eyed man named Bunjil. He told stories of faraway forests and wonderful things to be found there. The other blacks used to listen to him, greatly interested, and no one listened more attentively than Mitjen, 
for she had a great longing to see the wonderful places of which Bunjil spoke. When she heard him tell stories of these strange lands of the bush, she burned to leave her quiet home and go exploring. Dit'i could not understand this feeling at all. It interested him to hear Bunjil's tales, but he had no wish to do more than hear them. He was very well satisfied with his life, and thought that his own home was better than any other place could possibly be. But Bunjil soon noticed the dark-eyed girl who never lost a word of his stories. It amused him to see her face light up and her eyes sparkle at his talk. And so he told more and more stories, and did not always trouble to make them true, so long as he could make Mitjen look interested. Sometimes he would meet her wandering alone outside the camp, and then he would tell her, as if he were sorry for her, that this quiet camp was no place for her at all. You are so beautiful, he would say, that you should be far away in my wonderful country, where you would see many great men and lovely women, but none more lovely than Mitjen. In this dull hole you are buried alive. None of this was true, but Bunjil spoke exactly as if it were, and after a time Mitjen began to be very discontented. This simple happy life in the bush pleased her no longer. She only wanted the exciting things of which Bunjil told. At home, everybody was good to her and liked her, but she was only a girl who had to obey other people all the time, and no one but Ditty had ever troubled about telling her that she was beautiful. Moreover, she could see that Bunjil did not think much of Ditty. She called him one day to Mitjen, an ignorant black fellow, and though Mitjen could not imagine any people who were not black, it sounded very uncomplimentary, and she could not forget it. As soon as he had said it, Bunjil apologized, saying it was only a slip of the tongue. But in her heart, Mitjen knew this was not true. It made her look down on Ditty a little, and wonder if he really were worthy of her. One day, she asked him if he would take her to Bunjil's country, and a surprise prevented him from speaking for some time. He could only look at her, with his mouth open. "'Go away from home?' he said at last. "'Why? What is there to go for?' To see the world, said Mitjen, tossing her head. I do not want to stay forever in this weary place. But it is the world, or most of it, returned Ditty. I do not know where Bunji's country is, but the men there cannot be up to much if they are like him, for he is more useless than anyone I ever saw. He cannot throw a boomerang better than a girl. The spear, I could beat him with my left hand. You are boastful, said Mitjen coldly. Throwing weapons is not everything. Well, I don't know how things are managed in Bunjil's country, but it is very important in ours that a man should know how to throw, said Dit Yi. Perhaps Bunjil's game comes close to him to be killed, but here a man has to hunt it. Did Bunjil mention if it came ready cooked, too? Don't suppose you would want to do any work in that country of his? This made Mitjen very angry. She quarreled fiercely with Dit Yi for making fun of her. And then Dit Yi lost his temper and beat her a little. Just quite the usual thing to happen to a woman among the blacks. But Mitjen had been told by Bunjil that in his country, a man never raised his hand against a woman. So it made her furious to be beaten by Dit Yi, though he cared for her too much to really hurt her. She broke away from him, ran to the camp, sobbing that she hated him, did not want to see him any more. Near the camp, she met Bunjil, who asked her why she was crying. And when she told him, he was very kind to her patting her gently, pretending to be very angry at Ditty. He was safe in doing this, for Ditty had gone off whistling into the bush, not sorry that he had beaten Mitjen if it should make her sensible again, but sorry that she was unhappy and resolved to bring her back a snake or something equally nice for supper. So Bunjo ran no risk in abusing him, and he did it heartily. When they had finished talking, Mitjen walked away from him into the camp with a very determined face. She went straight to her whirly, and though Ditty brought her home a beautiful young snake and a lace lizard, she would eat nothing, and refused to come out of the whirly to speak to him. So Ditty went back to the young men's huts, angry and offended, and Mitjen lay down, turning her face to the wall. She was just as determined, but only her own heart knew how much she was afraid. When the people of the camp awoke, she was gone. Nowhere was there any trace of her, and the blacks went to look for Bunjil in his whirly, he was gone too. Then they fell into a great rage, 
and the young men painted themselves in white stripes with pipe clay and went forth in pursuit carrying all their arms led by dit ye but though they would look for many days they could never come upon a track so at last the other young men gave up the search and went back to the camp but dit ye did not go back there was nothing for him at home now that he had lost mitjen and so he went on hunting through the dark forests for his lost love bunjil and mitjen fled far into the bush for a long time they walked in the creek so they would leave no tracks and if they came to deep holes they swam them they were far away from mitjen's country before they dared to leave the water and already the girl was tired but bunjil would not let her stop to rest for he knew that they would be pursued he hurried her on forgetting now to be gentle when he spoke to her it was not many days before mitjen realized the terrible mistake she had made they fled deeper and deeper into the bush but no wonderful country came in sight she was often cold and hungry and bunjil made her work harder than she ever had worked before doing not only the woman's work but a large share of the man's she found out that he was almost too lazy to get food and if she had not hunted for game herself she never would have had enough to eat bunjil told her that he loved her but very soon she knew that was not true and all that he wanted was a woman to cook for him and to help him procure food at first she used to ask him when they would come into his own country and he would put her off saying presently pretty soon but before long she found out that it made him angry to be asked about it and at last if she spoke of it he beat her cruelly so mitjen did not ask any more then all the memories of dit and his love came crowding upon her and her heart quite broke she did not want to live any more she lay down under a big log and when bunjil spoke to her there was no answer so he kicked her and left her but after he had slept he went to see why she lay so still and he found that she was dead as he looked at her a great storm came out of the bush and whirled him away it flung him far up in the sky where you may see him now if you look closely a lonely wandering star finding no rest anywhere and no mate always he must wander on and on and never stop no matter how tired he may be and the other stars shrink from him hurrying away if they cross his path the storm took mitjen also and carried her gently into the sky and there she saw dit'yi who lit it all up for he had been turned into the sun and was giving light to the earth but always the blacks say he is sick seeking mitjen like a great fire he leaps through the sky mourning for his love and going back and forth in ceaseless quest of her his whirly is in Nangant, just over the edge of the earth and the bright color of sunset is caused by the spirits of the dead going in and out of Nagant, while dit ye looks among them for his lost love but he never finds her and so the next day he begins to hunt again goes tramping across the sky sometimes he shouts her, her name mitjen mitjen and then it is we hear thunder go rolling around the world but mitjen never answers she has been made into the moon and always she mourns far away and alone when she sees the glory of the sun and hears his trampling feet she hides herself for now she is ashamed to let him find her she only comes from her hiding place when he sleeps and then she hurries through the sky so that she may have the comfort of going in his footsteps though she knows now she can never hope to overtake him sometimes she sighs and then a great soft breeze flutters over the earth and the big rain is the tears that relieve her grief end of chapter six recording by april walters section eleven of the stone axe of berkamuk this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce Chapter 7 The Frog That Laughed Before Punjel, maker of men, peopled the earth with the black tribes, and very long before the first white men came to Australia, the animals which inhabited the land fell into great trouble. And this is how it happened. Old Kanara, the black chief, told it to me while we were fishing for cod on the Murray one hot night, and he had it from his father, 
whose mother had told him about it, while to her the story had come from her grandfather, who said he was a little boy when his grandfather had told him, saying he had had the story from Kanara the magpie, after whom he was named. And magpies learn everything, so you see, he ought to know. Kanara said that once in the long-ago time, all the animals were living very cheerfully together, when suddenly all the water disappeared. They went to sleep with the creeks and swamps full, and the rivers running, and when they woke up, everything was dry. Of course, this was the most terrible thing that could happen to the animals, for though they can manage with very little food in Australia, at a pinch, they must always have plenty of water. They searched everywhere for it, through the scrub and over the plains, and the birds flew great distances, always seeking with their eyes for a gleam of water, but it had quite gone. So the animals held a council of war, and Moran the kangaroo spoke to them. At a council, someone must always speak first, to tell those present what they know already. And Moran did this very thoroughly, so that little Kubaru, the native bear, went to sleep and began to climb the legs of the emu in his sleep, thinking she was a tree. This led to a disturbance, and it was some time before Moran could go on with his speech. Then he found that he had forgotten the rest of what he meant to say, so he contented himself by asking them all what they meant to do about it, and remarking that the matter was now open for discussion. This is a remark often made at meetings. Then Moran sat down thankfully, but in his relief at finishing his speech, he sat on Coburn the porcupine, and Coburn is the most uncomfortable seat in the bush. Moran got up more quickly than he had sat down, and again there was disorder in the meeting, especially as the jackass was unfeeling enough to laugh. When matters were more quiet, Kelelek, the cockatoo, made a long speech, but it was hard to understand what he said, because all his brothers would persist in speaking at the same time. Everyone knew he wanted water, but as everyone was in the same fix, it did not seem to help along matters to have him say so. Buran, the pelican, was even more troubled about it than Kelelek, for of course he lived on the water, and he wanted fish badly. All the fish had disappeared, and the eels had buried themselves deep in the soft mud of the beds of the rivers and creeks, and none of the waterfowl had any food. The red wallaby wat and old Warreen, the bad-tempered wombat, made speeches, and so did Mary, the black dingo, and Tonga, the possum, and a great many other animals but not one could suggest any means of getting water back, or form any idea as to how it had gone away. They were all talking together, getting rather hot and excited, and very thirsty, when they heard a sudden whir of wings overhead, and a bird came dropping down into their midst. It was Taruk, the seagull, and though at first they were inclined to be angry at his sudden appearance, they soon saw that he had news to communicate, and so they crowded round him and begged him to speak. Taruk was a proud bird, and did not often leave his beloved sea, so they knew that something important must have brought him so far in shore. He stood in their midst, dainty and handsome, with his snowy feathers and scarlet legs, and carefully brushed a fragment of grass from his wing before replying. Waga, the fishhawk, came along this morning, in a shocking temper, too, and told me of your difficulties, he said. Well, we of the sea know what has caused them. There was an instant hubbub. All the animals and birds cried out at once, saying, What is it? Taruk looked at them all calmly. If you make such a clatter, how can I tell you? He asked crossly. I have not much time either, because my mate and I have youngsters to look after, and it is nearly time I got back to find their dinner. The animals became silent at once, and looked at him anxiously. Three nights ago, said Taruk, Tatalak, the big frog, came out of the sea. Everyone knows he lives there, but none of us had ever seen him, and he is as large as many whirlies. All the sea was troubled at his coming, and big waves rolled in and beat upon the shore, so that we could scarcely see the rocks for the spray. A hollow booming sound came from under the sea, and all our young ones were very much alarmed. Then a wave larger than all the rest put together crashed into the beach, and when it began to roll back, we saw Tatalak waddling up on shore. Most frogs hop, but he is so huge he gets along in a kind of a shuffle. But where did he go? cried Caden, the iguana lizard. He waddled away into the plains beyond, 
and when I flew in to look for him, for a while I could not see him. Then I heard a strange noise of water sucking, and I flew to where it came from. There was a hollow in the creek bank, and Tadalak was sitting there, with his head in the water, sucking it all up, and as he sucked, he swelled. It was not a nice sight, and soon I flew away. But where is he now, and what did he do? asked the animals anxiously. I did not watch him any more, but the west wind knows all about him, and he told me when I was out fishing last night. It seems that Tadalak lives under the sea, because of his former sins, and that is why he has grown so huge. But he always wants to come back to land, and sometimes he breaks away from his prison under the sea and gets up to the surface, and a great stir his coming makes. It's very annoying if you're fishing, for it scares all the fish away into the farthest corners of the rocks. But the salt water he has drunk for so long makes him terribly thirsty, and unless he can get fresh water to drink, he has to go back to his sea prison. Then that is why he has drunk all of ours, cried the animals. Taruk nodded very hard. Yes, he said. It is very seldom that he gets a chance of coming up, and his last three landings have been made in the desert, where he has had no water at all and he has been forced to hurry back meekly to the sea. So he is now more thirsty than he ever was before. The west wind said he did not stop drinking until this morning, and now there is no water anywhere, as you know. Then how shall we ever get any more? Are we to die of thirst? Well, that I do not know. I have told you all that I know, said Taruk. Tatalak is somewhere on shore, and so far as I can tell, all the water is inside of him. But I do not know where he is, nor if you can do anything. Now I must go back to my young ones, for they all will certainly be hungry, and my mate will be cross. He bowed to the kangaroo and flew up into the air. Then he went skimming over the forest to the sea. When he had gone, the animals talked again. But there was great grief among them, and they did not know what to do. At last it was agreed that Malian, the eagle hawk, should fly to the shore and find out anything he could about Tadalak. So huge a frog, they thought, could not hide himself from the eyes of an eagle hawk, which can see even a little shrew mouse in the grass as he flies. So Moran, the kangaroo, bade Malian to be as quick as possible, and he flew off, while all the people awaited his return as patiently as they could. But they were too thirsty to be very patient. It was evening when Malian returned. The day had seemed very long, and he was tired, for it is not easy to fly for a long while without water. Tatalak is the most terrible frog you could imagine, he said. He is squatting on a rise not far from the sea, and he has drunk so much that he cannot move. His body is swelled up so that he is bigger than anything that ever existed, bigger than the little hill on which he sits. Nothing could possibly be so large as he is. He does not speak at all. But what is to be done? cried the other animals. I asked everyone they met, but they could not tell me. So at last I found old Blook, the bullfrog, for it struck me that he would know more of the ways of other frogs than anyone else. I found him with great difficulty, and for a long time he was too angry to speak, for he has now no water to remain in and none to drink. But he knows all about Tadalak. He says that now he has inside him all the waters that should cover the waste places of the earth, but that we shall never have water unless he can be made to laugh. To laugh, cried the animals. Who can make a frog laugh? Bluke knows he cannot, so that is why he is angry, answered Malian. But that is the only way. If Tatalak laughs, all the water will run out of his mouth, and there will once more be plenty for everyone. But unless he laughs, he will sit there forever, unable to move, and soon we shall all die of thirst. The animals talked over this bad news for a long time, and at last they agreed that everyone who could be at all funny must go and try to make Tatalak laugh. A great many at once said that they could be funny, but when they were tried, their performances were so dull that most of those who looked on were quite annoyed, and refused to let them go near the frog, for fear that he should lose his temper instead of laughing. However, everyone was too thirsty to wait to try all of those willing to undertake to make him merry, and they set off through the bush in a queer company, the animals running, hopping, and walking, the snakes and reptiles crawling, and the birds flying overhead, 
The water will run back to you before we do, they cried to their wives and young ones they were leaving behind. But that was just a piece of brave talk, for in reality they did not feel at all sure about it. They hurried through the scrub, getting more and more scattered as they went along, for the swift ones would not wait for those who were slower. In the early morning the leaders came out of the trees and found themselves on a swampy plain leading to the sea. All the water had dried up, and a creek that had its course through it was also dry. It was a very dreary-looking place. Not far from the beach there was a little hill, and, sitting on it, they saw the monster frog. He was a terrible creature in appearance, for he was so immense that the hill was lost under him, just like a hugely fat man sitting on a button mushroom. He was so swelled up that it seemed that if anything pricked him he would burst like a balloon. But when they came near him they saw how thick his skin was and knew that no prick would go through it. His beady eyes were bulging out, and though they tried to attract his attention, he only gazed out to sea and took no notice of them at all. Well, he has certainly had a great drink, but he does not look as if he enjoyed it, remarked Moran, hopping around him. I should think he would find himself more comfortable under the sea than sitting on that poor little hill, said Merkeen, the jackass. He will probably go back to the sea, the native companion answered. Let us hope he will not take all the water with him. How uncomfortable he must be. Why, he is like a mountain, hissed Mamung, the black snake. May I not go and bite him? Certainly not, said Moran hastily. It might make him angry, or he might die, and we do not want the water poisoned. Unless you can make him laugh, you had better get into your hole. So Mamung subsided, muttering angrily to himself. Then the animals began to try to make the frog laugh. It was the first circus that ever was in Australia. They danced and capered and pranced before him and the birds sang him the most ridiculous songs they could think of, and the insects sat on his head, and they told him the funniest stories they had gathered in flying around the world. But he did not take the smallest notice of any of them. His bulging eyes saw them all, but not a word did he say. It's very hard to be funny when nobody laughs, and the animals soon became rather disheartened. But Moran would not let them stop. He himself did the most wonderful jumps before the frog, and once hopped right over the emu, who looked so comical when she saw the great body sailing over her that all the animals burst out laughing, but the frog merely looked as though he would like to go to sleep. Then Menak, the bandicoot, brought his brothers and performed all kinds of antics, and the possums climbed up a little tree and hung from its boughs and were very funny in their gymnastics, and the dingo and his tribe held a coursing match around the hill on which the frog sat going so fast that no one could see where one yellow dog ended and the next began. But none of these things amused the frog at all. He stared straight in front of him, and if possible, he looked a little more bulgy. But that was all. The animals held another council and tried to think of other funny things. Muran remembered how the jackass had laughed when he sat down on Cowern the porcupine, and, though that had been the most unpleasant experience for him, he bravely offered to do it again. Cowern, however, did not like the idea, and scuttled away into a hole, and they had great difficulty in finding him. And when they did find him, it was quite another matter to make him come out. At last they induced him to appear, and to let Moran sit on him. But it was not a successful experiment. Perhaps Moran was nervous, for he knew how it felt to sit on Cowern's quills. And so he let himself down gently, and Cowern gave a heavy groan, but no one even smiled. As for the frog, he was heard to snore. It was all rather hard on Moran, for the experiment hurt him just as much as if he had been quite successful. So the day went on, and when it was nearly evening, the animals could do no more. And still Tatalak sat and stared stupidly before him, and looked more and more huge and bulgy in the gathering darkness. And Watt, the red wallaby, declared that the little hill he sat on was beginning to flatten under his weight. They were quite hopeless at last. All were so tired and thirsty that they could not have attempted more antics, even had they known any. But, indeed, they had done everything they knew. They sat in a half-circle around the great frog and looked at him sadly, 
and the frog sat on his hill and did not look at anything at all. Just about this time, Noyang, the great eel, woke up. He was lying in a deep crack in the muddy bed of the creek, and when the mud dried and hardened, it pinched him, and he squirmed and woke. To his surprise, there was no water anywhere. Noyang wriggled out of his crack, very astonished and indignant. He found all the creek bed dry, as you know. So he wriggled across it and up the bank, and came out on a little mud flat by the sea. There he looked about him. On one side the sea rippled, but Noyang knew that that water was no good for him. On the other was only dry land, the swampy ground he knew and loved, but now there was no water in it. It was very puzzling to a sleepy eel. He looked a little farther and saw the great frog sitting on his hill, but he looked so huge that Noyang thought the hill had simply grown bigger while he slept, and though that was surprising, it was not nearly so surprising as finding no water. Then he saw all the animals sitting around him, but he took no notice of them. All he cared for was to get away from this hot, dry mud and find a cool creek running over its soft bed. So he wriggled on, making very good time across the flat. Nobody saw him, for all the animals were looking miserably at the frog. Cowern, the porcupine, had felt very sore and bruised after Moran sat on him for the second time. He was a sulky fellow, and he did not want to be sat on any more, even if it were for the good of all the people. Moran will be making a habit of this soon, he said crossly. I will get out of the way. So he hurried off to get into the nearest hole, which happened to be near the edge of the mud flat. There he went to sleep. Noi Yang came wriggling along, hating the hard ground, and only wanting to get to a decent creek. He was in such a hurry that he did not see Cowern, and he wriggled right across him. And it seemed to him that each of Cowern's spines found a different place in his soft body. Noyang cried out very loudly and threw himself backwards to get off those dreadful spikes. He was too sore to creep at all. The only part of him that was not hurt was the very point of his tail, and he stood up on that and danced about in his wrath and pain, with his body wriggling in the air and his mouth wide open. And when the monster frog caught sight of the eel dancing on his tail on the mud flat, he opened his mouth and let out such a great shout of laughter as had never been heard before in the world or will ever be heard again. Then all the waters came rushing out of the frog's mouth, and in a moment the dry swamp was filled with it, and a sheet of water rushed over the mud flat where Noyang was dancing and carried him away, which was exactly what Noyang liked and made him forget all his sores. It was not so nice for Cowern the porcupine, for he was swept away too, and as he could not swim, he was drowned. But he was so bad-tempered that nobody cared very much. Tatalak went on laughing, and the water kept pouring from his open mouth, and as he laughed he shrank and shrank, and his skin became flabby and hung in folds about him. He shrank until he was only as large as a few ordinary frogs put together, and then he gave a loud croak and dived off into the water. He swam away, and none of the animals ever saw him again. At the moment, the animals were much too busy with their own affairs to think much about Tadalak. When the water first appeared, they rushed at it eagerly, and each drank as much as he could. Then they felt better and looked about them. Moran, the kangaroo, was the first to make a discovery. Kai! It will flood, he said. A flood? Nonsense, said Warreen the wombat. Why, ten minutes ago it was a drought. Yes, and now it will be a flood, said Moran, watching keenly. Look! The water had run all over the plain, filling up the swamp, and already the creek showed like a line of silver, where but a few moments ago there had only been dry mud. But it was plain that the water could not get away quickly enough. All the plains was like a sea, and there were big waves washing round the little hills. Save yourselves, cried Moran to the people. Soon there will be no dry land at all. He set off with great bounds, thinking of his mate and his little ones he had left in the forest. Behind him came all the people, running, jumping, and crawling, and behind them came the water in one great wave. Some reached the high ground of the forest first and found safety, and others took refuge on hills, while those that could climb fled up trees. But many could not get away quickly, and the waters caught them, and they were drowned. Next morning the animals that were saved gathered at the edge of the forest and looked over the flood. It stretched quite across the plain, 
and between it and the sea was only the yellow line of sand hummocks. Nearer to the forest were a few little hills, and on those could be seen forlorn figures huddling together for warmth, for the air had become very cold. "'There are some of our people,' cried Moran in a loud voice. "'How are we to rescue them?' No one could answer this question. None of the animals could swim, and if they had been able to do so, they had still no way of getting the castaways to dry land. They could only look at them and weep because they were so helpless. After a while, Buran the pelican came flying up in a state of great excitement. "'Have you seen them?' he cried. "'Wad is there, and little Tonga, and Possum, and, and old Warring, and a lot of others. And soon they will die of cold and hunger if they are not saved, so I must save them.' You, said all the animals. There's no need to say it in that tone, said Buran angrily. I can make a canoe and sail over quite easily. It will please me very much to save the poor things. So Buran cut a big bark canoe, which he called Gree. He was very proud of it, and would not let anyone touch it or help him at all, and when it was finished he got in and paddled over to the little islands where the animals shivered and shook, with soaked fur and heavy hearts. They grew excited when they saw Buran coming, and when he arrived with his canoe, they nearly tipped it over by all trying to get in at once. This was repeated at each island, and at last Buran lost his temper altogether and threatened to leave them all where they were. This dreadful idea made them very meek, and they were quite silent as Buran paddled them towards the shore. Now, Buran had not a pleasant nature. It did not suit him to find people meek for it at once made him conceited and inclined to be a bully. He felt very important to be taking so many animals back in his boat, and so he began to say rude things to them, and in every way to be unpleasant. The animals bore this quietly for a time, for they were too cold to want to dispute him, and besides, they were really grateful for being saved. But after a while, he became so overbearing, Watt, the red wallaby, answered him back sharply, and others joined in. Before they got to shore, they were all quarreling violently, and when they had only a few yards to go, Buran suddenly stopped paddling and jumped out so quickly that he upset the canoe and threw all the animals into the water. He swam off chuckling and saying, That will help you cool off your bad tempers. The water was not deep, and the animals escaped with only a ducking. They struggled to the dry land, very wet and miserable. That was a mean trick to play on us, said little Tonga, his teeth chattering. I would like to fight Buran, if only he would come ashore. But he will keep out of our way now. Kai, look at him, said Watt. They looked, and they saw Buran coming in rapidly, as though he were floating on the water, and had no power to stop himself. His eyes were fixed and glassy, and his great beak wide open. A wave brought him right up to the shore, and blew over him in a cloud of spray. And when the spray had gone... Buran had gone too, and where he had lain on the bank was a big rock, shaped something like a pelican. That was the story old Kanara told me as we fished for Murray Cod together. He said that all his people knew the rock and called it the Pelican Rock, and it stood in the plain long after Buran and his children's children's children were almost forgotten. Today the plain is dry, and no water ever lodges there. But when the blacks see the pelican rock, they think of the time when it was all in flood, when Tadalak, the great frog, nearly caused all the animals to die of thirst, and when Noi Yang, the eel, saved them by dancing on his tail on the mud flat by the sea. End of section 11. Section 12 of the Stone Axe of Burkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Matthews. The Stone Axe of Berkabuck by Mary Grant Bruce. The Maiden Who Found the Moon, Chapter 1. Very long ago, before the white man came to conquer the land, a tribe of black people lived in a great forest. Beyond their country was a range of mountains which separated them from another tribe of fierce and warlike blacks, and on one side they were bounded by the sea. They were a prosperous tribe, for not only was there plenty of game in the forest, 
to give them food and rugs of skins for clothing, but the sea gave them fish, and fish were useful both to eat and for their bones. The blacks made many things out of fish bones, and they found them very useful for tipping spears and other weapons. Being so powerful a tribe, they were not much molested by other blacks. The mountains to the north were their chief protection. No wandering parties of fighting men were likely to cross them and surprise the tribe, for they were steep and rugged and full of ravines and deep gullies that were difficult to cross, unless you knew the right tracks. The nearest tribe had come over them more than once, and great battles had taken place. But the sea tribe was always prepared, for the noise of their coming was too great to be hidden. There had been great fights, but the sea tribe had always won. Now they were too strong to fear any attack. So strong were they, indeed, that they did not trouble about fighting. They only wished to be peaceful. Their life was a very simple and happy one, and they did not want anything better. The tribe was called the Baringa tribe, and the name of its chief was Wadru. He was a tall, silent man, very proud of his people and their country, and of his six big sons, all strong fighting men like himself. But most of all, he was proud of his daughter, Miraga. Miraga was just of woman's age, and no girl in all the tribe was so beautiful. She was straight and supple as a young sapling, lissom as the tendrils of a clematis, and beautiful as the dawn striking the face of the waters. Her deep eyes were full of light and she was always merry. The little children loved her, and used to bring her blossoms of the red native fuchsia to twine in her glossy black hair. Most blacks, men and women, look on everything they met with one thought. They ask, is it good to eat? But Miraga was different. She had made friends with many of the little animals of the bush, and they were her playmates. Bandicoots, shrew mice, pouch mice, kangaroo rats, and other tiny things. They were quite easy to tame if anyone tried. Even snappy little Yakaru, the native cat, with its spotted body and fierce sharp head, became quite gentle with Moraga and did not try to touch her other pets. She begged the tribe not to eat the animals she loved, and they consented. Of course, in many tribes it would have been necessary to go on using them for food, and any woman who tried to save them would only have been laughed at. But the Baringa folk had so much food that they could easily afford to spare these little furry creatures. Besides, it was Moraga who asked, and was she not the chief's daughter? However, it was not only because she was the chief's daughter that the people loved Moraga and did what she asked them. She was always kind and merry, and went about the camp singing happily generally with a cluster of children running after her. If anyone were sick, she was very good, bringing food and medicines. Being the daughter of Wadaru, the chief, she might have escaped all work, but instead she did her share and used to go out digging for yams and other roots with the other girls of the tribe, the happiest of them all. The tribe beyond the northern hills was called the Biran. They were very fierce and had many fighting men, but their country was not so good as that of the Baringa, and they were very jealous of the happy sea tribe. One time they came to the conclusion that it was long since they had had a fight, and that it would be a very good thing to try to win the Baringa country. They did not want to go over the mountains unprepared, so they sent a picked band of young men telling them to cross into the country of the Baringas and find out if they were very strong and if there were still much game in the forest. They were not to fight, but only to prowl in the forest and watch the sea tribe stealthily. Then they were to return over the mountains with their report, so that the head men of the Buren could decide whether it were wise to send all their fighting men over to try to conquer the Baringa. The little band of Buren men set off with great pride. Their leader was the chief's son, Urong who was stronger than any man of his tribe, and of a very fierce and cruel nature. He was not yet married, 
although that was only due to an accident. Once he had been about to take a wife, and had gone to her camp and hit her on the head with his waddy, which was one of the blacks' customs in some tribes, before carrying her to his own whirly. But he hit her too hard, and the poor girl died, which caused Yurong a great deal of inconvenience, because her parents wanted to kill him, too. It was only because he was the chief's son that he escaped with his life. Now he was still unmarried, because no girl would look at him. It made Yurong more bad-tempered than he was naturally, and that is saying a good deal. He had great hopes from the expedition into the Baringa country. If he came back successful, and won a name for himself as a fighter, he thought all the maidens of his tribe would admire him and forget that he had been so ready with his stick when he was betrothed first. Yurong and his band left the plain where the Buran tribe roamed and journeyed over the mountains. They did not find any great difficulties, for they had been told where to find the best tracks, and they had scarcely any loads to hamper them. It was summertime, and the lightest of rugs served them for covering at night, even in the keener air of the hills. There was no difficulty in finding food or water, and the stars were their guides. When they came to the country of the Baringas, they went very cautiously, for they did not wish to encounter any of Wadaru's men. In the daytime they hid themselves in the gullies and in the bends of the creek, only coming out when their scouts knew that no enemies were near. But at night they traveled fast, and before long they climbed up the great hill that lay across their path, and from its topmost peak they saw the gleaming line of the sea. Then, watching, they saw campfire smoke drifting over the trees, and they knew they had found Wadaru's camp. They became more careful than ever, knowing that now was their greatest danger. Sometimes they hid in trees, or in caves in the rocks, all the time watching and noting in their memories the number of the men they saw and the signs of abundance of game. There was no doubt that this was a far better country than their own, and they thirsted to possess it. At the same time, they could see how strong the Baringas were. Even their women folk were tall and straight and strong, and would help to fight for their land and their freedom. The Buran men used to see them when they went out to dig in the bush. A merry laughing band. Always with them was a beautiful girl with red flowers in her hair. Yurong would watch her closely from his hiding place, and he made up his mind that when the fighting was over, this girl would be the chief part of his share of the spoils. He was so conceited that he never dreamed that his tribe would not win. But misfortune fell upon Yurong and his little band. They were prowling around the outskirts of Wadaru's camp one night, when a woman, hushing her crying baby to sleep, caught a glimpse of the black forms flitting among the trees. She gave the alarm silently, and silently the fighting men of the Baringas hurled themselves upon the intruders. There was no time to flee. The Buran men fought fiercely, knowing that escape was hopeless. One by one they were killed. Yurong was the last left alive. He turned and ran when the last of his comrades fell, a dozen Baringas at his heels. The first he slew, turning on him and striking him down. Then he ran on wildly, hearing behind him the hard breathing of the pursuing warriors. Suddenly the ground under his feet gave way. He fell down, down, into blackness, shouting as he went. Then he struck icy water with a great splash. When he came to the surface he could see the moonlight far above him and hear the voices of the Baringa men, loud and excited. Then he went under once more. On the river bank, steep and lofty, the Baringas watched the black pool where Yurong had disappeared. There was no sign of life there. He is gone, they said at last. No man ever came alive out of that place. Well, it is a good thing. They watched a while longer, and then turned back to the camp, where songs of victory were ringing out among the trees. End of section 12
Section 13 of the Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. Chapter 8 The Maiden Who Found the Moon. Part 2. But Yurong did not die. When he sank the second time, he did it on purpose. The fall had not hurt him, and his mind worked quickly, for he knew that only cunning could save him. He swam under water for a few moments, letting himself go with the current, but presently a kind of eddy dragged him down, and he found himself against a wall of rock which blocked the way, so that there seemed to be no escape. But even in his agony he remembered that so long as the current ran, there must be some way out, and he dived deeply into the eddy. It took him through a hole in the rock far under the water, scraping him cruelly against the edges, but still he was through, and on the other side he rose gasping. Here the river was wider and shallower, and not so swift. Yurong let it carry him for a while, then he scrambled out on one side and found a hiding place under a great boulder. He rubbed himself down with rushes, shivering. Then, crouching in his hole, he slept. When he awoke, he knew that now he should not lose a moment in getting back to his tribe. He had learned the fighting strength of the Barangas with all else that he had come to find out. But, besides that, he had now the deaths of his comrades to avenge. And yet, three days later, Yurong was still in hiding near the enemy's camp. He had made up his wicked mind that when he went away, he would take with him the beautiful girl he had so often seen in the forest with her companions. Quite unconscious of her danger, Moraga went about her daily work. The sight of her and the beauty of her burned into Yurong's brain. Often in the forest he dogged her footsteps, but the other girls were always near her and he dared not try to carry her away. He knew now that she was the chief's daughter, and he smiled to think that through her he could deal the cruelest blow to Wateru, besides gaining himself the loveliest wife in all the bush. But out in the scrub the girls clustered about Moraga, and in the camp the young men were never far from her. There was not one of them who would not have gladly taken her as his bride, but she told her father that she was too young to think of being married, and Wateru was glad enough to keep her by his side. But Yurong, fiercely jealous, could see that there was one man on whom Moraga's eyes would often turn when he was not looking in her direction a tall fellow named Kona War, the swan, who loved her so dearly that indeed he scarcely gave her a chance to look at him since he so rarely took his gaze from her. He was the leader of the young fighting men and a great hunter, and Yurong thirsted to kill him as the kangaroos thirst for the creek in the summer when drought has laid his withering hands upon the waters. So five days went by. In the forest, Yurong hid, living on very little food, for he dared not often go hunting, and always watching the camp, and Moraga, never dreaming of the danger near her, lived her simple, happy life. The children always thronged round her when she moved about the camp, and she would pause to fondle the little naked black babies that tumbled round the whirlies, tossing them in the air until they shouted with laughter. Yurong saw with amazement how the little animals came to her and played at her feet, and it impressed him greatly with a sense of the wealth of the Baringa tribe. Kai, he said to himself, they are able to use food for playthings. Never before had he dreamed of such a thing. One evening the girls went out into the scrub, yam digging, each carrying her yam stick and dilly bag, the netted bag into which the black women put everything from food to nose ornaments. Moraga's was woven of red and white rushes, with a quaint pattern on one side, and she was very proud of it, for it had been Konawar's gift. She was thinking of his kind eyes as she walked through the trees, brushing aside tendrils of starry clematis and wild convolvulus, and finding a way through musk and hazel thickets. He had looked at her very gently when he gave her the bag, and she knew that she could trust him. She was very happy as she wandered on, so happy that she did not notice for a while that she had strayed some distance from the other girls, and that already the shadows were creeping about the forest to make the darkness. "'I'm too far from camp,' she said aloud. 
I must hurry back, or my father will be angry. She turned to retrace her steps, pausing a moment to make sure of her direction. Then, from the gloom of a tall clump of dogwood, something sprang upon her and seized her. She struggled, sending a stifled cry into the forest, but it died as a heavy blow from a wadi took away her senses. Euron carried her swiftly away. Day came and found them still fleeing. Moraga, a helpless burden in her captor's arms. Days and nights passed, and still they traveled northwards, across the rivers, the forests, and the mountains. They went slowly, for at length Eurong could carry the girl no farther, and at first she was too weak to walk much. Even when she grew stronger, she still pretended to be weak, doing all in her power to delay their flight, always straining her ears in the wild hope that behind her she might hear the feet of the men coming to save her, led by Wateru and by Konawar. Somewhere, she knew, they were searching for her. But as the days went by and no help came, her heart began to sink hopelessly. Yurong was not unkind to her. He treated her gently enough, telling her she was to be his wife. But she hated him more and more deeply each hour. Thinking her very weak, he let her travel slowly and helped her over the rough places, though she shrank from his touch. But he took no risks with her. He kept his weapons carefully out of her reach, and at night, when they slept, he bound her feet and hands with strips of kangaroo hide, so that she might not try to escape. Then they came upon the topmost crest of the mountains, and below them Yurong could see the country of his people. At that, Muraga gave up all hope. They camped on the ridge that night, and for the first time she sobbed herself to sleep. She woke up a while later, with a sound of little whispers in her ears. It was quite dark inside the whirly, but she heard a patter of tiny scurrying feet and a few faint squeaks. Miraga lay very still, trembling. Then a shrill little voice came very close to her. Mistress! Oh, mistress! Who is it? she whispered. We are your little people came the faint voice. Lie very still, and we will set you free. On her hand, Miraga felt a patter of tiny feet, like snowflakes falling. They ran all over her body. She felt them down at her bare ankles and near her face. She knew them now, though it was dark. Little Paddy Paddy, the pouch mouse, and Punta, the shrew mouse, and Kanungo, the kangaroo rat, and the bandicoot Talka, they were all her friends, her little people. Dozens of them seemed to be there in the dark, nibbling furiously at the strips of hide on her wrists and ankles. How long the time seemed as she lay, trembling in great fear, lest Euron should awaken. The very sound of her own breathing was loud in her ears, and the faint rustlings of the little people seemed a noise that must surely wake the sleeping warrior. But Euron was tired, and he slept soundly, and the little people worked hard. At last, the bonds fell apart, and she was free. Gliding like a snake, she crept out of the whirly and ran swiftly into the forest that clothed the mountains. But scarcely had she gone when Yurong woke and found she was not there. He sprang to his feet with a shout, grasping his weapons, and rushed outside. There was no sign of Moraga, but his quick ear caught the sound of a breaking twig in the forest, and he raced in pursuit. Again he heard it this time so close that he knew she could not be more than a few yards away. Then he found himself suddenly on the edge of a great wall of rock, and there was no time to stop. He shouted again in despair, and he fell down, down. Then no more sounds came. But just on the edge of the precipice, three bandicoots came out of a heap of dry sticks, laughing. That was easily done, said one. It was only necessary to jump up and down among the sticks and break a few, and the silly fellow made sure it was Moraga. Well, he will not make any more foolish mistakes, said his brother. But is it not surprising to find how simple these humans are? All but our mistress, said the first. Come, we must make haste and follow her, or else we shall have another long hunt. And nobody knows what mischief she may fall into if we are not there to look after her. End of section 13《Section 14 of the Stone Axe of Berkamuk》。This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by David Matthews. The Stone Axe of Bergamuck by Mary Grant Bruce. The Maiden Who Found the Moon. Chapter 3. Miraga ran swiftly into the heart of the forest, glancing back in terror, lest at any moment she should see Yurong. She heard him shout and the crash of his feet in pursuit as he plunged out of the whirly. For the moment she gave herself up for lost. He was so swift and so strong, she knew that she could never escape him once he was on her track. Another cry reached her presently, not so close. It gave her her first throb of hope that Yurong had taken the wrong turning among the trees. Still, she was far too terrified to slacken speed. She fled on, not knowing where she was going. A great mountain peak loomed before her, and she fled up it. It was hard climbing, but it seemed to her safer than the dark forest, where at any moment Yurong's black face might appear. Here, at least, she might be safe. At least he would not think of looking for her in this wild and rugged place. Perhaps if she hid on the mountain for a few days, he would grow tired of looking for her and go away back to his own people, and then she could try to find her way home. At the very thought of home, poor Miraga sobbed as she ran. It seemed so long since the happy days in the camp by the sea. The way was strange. She climbed up, among great boulders and jagged crags of rock. Above her the peaks seemed to pierce the sky. Deep ravines were here and there, and she started away from their edges. Somewhere water fell swiftly, racing down some narrow bed among the rocks. She went on, and the moonlight grew stronger and stronger until it flooded all the mountain. She fought her way step by step up the last great peak, and suddenly, in the midnight, she came upon a great and shining tableland. Then she knew that in her journeyings she had found the moon. She wandered on in doubt and fear fear not of this strange new land, but of the men she dreaded to find there. But for a long time she saw no people. Only in the dim hours, when the earth world glowed like a star, but all the moon country was dark, there came about her the little people that she knew and loved. Paddy Paddy and Punta, Talca and Kanungo. And because she was very lonely, and a lonely woman loves the touch of something small and soft, she took some of them up and carried them with her in her dilly-bag. "'How did you know I was lost?' she asked them. "'How did we know?' they said, laughing at her. "'Why, all the forest sang of it. The magpie chattered it in the dewy mornings. And Moko Moko, the bell-bird, told all about it to the creeks and the gullies. Moko Moko would not leave his quiet place to tell the other animals, but he knew the creeks would carry the story.' Soon there was no animal in the bush that did not know where you had gone. Only we could not tell your own stupid people, for they would not understand. And are they looking for me? Moraga asked. They seek for you night and day. Your father has led a party of fighting men to the east, and Konawar has gone north with all his friends. They never rest. All the time they seek you. And the women are wailing in the camp, and the little children crying because you are gone. That made Miraga cry, too. "'Can you take me back?' she begged. "'I can go if you will show me the way.' But the little people shook their heads. "'No, we cannot do that,' they said. "'We can help you, and we can talk to you, but we may not take you back. You must find the way yourself.' So Miraga wandered on through the moon country. It was very desolate and bare, strewn with rocks and craggy boulders and to walk long upon it was hard for naked feet. There were no rivers and no creeks, but a range of mountains rose in one place, and were so grim and terrible that Moraga would not try to climb them. She found stunted trees, bearing berries which she ate, for she was very hungry. Perhaps they are poisonous and will kill me, she said. I do not think that greatly matters, for I begin to feel that I shall never get home. But the berries were not poisonous. Indeed, Moraga felt better when she had eaten them. Her strength came back to her, and her limbs grew less weary. She put some of the berries into her dilly-bag for the little people. 
Then she set off on her wanderings again. She did not know how long she had been in the moon country, after a while. It seemed that she had never done anything but find her way across its rugged plains, seeking forever the track back to the green earth world. So silent and strange was it that she began to think there was no living being upon it but herself and the little people she carried with her. One day, wandering along a rocky edge, she quite suddenly came upon the camp of the man who dwells in the moon. She cried out in fear and fled, but he was awake, and when he saw this beautiful girl, he rose and gave chase. But Moraga was fleet of foot, and the man who dwells in the moon was a fat man and heavy, for as the blacks know, he never goes hunting, as men do, but always sits down in the shadow of his mountains. Presently he saw that the girl was escaping. She drew farther and farther ahead, running like a dingo, and already he was puffing and panting. So he stamped his foot and called to his dogs, and they came out of the holes of the hills, great savage brutes, lean and hungry-looking, of a dark color. They came running and growling and sniffing angrily at the air. Their master waved his hand, and they uttered a long howl and followed swiftly after Moraga. Now indeed she thought that her time had come. Mist swam before her eyes, and her feet stumbled. She, whose limbs were so lithe and strong, tottered like a weary old woman. Behind her the long howls of the dogs woke terror in her heart. They drew nearer. Almost she could feel their hot panting breath. But just as she was about to sink down exhausted, the little people in the dilly bag chattered and called to her. Mistress, oh mistress, they cried, let us out that we may save you. She heard them and fumbled with shaking fingers at the fastening of the bag. It slipped from her shoulders and fell to the ground. And as it fell, the animals burst out and fled in many directions, some here and some there, squeaking and chattering. And when the fierce dogs of the moon saw them, they forgot to pursue Moraga, but turned and coursed swiftly after the animals. Behind them, the man who dwells in the moon shouted vainly to them, there are no animals in the moon country, and so the dogs have no chance of hunting. But the sight of the scampering little people woke their instincts, and they dashed after them wildly. They caught some and swiftly slew them. Others dodged and leaped and twisted, escaping into the little rock holes where the dogs could not follow them. The noise of the hunting and the deep baying of the dogs echoed round the moon and made thunder boom among the stars. But Moraga ran on, stumbling for weariness. She knew that the dogs were no longer close upon her, but she dreaded to hear them again at any moment, for she did not see how such feeble little people could keep them off for long. So she ran, and as she went, her tears fell for the little friends who had given their lives for her. At last, too tired to see where her stumbling feet had led her, she came to the brink of a great precipice and fell down and down until her senses left her. But when she opened her eyes again, it was to meet those of Konawar, and he was holding her in his arms and calling her name over and over, with his voice full of pity and love, and behind him were his friends, all the band that had been seeking her with him. They were all smiling to her with welcome and joy in each friendly face. For in her fall she had come back to the dear earth world once more, and her sorrows were at an end. So when the tribes look up at the sky on moonlit nights, and see the great shape that looms across the brightness, they say it is the mighty man who dwells in the moon, who, like themselves, is black, but grown heavy and slothful with such idleness and sitting down. The parents scare idle children with his name, saying that if they do not bestir themselves, they too will become fat and useless like him. But Moraga used to tell her children another story, and when she told it her eyes would brim with tears. It was the story of the little people she loved, who followed her to the moon country, and there gave up their lives for her, saving her first from Yurong and then from the teeth of the dogs of the moon. And the children would shiver a little, clustering more closely, all save little Konawar, who would grasp his tiny boomerang and declare that he would kill anything that dared to hurt his mother. The great dogs still crouch around the man who dwells in the moon, waiting to do his bidding. 
You can see them, if you look closely, dark spots near the huge figure in the midst of the brightness. They are the fierce dogs that guard the lonely country in the sky, the dogs that long ago hunted, howling after Moraga the Beautiful, across the shining spaces of the moon. End of section 14「Section number fifteen of the Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. Mirin and Warreen. Mirin the kangaroo and Warreen the wombat were once men. They did not belong to any tribe, but they lived together and were quite happy. Nobody wanted them, and they did not want anybody, so that was quite satisfactory. Warreen was the first. All his tribe had been drowned in a flood, leaving him quite alone. So he found a good camping place, where there were both shelter and water and he made himself a camp of bark, which he called, in the language of his tribe, a willem. He was not in a hurry when he was making it, so he did it well, and no rain could possibly come through it. One side of it was a big rock, which made it very strong, so that no wind was likely to blow it away. Overhead a beautiful clump of yellow rock lilies drooped gracefully. Not that Warreen cared for lilies, and this particular clump annoyed him, for the rock was too steep for him to climb up and eat the lily roots. He had been living there for some time, very lazy and contented, when one day Mirin appeared. At first Warreen thought he meant to fight, and that also annoyed him, because he hated fighting. But Mirin soon showed him that he only wanted to be friends and then Warreen discovered that he was very glad to have someone with whom he could talk. So after the manner of men they sat down and yarned all day. Several times during the day Mirin said, I must be going. But Warreen always answered, Oh, don't go yet. And they went on talking harder than ever. Night came, and Mirin said, It is really time I made a move. Warreen said, Why not stay the night? I can put you up. They talked it over for a while, and then it was quite too late for Mirin to go. So he stayed all night, and in the morning Warreen said, Why not spare me a few days now that you are here? Mirin willingly agreed to this, for he had nothing to do, and he thought it very nice of Warreen to put the invitation that way. They became great friends. Mirin was tall and thin and sinewy, while Warreen was very short and dumpy, and exceedingly fat. Also he was lazy, and he liked having someone to help him get food, at which Mirin was very quick and clever. Mirin was also the last of his tribe. The others had been killed by warlike blacks, and Mirin would have been killed also but that he managed to swim across a river and get away into the scrub. He was very active and fleet of foot, and delighted in running, which was an exercise that bored Warreen very badly. Soon they made an arrangement by which Mirin did all the hunting, while Warreen dug for yams and other roots, and prepared the food just as a woman does. It suited them both very well. Mirin had one peculiarity that Warreen at first thought exceedingly foolish. He did not like to sleep indoors. It was summertime when he came, and he would not build himself a willem, but slept upon a soft bed of grass under the stars. If a cold night came, or even a rainy one, he rolled himself in his possum rug and slept just as happily. Warreen began by thinking he was mad. But as time went on, he often slept outside with Mirin himself, especially on those nights when they were talking very hard and did not want to leave off. 
Warreen used to grumble at the hardness of the ground, but he was really very much better for staying outside, in the fresh night air. His little Willem was a very stuffy place. Sometimes he would think about the winter, and say to Mirin, When are you going to build your Willem? Oh, there is plenty of time, Mirin would say. The cold weather will be here, and then what will you do? Oh, I expect I shall have my camp ready in time. It will not take me long to build it, when the time comes. If you are not very careful, you will find yourself caught by the winter, and you will not like that, said Warreen. But Mirin only laughed, and talked about something else. He hated building, and was anxious to put it off as long as possible. Warreen had a very suspicious mind and it often made him believe very stupid things. He was the kind of man who was best living alone, because so often he got foolish ideas into his head about other people, and imagined he had cause for offense when there was really none at all. So he began to wonder why Mirren would not build a camp, and the thought came to him that perhaps he did not intend to build at all, but meant to take possession of his own Willem. Of course that was ridiculous, for Mirren was only lazy, and kept saying to himself, "'Tomorrow I will build.' And when tomorrow came, he would say, "'Oh, it is beautiful weather. I need not worry about building for a few days yet.' So he went on putting it off, and Warreen went on being suspicious, until sometimes he felt sorry he had ever asked Mirren to live with him. But Mirren sang and joked and hunted and had no idea that Warreen was making himself uneasy by such stupid thoughts. One night, clouds came drifting over the sky, after a hot day, and Warreen said, I am not going to sleep outside tonight. I don't think it will rain, said Mirren. It is much cooler out here. Yes, but one soon forgets that when one is asleep. I hate getting wet, said Warreen. Well, just as you like, Mirren answered. For my part, I am too fond of the stars to leave them. So he spread his possum rug in a soft place and lay down. In a few minutes he was fast asleep, and Warreen went off to bed feeling rather bad-tempered, though he could not have told why. In the night heavy rain came, and the air grew rapidly very cold. Mirren woke up, grumbled a little at the weather, rolled himself in his possum rug, and crept into the most sheltered corner he could find by the rock, not wanting to disturb Warreen by going into the willum. It was too cold to sleep, so soon he uncovered the ashes of their campfire, and put sticks on it. And there he crouched, shivering, and wishing Warreen would wake up and invite him to sleep in the shelter. But the rain came more and more heavily, and a keen wind arose, and a sudden squall put out Mirren's fire. Soon little channels of water were finding their way in every direction over the hard ground, so that Mirren became very wet and half frozen. Then he noticed a red glow inside the willum. That is good, he said joyfully. Warreen is awake, and he has made himself a fire. Now he will ask me to go and lie down in his hut. He crouched close by the rock for a long time, thinking each moment that Warreen would ask him in. But no sound came, and after a while he came to the conclusion that Warreen could not know he was awake. So he got up and went over to the door of the willum and looked in. The little fire was burning redly, and all looked very cozy and inviting to poor frozen Mirren. Warreen lay near the fire and looked at him suspiciously. Kai, what a night!' said Mirren, his teeth chattering. You were right about the weather, Warreen, and I was wrong. I have been very sorry for the last hour that my camp is not built. May I come in and sit in that corner? There was not much vacant space in Warreen's little willum, but it was quite big enough for two at a pinch. In the corner to which Mirren pointed, there was nothing. But Warreen looked at him suspiciously, and grunted under his breath. <laughs> I want that corner for my head, he said at last, and he turned over and laid his head there. 
Mirren looked rather surprised. Uh, never mind, uh, this place will do, he said, pointing to another corner. I want that place for my feet, Warreen said, and he moved over and laid his feet there. Still Mirren could not understand that his friend meant to be so churlish. Well, this place will suit me famously, he said, pointing to where Warreen's feet had been. But that did not please Warreen either. You can't have that place. I may want it later on, he said with a snarl. And he turned and laid down between the fire and Mirren, and shut his eyes. Then Mirren realized that Warreen did not mean him to have any warmth or shelter, and he lost his temper. He rushed outside into the wet darkness and stumbled over a big stone. That was not a lucky stumble for Warreen, for all that Mirren wanted at that moment was a weapon. He picked up the stone and ran back into the willum. Warreen lay by the fire, and he flung the stone at him as hard as he could. It hit Warreen on the forehead, and immediately his forehead went quite flat. "'That's something for you to remember me by,' said Mirren angrily. You can keep your dark little hole of a willum and live in it always, just as you can keep your flat forehead. I have done with you. He turned and ran out of the hut, for he was afraid that if he stayed he would kill Warreen. Behind him, Warreen staggered to his feet and caught hold of his spear, which leaned against the wall near the doorway. He did not make any reply, but he drove the spear into the darkness after Mirren, and it hit him in the back and hung there. Mirren fell down without a word. The light from the fire shone on him as he lay there in the rain, with the spear behind him. Warreen laughed a little, holding by his doorpost. <laughs> I shall have a flat forehead, shall I? he said. Well, you will have more than that. Where that spear sticks, there shall it stick always, and it will be a tail for you. You will never run or jump without it again and never shall you have a willum. Then he had no more strength left, so he crept back and lay beside his fire, while Mirren lay in the pouring rain. No one saw Warreen and Mirren again as men. But from that time two new animals came into the bush, and the magpie and the mina, those two inquisitive birds who know everything, soon found out their story and told it to all the black people. So everybody knows that Warreen, the wombat, and Mirren, the kangaroo, were once men and lived together. They do not live together now, nor do they like each other. The wombat is fat and surly and lazy, and lives in a dark, ill-smelling hole in the ground. His forehead is flat, and he does not go far from his hole, and he is no more fond of working for his living than he was when he lived in a willum as a man. The kangaroo lives in the free open places and races through the bush as swiftly as Mirren used to race long ago. But always behind him he carries mo i i bu, as the blacks call his tail, and it has grown so that he has to use it in running and jumping, and now he could not get on without it. He is just as quick and gentle as ever, but when he is angry he can fight with his forepaws, just as a man fights with his hands. Other animals of the bush have holes and hiding places, but the kangaroo has none. He does not look for shelter, but sleeps in the open air. It is difficult to see him, for when he is eating young leaves and grass, his skin looks just the same color as the trees and you are sometimes quite close to him before his bright eyes are seen watching you eagerly. Then he turns and hops away, faster than a horse can gallop, in great bounds that carry him yards at every strive, with mo i i bu, his long tail thumping the ground behind him. He has learned to use it, to balance on it, and make it help him in those immense leaps that no animal in the bush can equal. So Warreen did not do him so bad a turn as he hoped when he threw his spear at him that rainy night long ago. End of section 15
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Stone Axe of Burkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. The Daughters of Wonkawalla, Part 1. The Chief Wonkawalla was a powerful man who ruled over a big tribe. They were a fierce and warlike people, always ready to go out against other tribes, and by fighting they had gained a great quantity of property and roamed unmolested through a wide tract of country, which meant that all the tribe was well fed. Wonkawalla had not always been a chief. He had been an ordinary warrior, but he was fiercer and stronger than most men, and he had gradually worked his way up to power and leadership. There were many jealous of him, who would have been glad to see his downfall, but Wonkawalla was wary, as well as brave, and once he had gained his position he kept it, and made himself stronger and stronger. He had several wives, and his whirlies were fine furs and splendid weapons and abundance of grass mats. Everyone feared him, and he had all that the heart of a black chief could desire, except for one thing, he had no son. Five daughters had Wonkawalla, tall and beautiful girls, skilled in all women's work, and full of high courage, as befits the daughter of a chief. Yilin was the eldest, and she was also the bravest and wisest, so that her sisters all looked up to her and obeyed her. Many young warriors had wished to marry her, but she had refused them all. Time enough, she said to her father, at present it is enough for me to be the daughter of Wonkawalla. Her father was rather inclined to agree with her. He knew that her position as the eldest daughter of the chief, without brothers, was a fine thing, and that once she married she would live in a whirly much like any other woman's, and do much the same hard work, and would have much the same hard time. The life of the black women was not a very pleasant one. It was no wonder that they so soon became withered and bent and hideous. Hard work, the care of many babies, little food, and many blows. These were the portion of most women, and might well be that even of the daughter of a chief, when once she left her father's whirly for that of a young warrior. So Wonkawalla, who was unlike many blacks in being very fond of his daughters, did not urge that Yilin should get married, and the suitors had to go disconsolately away. But there came a time when Wonkawalla fell ill, and for many weeks he lay in his whirly, shivering under his fur rugs, and becoming weaker and weaker. The medicine men tried all kinds of treatment for him, but nothing seemed to do him any good. They painted him in strange designs, and cut him with shell knives to make him bleed, and when he complained of pain in the back, they turned him on his face and stood on his back. So Wonkawalla complained no more, but the back was no better. After the sorcerers had tried these and many other methods of healing, they declared that someone had bewitched Wonkawalla. This was a favorite device of puzzled sorcerers. They had made the tribes believe that if a man's enemy got possession of anything that had belonged to him, even such things as the bones of an animal he had eaten, broken weapons, scraps of furs he had worn, or, in fact, anything he had touched, it could be employed as a charm against him, especially to produce illness. This made the blacks careful to burn up all rubbish before leaving a camping place, and they were very keen in finding odd scraps of property that had belonged to an unfriendly tribe. Anything of this kind that they found was given to the chief, to be carefully kept as a means of injuring the enemy. A fragment of this description was called a rulon, and was thought to have great power as a charm for evil. Should one of the tribe wish to be revenged upon an enemy, he borrowed his rulon from the chief, rubbed it with a mixture of red clay and emu fat, and tied it to the end of a spear thrower, which he stuck upright in the ground before the campfire. Then all the blacks sat round watching it, but at some distance away, so that their shadows should not fall upon it, and solemnly chanted imprecations until the spear-thrower fell to the ground. They believed that it would fall in the direction of the enemy 
to whom the Wuulon belonged ; and immediately they all threw hot ashes in the same direction, with hissing and curses and prayers that ill fortune and disease might fall upon the owner. The sorcerers tried this practice with every Wuulon in Wonkawala's possession, but whatever effect might have been produced on the owners of the Wuulons, Wonkawala himself was not helped at all. He grew weaker and weaker, and it became plain that he must die. The knowledge that they were to lose their chief threw all the blacks into mourning and weeping, so that the noise of their cries was heard in the wurley where Wonkawala lay. But besides those who mourned, there were others who plotted, even though they seemed to be crying as loudly as the rest. For, since Wonkawala had no son, some other man must be chosen to succeed him as chief and there were at least half a dozen who thought they had every right to the position. So they all gathered their followings together, collecting as many supporters as each could muster, and there seemed every chance of a very pretty fight as soon as Wonkawala should breathe his last. The dying chief was well aware of what was going on. He knew that they must fight it out between themselves, and that the strongest would win. But what he was most concerned about was the safety of his daughters. Their fate would probably be anything but pleasant. Once left without him, they would be no longer the leading girls of the tribe, and much petty spite and jealousy would probably be visited upon them by the other women, or they might be made tools in the fight for the succession to his position and mixed up in the feuds and disputes which would ensue. Indeed, it might easily happen that they would be killed before the fighting settled down. In any case, it seemed to Wonkawala that hardship and danger were ahead of them. He called them to him one evening and made them kneel down so close that they could hear him when he spoke in a whisper. Listen, he said, I am dying. No, do not begin wailing now. There will be time enough for that afterwards. My day is done, and it has been a good day. I have been a strong man, and my name will be remembered as a chief. What can a man want more? But you are women, and my heart is uneasy about you. Nothing will matter to us if you die, said Yilin. You may think so now, said the chief, looking at her with affection in his fierce eyes, but my death may well be the least of the bad things that may happen to you. You will be as slaves where you have been as princesses. Even if I am in the sky, with Punjel, maker of men, I shall be unhappy to see that. Therefore, it seems to me that you must leave the tribe. Leave the tribe? breathed Yilin, who always spoke for her sisters. But where should we go? I have dreamed that you shall go to the east, said her father. What is to happen to you, I do not know, but you must go. You may fall into the power of another tribe, and I believe they will be kinder to you than your own would be, for there will be much fighting here after I have gone to Punjel. I think any other tribe would take you in with the honour that is due to a chief's daughters. In any case, it is better to be slaves among strangers than in the place where you have been rulers. I would rather die than be a slave here, said Yilin proudly. Spoken like a son, said the old chief, nodding approval. Get weapons and food ready secretly, all that you can carry, and when the men are away burying me, make your escape. They will be so busy in quarrelling that they will not notice soon that you have gone, and then they will be afraid to go after you, lest any should get the upper hand during their absence. Go to the east, and Punjel will decide your fate. Now I am weary, and I wish to sleep. So Yilin and her sisters obeyed, and during the next few days they hid weapons in a secret place outside the camp, and crammed their dilly-bags with food, fire-sticks, charms, and all the things they could carry. Already they could see that there was wisdom in their father's advice. There was much talk that ceased suddenly when they came near, and the women used to whisper together, looking at them, and bursting into rude laughter. Yilin and her sisters held their heads high, but there was fierce anger in their hearts, for but a week back no one would have dared to show them any disrespect. At last, one evening, Wonkawala died, and the whole tribe mourned for him. For days there was weeping and wailing, and all the time the chief's daughters remained within their wurleys, seeing no one but the women who brought them food. 
As the time went on, the manner of these women became more and more curt, and the food they brought less excellent, until, on the last day of mourning, Yilin and her sisters were given worse meals than they had ever eaten before. Our father spoke the truth, said Yilin. It is time we fled. Time indeed, said Pika, the youngest sister. Did you see Tana's sneering face as she threw this evil food in to us? I would that Wonkawala, our father, could have come to life again to see it, said Yilin, with an angry sob. He would have withered her with his fury. But our day, like his, is done, in our own tribe. Never mind, we shall find luck elsewhere. After noon of that day, the men of the tribe bore the body of Wonkawala away to bury it with honour. The women stayed behind, wailing loudly, as long as the men were in sight. But as soon as the trees hid them from view, they ceased to cry out, and began to laugh and eat and enjoy themselves. They fell silent presently, as the five daughters of Wonkawala came out of their wurley, and walked slowly across the camp. They were muffled in their possum rugs, scarcely showing their faces. For a moment there was silence, and then one of the women said something to another, at which both burst into a cackle of laughter. Then another called to the five sisters, in a familiar and insolent manner, Where do you go, girls? We go to mourn for our father in a quiet place, answered Yilly haughtily. Oh, then the camp is not good enough for you to mourn in, cried the woman with a sneer. But do not be away too long, there will be plenty of work to do for you now. Remember, you are no longer our mistresses. No, it is your turn to serve us now, cried another. Bring me back some yams when you come, then perhaps there will not be so many beatings for you. There was a yell of laughter from all the women, amidst which Yilin and her sisters marched out of the camp with disdainful glances. When they drew near their hiding place, they kept careful watch in case anyone had followed them. As a matter of fact, all the women were by that time busily engaged in ransacking their whirly and dividing among them the possessions the sisters had not been able to carry away, so that they were quite safe. They collected their weapons and hurried off into the forest. They had obeyed their father and gone east, and the burial place was west of the camp, so they met nobody, and their flight was not discovered that night. The men came back to the camp in the evening, hungry and full of eagerness about the fight for the leadership of the tribe and the women were kept busy looking after them. The first fight took place that very evening, and though it was not a very big one, it left no time for anyone to wonder what had become of the five sisters. Not until next day did the tribe realize that they had run away, and then, as Wonkawala had foreseen, no one wanted to run after them. Certain young warriors who had thought of marrying them were annoyed but they could only promise themselves to pursue and capture them when the tribe should again have settled down under new leadership. The five sisters were very sad when they started on their journey, for the bush is a wide and lonely place for women, and there seemed nothing ahead of them but difficulty and danger. They wept as they hurried through the forest, nor did they dare to sleep for a long time. Only when they were so weary that they could scarcely drag themselves along did they fling themselves down in a grassy hollow, where tall ferns made a screen from any prying eyes, and a stream of water gave them refreshment. They slept soundly and dreamed gentle dreams, and when they awoke in the morning it seemed that a great weight had been lifted from their hearts. I feel so happy, sisters, said Yilin, sitting up and rubbing her eyes. Our father came to me in my sleep and told me to be of good courage and to smile instead of weeping. He came to me also, said Pika, and told me there was good luck ahead. After all, said another of the girls, what have we to fret about? It is a fine thing to go out and see the world. I am certain that we are going to enjoy ourselves. It will be interesting at any rate, said Yilin, but we must hurry onward, for we are not yet safe from pursuit though I do not think it will come. They made as much haste as possible for the next few days until it seemed certain that no one was tracking them down, and with each dawn they felt happier and more free from care. They were lucky in finding game so that they were well fed, and on the fifth day they came upon trees loaded with mulga apples, which gave them a great feast. They roasted many of the apples and carried them with them in their food bowls. 
Sometimes they came to little creeks, fringed with maidenhair fern, where they bathed. Sometimes they passed over great rolling plains, where they could see for miles, and where kangaroos were feeding in little mobs, dotted here and there on the kangaroo grass they loved. Flocks of white cockatoos, sulphur crested, flew screaming overhead, and sometimes they saw the beautiful pink and grey galas wheeling aloft, the sunlight gleaming on their grey backs and rose-pink crests. Then they went across the little range of thickly wooded hills, and the trees were covered with flocks of many-coloured parrots, and the purple-crowned lorikeets flew, screeching, sometimes alighting like a flock of great butterflies on a gum tree, to hang head downwards among the leaves, licking the sweet eucalyptus honey from the flowers with their brush-like tongues. Sometimes, when they had lain very quietly through a hot noontide hour, they saw the lyre-bird, the shyest bird of all the bush, dancing on the great mound twenty or thirty feet high, which it builds for its dome-shaped nest, mocking as it danced the cries of half the birds in the country, and waving its beautiful lyre-shaped tail. The magpie woke them in the dawn with its rich gurgling notes, the beautiful blue wren hopped near them, proud of his exquisite plumage of black and bright blue, chirping his happy little song. They passed swamps where cranes and herons fished, stalking in the shallows, or flew lazily away with dangling legs. And sometimes they heard the booming of the bittern, which made them very much afraid. At evening they would hear a harsh, clanging cry, and looking up, they would see a long line of black swans flying into the sunset. There were other birds, too, more than any white boy or girl will ever know about for these were the old days of Australia, long before the white men had come to settle the country and destroy the bush with their axes. But there were no rabbits and no thistles, for Australia was free of them until the white men came. Gradually the daughters of Wonkawalla lost all fear. They were perfectly happy, and the bush no longer seemed lonely to them. They had enough to eat, they were warm at night and so strong and active and so skilled in the use of weapons had their woodland life made them that they did not seem to mind whether they met enemies or not. They often danced as they went on their way and made all the echoes of the forest ring with their songs. At last one day they found their way barred by a wide river which flowed from north to south. They could, of course, all swim, but it was not easy to see how to get their furs across. They were talking about it, wondering whether they could make a canoe or a raft, when they heard a friendly hail, and looking across they saw five girls standing on the opposite bank. "'Who are you?' shouted the strangers. "'We are the daughters of Wonkawalla,' they cried. "'Who are you?' "'We are girls of the Wapia tribe, out looking for adventures.' "'Why, so are we, and we have found many.' They shouted questions and answers backwards and forwards until they began to feel acquainted. What do you eat? What furs have you? What songs do you sing? That led to singing, and they sang all their favourite songs to each other, beating two boomerangs together as an accompaniment. When they had finished, they felt a great desire to travel together. It is really a great pity that the river flows between us, cried the daughters of Wonkawalla. How can we join you? The Wapia girls laughed. That is quite easy, they answered. This is a magic river, and when once your feet have touched it, you will be magic too. Dance straight across. You are making fun of us, cried Yilin. No, indeed we are not. We cannot cross to you, for on your side there is no magic. But if you will trust us and dance across, you will find that you will not sink. This was hard to believe, and the sisters looked at each other doubtfully. Then Yilin took off her rug and handed it to Pika. It will be easy enough to try, and at the worst I can only get a wetting, she said. Follow me if I do not sink. She went down to the water and danced out upon its surface. It did not yield beneath her. The surface seemed to swing and heave as though it were elastic, but it supported her and she danced across with long sliding steps. Behind her came her sisters, and so delightful was it to dance on the swinging river top that they burst into singing, and so came with music and laughter to the other side. The Wapia girls met them with open arms. Kai, you are brave enough to join us, they cried. 
Now we can all go in quest of adventure together, and who knows what wonderful things may befall us. So they told each other all their histories, and they held a feast, and after they had all eaten, they danced off to the east together, for they were all so happy that their feet refused to walk sedately. Presently they came to an open space, where were many tiny hillocks. This is Paridi Kadi, the place of ants, said the Wapia girls. Here we have often come before to gather ants' eggs. Dearly do we love ants' eggs, said little Pika, licking her lips. And these are very good eggs, said the eldest of the Wapia girls, whose name was Nulo. But the ants defend them well, and those who take them must make up their minds to be bitten. Ants' eggs are worth a few bites. Certainly they are. Now let us see if you are really as brave as you say. They attacked the hillocks with their digging sticks, and unearthed great stores of plump pegs, which they eagerly gathered. But they also unearthed numbers of huge ants of a glossy dark green colour, and these defended their eggs bravely, springing at the girls and biting them whenever they could. Kai, said Yilin, shaking one off her arm, it is as well that these eggs are so very good, for the bites are certainly very bad. We have no ants like this in our country. Have you had enough? asked Nulor, laughing. Enough bites, yes, but not enough eggs, said Yilin, laughing as well. The eggs are worth the pain. She thrust her digging stick into a hillock so energetically that she scattered earth and eggs and ants in all directions, and one ant landed on Nulor's nose and bit it severely, whereat Nulor uttered a startled yell of pain and the daughters of Wonkawalla laughed very much. Who is brave now? cried little Pika. Nulo rubbed her nose with a lump of wet earth, which, as she was black, did not have such a curious effect as it would have had on you. I was taken by surprise, she said somewhat shamefacedly, and indeed my nose is not used to such treatment, for I do not usually poke into ants' nests. They ate all the eggs and rubbed their bites with chewed leaves which soon took away the stings, and then they danced away together. After a time, Yilin saw an eagle flying low, carrying something in its talons. She flung a boomerang at it, and so well did she aim that she broke its neck, and the great bird came fluttering down. It fell into a pool of water, and Yilin jumped in to rescue its prey, for she could see that it was alive. It turned out to be a half-grown dingo, a fine young dog, which was too bewildered between flying and drowning to make any objection to being captured. Yilin secured it with a string which she plaited of her own hair, and as much of Pika's as Pika was willing to part with, and fed it with bits of wallaby. And the dog soon became friendly and licked her hand. He is a lovely dog, she said, and I will always keep him. I will call him Daldorana. I think he will be rather a nuisance, said Nulor. Anyway, he will soon leave you and go back into the bush. I do not think he will, Yilin said. Well, you cannot teach him to dance or sing, said Nulor, laughing, so he will have to run behind us. Of course he will, and he will be very useful in hunting, said Yilin. We should not have lost that possum yesterday if we had had a dog. Daldorana very soon made himself at home and became great friends with all the girls. It amused him very much when they danced, and though he could not dance himself, he used to caper wildly round them, uttering short, sharp barks of delight. But their singing he did not like at all, and when they began, he used to sit down with his nose pointing skywards, and howl most dismally, until the girls could not sing for laughing. Then they would pelt bits of stick at him until he was sorry. By degrees he learned to endure the singing in silence, but he never pretended to enjoy it. One day, as they went along, they saw in the far distance a silvery gleam. What is that? asked Yilin. It looks like the Dunchi, or silver bush, said the Wapia girls doubtfully. That does not grow in our country, said Yilin. Let us go and look at it. But when they drew near, they saw that it was not a bush at all. Instead, it was a man, a very old man. He had no hair on his head, but his great silver beard hung straggling to his knees, and when the breeze blew it about, it was so large that it was no wonder they had mistaken it for a bush. 
No word did he speak, but he sat and looked at them in silence, and when they greeted him respectfully, he only nodded. Something about him made them feel afraid. They clustered together, looking at him. At last he spoke. I have come too soon, he said. You are not ready for me yet. Go on. At that, Dulderano howled very dismally indeed, and rushed away with his tail between his legs. The girls quite understood how he felt, and they also ran away, never stopping until they were far from the strange old man. Now who was that? Yilling said. Nulo looked uneasy. I do not know, she said. This is a strange country, and there is much magic in it. We will hurry on, or he may perhaps come after us. So they hastened on into the forest, forgetting for a while to dance, but then their fear left them and again their songs rang through the bush. They passed a clump of black wattle, the trunks of which were covered with gum in great shining masses, so that they had a splendid feast, for the gum was both food and drink, and what they could not eat they mixed with water and drank, enjoying its sweet flavour. End of section 16《Section 17 of the Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. The Daughters of Wonkawalla, Part 2. With their bags filled with gum, they went on, and one evening they camped among a grove of banskia trees near a pool of quiet water. It was not very good water to drink, but the Wapia girls showed the five sisters how to suck it up through banksia cones, which drained out the impurities and gave it a very pleasant taste. They were tired and lay down early. In the night, a great wind sprang up, and with it came a curious booming noise. It woke the daughters of Wonkawalla, and they sat up in alarm. Kai, that must be a huge bittern, said Pika. It is not like a bittern, Yilin said. I have never heard any sound like it. Perhaps it is the bunyip, of whom our mother used to tell us when we were little, a terrible beast who lives in swamps, and whose voice fills every one with terror. The Wapia girls woke up, and they also listened. Then they laughed among themselves, but they did not let the sisters see that they were laughing. They seemed to think little of the noise. It is only the wind howling, they said. Lie down and sleep, you five inlanders. What do you mean by that? demanded Yulin. But the Wapia girls only giggled again and lay down, declaring that no bunyip was going to spoil their sleep. And as they were so cheerful, the sisters came to the conclusion that they might as well do the same. When they awoke, it was day, and the booming was still going on, and the wind felt fresh and wet. The Wapia girls were already up, and they greeted them with laughter. We have a surprise for you, said they. Shut your eyes and let us lead you. The sisters did so and felt themselves led forward. Presently the earth became soft and yielding under their feet and they cried out in alarm, but the others laughed again and said, Never mind, you are quite safe. In a moment more they said, Now, open your eyes. The sisters did so, and lo, they stood before a great sheet of water with high, tumbling waves. Blue and sparkling was the water, and the big waves came rolling in, gathering themselves up slowly, with their tops a mass of foam, which slowly rose and curled over it until it plunged down crashing in a smother of breaking bubbles. The daughters of Wonkawalla had never seen anything like it before, and they gasped in amazement. Kai, what a river! they cried. Where is the other side? The Wapia girls shouted with laughter. The other side! they gasped when they could speak. Why, there is no other side. This is the sea, and it is the end of all things. Have you never heard of it? Is that the sea? the five sisters stared. We have heard stories of it from the old men and women, but we never imagined that it was like this. No one could imagine it without seeing it. Have you known it before? Oh, yes, we have often camped here with our tribe. Come nearer. 
they took the sisters down to the edge of the water and presently a great wave rolled in broke in a thunderous roar and came dashing up the sand the sisters stared at it in amazed admiration at first and then as it came nearer fear fell upon them and they screamed and turned to fly they ran as fast as they could in the yielding sand but the wave came faster and the water caught them at first round their ankles and then swiftly mounting to their knees then it went back and the sisters thought that they were slipping back with it and screamed louder than ever the wapia girls themselves weak with laughter caught hold of them the sea screamed the sisters the sea is carrying us away the others led them up on higher sand and laughed at them until they began to laugh at themselves never before have i seen water that runs backwards and forwards as though a great giant were shaking it in a bowl said yillin we are sorry to have been afraid but it is all very peculiar and unexpected are you sure it is not magic i do not think any one can be sure of that about the sea said Mulon. it is strange water and indeed i often think that it is a very great magic indeed but if it is it is a good magic and we are not afraid of it and this queer yellow earth that slips away under the feet is that magic too oh the sand perhaps it is who knows but it will not hurt you come on let us bathe in the sea for that is one of the most beautiful things in the world the daughters of wonkawalla hung back at first for they were very doubtful of trusting themselves to the magic water but the others laughed and persuaded them and they ventured in paddling at first until they became used to the rushing breakers but soon they gained confidence and before long not even the wapia girls were bolder than they and they would dive into a breaker and be carried on its curling top laughing and playing like so many mermaids so that the wapia girls soon lost any feeling of superiority and only regained it once when pika feeling thirsty scooped up some of the passing wave in her cupped hands and took a deep draught for the next two minutes pika was coughing and spluttering and spitting while the other girls yelled with laughter that is certainly very bad magic said pika angrily when she could speak what has made the water turn bad that set the wapia girls off into fresh peals of mirth and it was some time before they could explain that the water was always salt pika was annoyed but presently she laughed too oh well if that is the worst of its magic there is not much to grumble at she said come on girls let us dive into this next one and the next moment pika's merry black face was half hidden in the flying spray as the breaker bore her ashore they stayed by the sea for some days for the inland girls were too fascinated to leave it and when they were not bathing in it they were wandering along the shore wildly excited over finding shells and seaweed and all the other treasures of the sands then one day a great black cloud came up obscuring all the sky and instead of being sparkling blue and silver the water turned into a dull grey and looked dead and oily the other girls were afraid of it and would not go into the cold dark breakers but yillin who loved bathing more than any of them would not be persuaded and plunged in for a swim she did not stay long for the water felt more and more uncomfortable each moment so she let a big sullen breaker carry her in and wading out ran up the beach to the other girls they started back when they saw her looking at her with amazement and fear what have you done to yourself cried nula i nothing what are you looking at nula pointed a shaking forefinger at her body and looking down yillin uttered a bewildered cry no longer was she smooth-skinned and black her body and legs were thickly covered with shining scales so that she gleamed like silver it is the water she stammered it must be does it feel pleasant inquired nula it looks quite beautiful i do not feel anything at all yillin answered but it certainly does look well she gazed at her shining self with interest and turned round so that the others might see if her back were similarly ornamented it was and the other girls grew a little jealous jump in and see if the magic will come upon you too cried yillin they did not lose a moment flinging their fur aprons from them they rushed down the beach and plunged into the dark waves 
and lo, when they emerged, they too were covered with silver scales. They stood together on the sand, a shining company. " Let us walk along the shore and see what else will befall us," said Yillin. They gathered up their property and set off eastwards again. The shore curved out after a time, forming a rocky cape. They rounded this and found themselves on the coast of a little bay, around which they hurried, anxious to explore some great rocks at the farther point. But when they reached them they found their way barred. The rocks were a solid wall, with a great black cliff that rose sheer from the water, running far out beyond even the farthest line of the breakers. Nowhere was there any way of advancing. The bay was ringed with the dark, smooth cliffs. The little dog, Dulderana, whimpered as if in fear. " Let us go back," said the Wapiya girls. " This is not a good place." For a moment the daughters of Wonkawala were inclined to agree. Then there came to them suddenly the vision of their father, who had said, "Go to the east," and they knew they must obey. " We are not afraid," they said. "Go you back, if you wish." " We do not wish to leave you," the Wapiya said sadly. " Nor do we wish to lose you, for we have loved you very much," said the sisters. " But we must go forward. Will you not come ?" The Wapiya girls shook their heads. " No," they said. " Something tells us that we must return and never see you more. But we will always watch for you, and perhaps one day we may hear you coming, singing our old songs, and we will run to meet you." They embraced each other, weeping, and slowly the Wapiya girls went back until the rocky promontory hid them from sight. Then Yillin dashed her tears away. " Come, my sisters," she cried. They took hands and danced together towards the wall of rock that loomed before them, black, unbroken, forbidding. Yillin was at the end, and as she reached the rock she raised her wona, or digging stick, and struck the rock. It split open, and they danced through the cleft. Before them was no more the sea, but a green country dotted with trees and covered with thick grass. A little way from them was a low mound, towards which they danced. As they drew near, they saw that someone was sitting on it, a very old man whose silver beard swept below his feet. He sat motionless, save that his hands were always busy, pulling the long silver hairs from his beard and twisting them into a cord. " It is the old man we met long ago," whispered the sisters. Somehow the fear that they had felt when they met him with the Wapiya girls was upon them no longer, and the little dog Dulderana, who had fled from him howling, now ran up to him gaily, frisking round him. The old man put out his hand and fondled him, and Dulderana snuggled against him. Then, nestling down with his head on his forepaws, he looked at Yillin as if to say, This is my master. Yillin understood the look in his eyes. Do you like him, master? she asked. We bring him to you as a gift. That is a good gift, said the old man, looking much pleased. And you are welcome, my children. I think that this time I have not met you too soon. Are you weary with all your wanderings? No, we are never weary, said Yillin. We have danced and hunted and bathed and sung, and we have forgotten all our sorrows. Our father, Wonkawala, bade us come east, and we obeyed him. And so you found friends and happiness, said the old man. Sit down and tell me of all that you have seen. They sat down in a semicircle before him, and speaking one after another, they told him the story of their long journey. He heard them in silence, nodding now and then, and all the time his fingers moved ceaselessly, plaiting the silver hairs into a long cord. It lay in great shining coils at his feet. The little dog nestled beside him, and sometimes when he paused to adjust the fresh coil, his fingers rested for a moment on its head. He smiled at the sisters when they had finished their story. It was indeed a great journey, and the sea has clothed you in silver so that you are more glorious than any chief's daughters have ever been before, he said. And now comes the greatest adventure of all. He rose as he spoke, pointing to the sky. The sisters looked up and cried out in awe, for as they looked the clouds parted and they saw behind them Arawatia, who lives in the sky a great and gentle being whose face seemed to have light behind it. He looked down at them kindly and beckoned. Then he began to lower a long cord, made, like that of the old man, of plaited hair. 
It reached almost to the top of the mound where they stood. " You are to go up," said the old man. " You first, I last of all. But first we will send up the little dog, that you may see how safe it is." He took his silver cord and tied it round the body of Dulderana, then joining it to the magic cord from the sky, he pulled it up so gently that the little dog never seemed frightened, and he disappeared behind a cloud. Presently the cord came back again, and one after another the old man tied the girls with it, and Arawotya drew them up to himself. Yillin was the last of the sisters to go, but as she was being pulled up she cut her hand with the digging stick, and her pirha, or food bowl, fell. It was a very beautiful carved pirha, and because it had been her father's, Yillin was very sad. Even when Arawotya had gently received her, and untying the cord placed her by her sisters, she peered over the edge of the cloud, trying to see where it had fallen. The old man was being drawn up, and just as he reached the clouds, Yilin caught sight of her Pirha lying on the mound. " See," she whispered to Pika, " my Pirha, it lies below. I will just slide down the cord and get it, for it belonged to our father, Wonkawala. Arawotya will forgive me and pull me up again." She slid hurriedly down the cord and joyfully seized the bowl. But when she turned to climb up again, she uttered a cry of despair, for the cord was out of her reach. Arawotya had drawn it up. As she looked, it disappeared, and then the cloud masses swept together, blotting out everything above. She was alone. All that day and night Yilin lay on the bound, weeping and begging Arawotya to forgive her and take her up to her sisters. But all the clouds had gone, and there was only a clear blue sky, bright with moonlight and dotted with a million stars, and there was no sign of those whom she had lost. She gave herself up to despair. Yakai, she moaned, better that I had remained a slave in the camp of Wonkawala than have come to this lonely land to die. Towards morning, exhausted, she fell into a troubled sleep, and in her sleep her father came to her, and his face was grave and kind. Alas, my daughter, he said, you have lost your chance of happiness for the sake of a worthless Pirha. What, did you imagine that you would need a Pirha in the sky? No, but because it was yours, my father, she sobbed in her sleep. Wonkawala's face shone with a great light. Always you were my dear and faithful daughter, he said. Because of that there is yet happiness for you. Go forward, and no matter what shall befall you, be of good courage. Then the vision faded, and after that Yilin sleep was no longer troubled. She woke refreshed in the morning, and although she was lonely for her sisters, there was hope in her heart. She took her weapons and went forward. It was a quiet country. There seemed no men and women in it, nor even any animals, and even the birds were strange to her. She passed over a great rocky plain, making for a great line of trees that seemed to mark the windings of a creek, for she was very thirsty. She found it, a clear wide stream, and drank deeply. Then she wandered along its bank. And here at length there was a touch of home, for there were many crimson parrots in the trees, and the noise of their harsh crying to each other was as music to her ears. They had their mates, and to see them made her feel less lonely. She found some roots and berries which she ate, hoping they were good for food, and when night came she curled into a hollow under a rock and slept deeply, waking refreshed, eager to go on her way. Then for many days she wandered, following the course of the creek, for she was afraid to go far from water. She was a strange figure in her silvery scales, Whenever she caught sight of herself mirrored in the water as she bent to drink, it gave her a new throb of amazement. She was wandering along one day when a rustling in the bushes made her glance aside. To her surprise, a dog was looking at her, and she could see that it was a tame one. Yilin had always loved dogs, and she whistled to this one, trying to coax it to play with her. But the dog was suspicious and backed away from her, growling. Then it uttered a few short barks and raced off into the scrub. Two black hunters who were ranging through the bush a little way off stopped hearing the barking. My dog has started game of some kind, said one. 
He does not bark for nothing. Let us go and look, said the other. They turned aside in the direction of the sound, and presently came upon the dog, who bounded to his master and licked his hand. What have you been barking for? demanded his master, patting him. The dog wagged his tail vigorously and ran a few paces into the bushes. I believe there is something in that direction, the hunter said. We might as well go and see, Chakaroo. They moved noiselessly through the scrub, and presently Chakaroo caught his friend's arm. See, Wonga, he whispered. There is a demon. Let us fly. Wonga looked and saw a strange, glittering figure standing by a tree. He was just as afraid as his friend, but he was also full of curiosity. It seems to be a woman demon, he whispered back. See, it has long hair, and the face is the face of a woman. He pondered, watching the strange apparition. And it carries weapons. Strange that a demon should go armed, Chakaroo. I should like to get hold of those weapons. They would be worth having in a fight. You may try if you like, but I have no fancy for fighting demons, said Chakaroo. I do not know that I have either, said Wonga. Perhaps, though, a woman demon would not be so terrible to fight. Look how she glitters when she moves. She would be a startling wife for a man to take home to his whirly, Chakaroo. Everyone to his fancy, returned his friend. Personally, I prefer mine black. You are used to yours, but I have none yet, said Wonga, laughing, for he was a cheerful youth. Come, I am going to get a nearer look at the demon. Are you afraid? Very much, but I suppose I had better come, said Chakaroo grumblingly. You are a mad-headed fellow, Wonga, and you will get into trouble if you do not take care. I only hope that this is not the sort of demon that the sorcerers tell us about who can blast men to cinders with a wave of the hand. He followed his friend, and they crept through the bushes until they found a place where they could see the strange being more closely. In their excitement they had forgotten the dog, and suddenly it gave a loud bark. The shining figure turned sharply and ran towards them. Save yourself, uttered Chakaroo. It has seen us. They turned to run, but in crossing a clear space, Chakaroo caught his foot in a trail of clematis and fell headlong, scattering his weapons. Wonga pulled himself up and raced back to help his friend. Before they could gather all the fallen spears, the strange being was upon them. Yilin was as astonished as the black hunters, and as afraid. But she had learned to defend herself, and so she flung her digging stick at Wonga. It grazed his leg and made him so angry that he forgot all about being afraid of this demon, and hurled his spears at her. But his fear returned when he saw them glance off her shining scales as though she were covered with glass, and then fall harmlessly to the ground. Chakaroo joined in the fight. But though the aim of both hunters was true, nothing seemed to pierce those magic scales. Moreover, the strange being, having lost her digging stick, picked up the fallen spears and flung them at their owners so rapidly that they thought themselves lucky in being able to dodge behind trees with whole skins. She is indeed a demon, gasped Chakaroo. She may be, but she is very like a woman, said Wonga, and I am not going home to tell the other warriors that a woman has stolen my spears, even if she does happen to be a demon. Besides, you know as well as I do that they will not believe us. Even your own wife will laugh at you and she will not believe. That is true enough, said Chakaroo gloomily. What are we to do? I will make you armour, said Wonga. Then we will go back, and when the demon throws the spears at you, they will stick in the armour, and I will rush in and secure them. I do not know that is much of a plan, but at least I have no better, said Chakaroo. Be quick, or the demon may come and find us unarmed. So Wonga broke off the young saplings, and lashed them round his friend with strips of twisted stringy bark fibre until nothing of him could be seen and he had great difficulty in moving then slowly and cautiously they made their way back to the open space where they had fought yillin was standing wearily by a tree with the spears in her hand she jumped round as they came and while she flung spear after spear at chakaroo wonga ran through the trees and came behind her his foot struck against her own digging stick, and he picked it up and rushed at her. The point caught in her shining scales and ripped them up as though they were paper. They fell in tatters about her. 
Do not kill me," she cried. " I am a chief's daughter." " A chief's daughter, are you ?" said Wonga. Suddenly his angry face grew soft with pity. " Why, I thought you were a demon," he said. " And lo ! you are only a poor, frightened little girl." So the wanderings of Yillin came to an end, and though she missed happiness with Arawotya in the sky, yet, as Wonkawala had said in her vision, she found it elsewhere, for Wonga took her home and married her, and his tribe treated her with honour because she was the daughter of a mighty chief. And later on Wonga became the chief of his own tribe, and she helped him to rule it in wisdom. Very often she was lonely for her four sisters, especially for little Pika, whom she had loved best of all. But she comforted herself by thinking that they were happy with Arawotya in the sky, and that some day she would find them again. Then together they would go at the last to Punjel, maker of men, and join their father Wonkawala. There were five stars in the southern sky that she liked to watch, for she grew to believe that they were her sisters, and that the tiniest of the five was her little dog, Veldorana. They are the stars of the Southern Cross, and it seemed to Yillin that they looked down on her and smiled. Otherwise Yillin was never lonely, for many children came to her and Wonga, and her wurley always seemed full of jolly black babies and wee lasses and lads. Yillin did not mind however many there were, especially as she did not have to worry about clothes for them. They grew into strong merry boys and girls who loved dancing and songs and laughter, just as she had always loved them. She used to tell them the story of her wanderings, and when she came to the part about the silver scales that had once covered her, they would pretend to hunt for them on her black skin, and would laugh very much because they could never find any. And Wonga would laugh too, and say, Ah, well, many men find their wives demons after they have married them. So I was lucky with only thinking that of mine beforehand, and then finding I have made a mistake. End of section 17section eighteen of the stone axe of berkamuk this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marian spiegel the stone axe of berkamuk by mary grant bruce the burning of the crows no one in the bush ever had a good word to say for the crows from the very earliest times they were a noisy, mischievous race, always poking their strong beaks into what did not concern them, and never so happy as when they were annoying other people. Whatever a mother crow taught her chickens, civility and good manners were not included in the lessons. They were accomplishments for which none of the family had the slightest use. It did not at all trouble the wokala, as the crows were called, that they were unpopular, Indeed, they rather gloried in the amount of ill-feeling they were able to excite among the bush folk. They were powerful birds, well able to hold their own in any quarrel with birds of their own size, and so quick and daring that they would even steal from animals, or attack weak ones, secure in the advantage given them by their strong wings. They made so many enemies, however, that they took to going about in flocks, so that no one dared molest them, not even Wildu, the eagle, or Kalalek the cockatoo. Especially did Wildu hate the Wokala. He was always proud, as the king of the birds has every right to be, and among all birds that fly his word was law. He tried to keep good order, and if any bird displeased him a few quiet words, possibly accompanied by a discreet peck, or a blow from one of his great wings, was more than enough to bring the offender to his senses. One day he had occasion to punish one of the Wokala, who had stolen the meal laboriously provided by the wife of wuk uk the mopoke for her husband who was ill the wokala battered and furious flew away and told his story to the other crows who equally furious flew in a mob to the high crag where wildu had his nest there was no one there for it was too late in the season to find chickens so the wokala amused themselves by scattering the nest to pieces and when Wildu and his wife came home from hunting, they hid among the bushes and screamed all sorts of insulting things at them. Wildu took no notice, openly. It would have been beneath his dignity to go hunting smaller birds in thick bushes, 
which the Wokala very well knew. He merely folded his wings and, with his wife, perched on the edge of the rocky shelf where his nest had been, and stared out across the tossing green sea of gum trees that clothed the rolling hills below, his yellow eyes full of silent anger. Gradually the Wokala grew tired of screaming, and, becoming hungry, flew away. After that the Wokala became more insolent than ever. Even Wildu was afraid of them, they said, and they kept together in a mob, and lost no chance of being rude to him. More and more they attacked and insulted the other birds, until no one felt safe if there were any chance of the evil Wokala coming near. Again and again complaints came to Wildu of their wicked doings, and Wildu heard them in silence, nodding his head, with his brain busy behind his yellow eyes but he said nothing, until at length the other birds began to ask themselves, was it really true that Wildu was afraid? Wildu was not at all afraid of a flock of squawking Wokala, but he was very much afraid of being made to look ridiculous. He had no intention of making a false step, and he did not quite know what to do. There was no one for him to talk to, for the eagle is a lonely bird, not like the chernip, the magpie lark, or tautani, the Comorant, with dozens and dozens of friends. He is a king, and therefore he is lonely, and, being naturally silent, he does not talk much, even to his wife. All by himself he had to think out the problem of what to do about the Wokala, and meanwhile the Wokala perched above his nest and insulted him, and dropped bits of stick down upon his rocky shelf, and screamed rude things at his wife, until she said crossly to Wildu, I cannot think why you do not make an end of those abominable little white birds. They are a disgrace to any decent kingdom, and you have not the spirit of a bandicoot. This annoyed and hurt Wildu, but he said nothing, only looked at her until she caught a gleam of the fire in the depths of his yellow eyes. Perhaps you did not know that in the very early times all the Wokala were white. They were the whitest of all the birds of the bush, without a single grey or coloured feather in all their bodies, so that there was a saying in the bush, as white as a wokala. They were very proud of it, too, and thought it quite a disgrace if one of their chickens showed a sign of being even creamy in colour, once he was nearly fledged. They kept themselves very clean, going often to bathe, and when they flew about in a flock their dazzling whiteness almost hurt the eye, while, if they perched in a dead gum-tree, they looked like big snowflakes against the grey branches. Even Kalalek, the cockatoo, was dingy compared to the gleaming whiteness of the Wokala. Somehow it seemed to make their bad behaviour worse, since no one would expect a beautiful bird like polished marble to have the manners of a jungle pig. Summer ended early that year, with a great thunderstorm followed by a month of wild wind and driving rain and all the birds were rather uncomfortable because the molting season was scarcely over. Most of all, the Wokala were annoyed. They liked their white feathers so much, and were so proud of their smart appearance, that they always delayed molting as long as ever they could, and now the bad weather caught them in a worse state than the other birds. When the rains ended, early frosts came and found the Wokala without any of their new feather cloaks ready. They used to huddle together among the thickest trees, shivering and untidy. In that part of the country there was a great black ironstone hill, treeless and forbidding. Few birds go there, for there is nowhere to perch, and but little food except the tiny rock lizards that sun themselves in the hot mornings. Wildu knew it well, for he often flew over it, and occasionally he was accustomed to stand on a shelf at the mouth of a cave near the top, a black hole in the hillside where no one but an eagle would willingly perch alone. He took refuge in the cave one morning during a fierce hailstorm, and it was there that an idea came to him. That night, as he came flying homewards, he brought in his great talons a bundle of dry sticks, and as he flapped his way over the black ironstone hill, he dropped down on the ledge and made a heap of his sticks on the floor of the cave. The next morning he did the same, and so it went on for many days, until he had a big pile of smooth sticks, something like a great nest. His wife came with him one evening, and was very much amused. "'Why have you taken to playing with sticks?' she asked, laughing. "'I never saw such a funny heap. Is it a game?' But Wildu only looked at her sourly, and said, 
be quiet woman after the manner of husbands and since she was more sensible than most wives she was quiet it was after his heap of sticks was ready that will do went to look for the wokala they had been far too uncomfortable lately to continue to be rude to him and in fact were keeping out of the way of every one so that he had some difficulty in finding them and might have given it up but for Cordella, the eagle hawk who remembered having seen them near a sheltered gully between two hills they are cold said Cordella, laughing oh so cold and so sorry for themselves there is no impudence left in them cold indeed must be the night that chills the impudence of the wokala said wildu it is going to be a very cold night said Cordella. already there is a sharp nip of frost in the air i think that some of the wokala will be dead before morning for none of them have their new feather cloaks nearly ready he chuckled well no one in the bush will mourn for them perhaps they will realize now that it does not pay to make enemies of every one the wokala will never learn a lesson answered wildu they are always satisfied with themselves and even though some may die the others will forget all about it once they have their shining white cloaks and can flock into the treetops again but possibly they may not be so lucky <laughs> who can tell he also chuckled looking as wise as an owl but when Cordella asked him what he meant he pretended to go to sleep and Cordella, who knew better than to pester an eagle with too many questions said good evening and sailed homeward across the treetops left to himself wildu waited until no bird was in sight and then flapped heavily away from his rocky shelf and dived downward to the gully it did not take him long to find the wokala they did not gleam with the whiteness of snow for they were molting and very shabby and a few were dressed mainly in pin feathers but their voices were just as harsh as ever and guided wildu to where they were huddling among the she oak trees already a cold wind was whistling down between the hills sighing and moaning in the she-oak branches there is no tree in all australia so mournful as the she-oak on a cold night when each long needle seems to sing a separate little song of woe already the miserable wokala were sorry that they had chosen to roost there suddenly great wings darkened the evening sky above them and looking up they saw wildu he perched on a limb of a dead gum tree far overhead and looked down at them laughing there seemed to the shivering wokala something very terrible in the sound of his laughter qua they whispered wildu has found us now he will be revenged they knew they could not fly swiftly enough to escape him and they began to creep downwards hoping to hide among the bracken fern that clothed the gully but wildu called to them and to their astonishment his voice sounded friendly oh wokala he cried are you very cold ay we are cold said the wokala as well as they could for their beaks were chattering with fear and shivering no wonder see how little you have on said wildu a pity you did not get your new white feather cloaks ready earlier instead of spending your time in annoying honest folk well perhaps you will have more sense next year doubtless we shall if we live said the oldest wokala but it seems likely that not many of us will live for we are nearly frozen already how distressing for you said wildu especially as it will be far colder before morning than it is now these gullies are the chilliest places in the bush on a frosty night the beaks of the wokala chattered anew we came for shelter said the old wokala miserably but you say truth wildu i think the frost spirit has his home down here is it any warmer where you are very little said wildu and the wind is singing through these branches but i know of a sheltered place for all that qua said the wokala altogether a sheltered place oh wildu you are great and 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 beautiful will you not tell us where it is great and beautiful am i said wildu with a chuckle that is not the sort of thing you have been calling me all these months however it is lucky for you that i am also good-natured i would not willingly see any of my people die of cold not even the wokala who deserve little of any one then you will tell us where is the sheltered place chattered the wokala fly across the black mountain said wildu 
there is an iron stone whirly near the top i will guide you to it if you like it is big enough for you all and there is a fine heap of sticks on which to perch the wind will not blow inside it and the morning sun will shine right into it it sounds too wonderful to be true said the bokala is it dry this iron stone whirly dry as old bones answered wildoo oh you would be in luck to get there you would forget all your troubles one would think that impossible shivered the old wakala for he was very sorry for himself but if you will really guide us there then be quick wildoo or none of us will be able to fly at all very well wildoo answered i will go slowly as i suppose you are all stiff follow me and come down when you see me perch he spread his great wings and looked down at them for a moment with a little smile and if they had not been so eager and so cold they might have hesitated at the expression in his yellow eyes but as usual the wokala thought only of themselves and as they had learned to believe that wildu was afraid of them they never suspected that he might be leading them into a trap they cried qua qua and rose into the air after him as soon as the flapping of the mighty wings told them that he had left the gum tree even to fly slowly was difficult so stiff with cold were they but they all persevered except one young hen a pretty young thing whose weary wings would not do their duty she made a brave attempt to rise but before the flight had cleared the big dead gum tree she had to drop back thankful to find a secure perch on a jutting limb kai she whimpered i can never fly all the way to the black mountain i must die here she crept along the limb until she came to the trunk and there luck awaited her in the fork was an old possum hole which had not been used for many seasons it was dry and warm sheltered from the bitter wind and soft underfoot with rotting leaves pleasant to the touch the young wokala hopped in thankfully and it seemed the last touch to her wonderful good fortune that she immediately met a fine fat grub she promptly ate it for her supper tucked her head under her wing nestled into the farthest corner and went to sleep remarking drowsily this is better than all wildoo's ironstone whirlies the other wokala did not notice that the young hen had dropped back or if they did they did not worry about her weary as they were it took all their strength to keep wildoo in sight even though he kept his word and flew slowly they were thankful when at length he sank lower and came to rest on a big boulder by the mouth of the cave near the mountain top the wokala followed him in a straggling line and perched on the shelf outside the cave there you are wildoo said nodding towards the yawning hole in the hillside that is your ironstone whirly and i promise you that you will find it dry and free from draughts there is nothing living there asked the old wokala looking a little doubtfully at the cave nothing at all and you will find there is a heap of dry sticks you can perch there and keep each other warm stay there if you like it well enough until your new feather cloaks are ready you are really scarcely fit for decent society now wildoo cast a half contemptuous glance at the shivering half-fledged birds as they clustered on the rocky shelf then he flew off again into the gathering darkness whatever is wildoo about asked kalalek the cockatoo of his hens he seems to be leading all the wakala round the sky a funny nurse he looked and with a funny lot of chickens no wonder he waited for dusk before he would be seen with them said one of his wives contemptuously i flew by their tree to-day and really they were a positive disgrace and they always think themselves so smart oh they'll be smart enough again said kellelek laughing wait till they have their new feathers on and you will be just as jealous of them as ever you were there is no doubt that the wakala are smart that is for people who prefer plain white I like a good sulphur crest myself, but then it's all a matter of opinion. Well, don't let the Wakala know that you admire them, or they will be worse than ever, said his wives, ruffling their feathers angrily. Meanwhile, the Wakala had hesitated for just a moment before entering the cave. Then a fresh blast of cold wind swept across the face of the mountain, and they waited no longer, but fluttered in before it, in a hurrying, jostling flock. It was just as Wildu had told them warm and dry and with a big heap of dry sticks in the middle just the thing for them to perch on 
They hopped up eagerly, huddling together for warmth, scrambling and fighting for the best places. Soon they were all comfortably settled, and at last warmth began to steal back into their shivering bodies. A good thing we made Will do afraid of us, said one sleepily. Otherwise we never should have known of this splendid whirly. The others uttered drowsy murmurs of, Qua, and they drifted into slumber. But far away on his mountain shelf Wildew sat and waited, his yellow eyes wide and wakeful. The dusk deepened into night, and far off, from his perch on a tall, stringy bark tree, old wook ook the Mopoke, sent out his long cry, Mopoke, Mopoke. Presently came a dim radiance in the east, and Wildew stirred a little. Pira comes, he muttered. Pira, the moon, came up slowly, until all the bush was flooded with her dim light, falling into shadow now and then, when dark clouds drifted across her face. Wildew waited until she was above the treetops, with her beams falling upon the ironstone mountain. Then he took a fire-stick in his talons, and flew swiftly away, never pausing until he alighted on the shelf before the cave. He laid the fire-stick down, and went softly to the dark opening, listening. There came only the sound of the breathing of the Wakala, with now and then a muffled caw as one dreamed, perhaps of cold and hunger. As his eyes grew accustomed to the light, Wildew could see them, a huddled white mass upon the heap of sticks. That was all he wanted. And he went back swiftly for his fire-stick, and with it went into the cave. Very softly he slipped it into the dry heart of the heap of sticks below the sleeping Wakala. He waited until little smoke breeze began to curl up, and a faint glow came from within the heap. "'Now you will be warm enough, my friends,' he muttered. He hurried out of the cave and flew slowly to the nearest tree, on the hill opposite the black mountain. There he perched and waited." Very soon all the dark mouth of the cave was filled with glowing radiance, and clouds of smoke came billowing out and rolled down the hill. Then came loud and terrified cawing, and Wildew thought he could see dark forms fluttering out through the smoke. His yellow eyes gleamed at the sight. And then clouds came suddenly across the face of the moon, and a fierce wind blew, with driving rain that beat into the mouth of the cave. It blotted out the glow, and the wind carried away the cries. When all was quiet, Wildew flapped off to his nest. He was back, the next morning, on the boulder outside the cave, and with him all the birds of the bush, whom he had collected as he came, saying to them, Come, and see what happens to those who insult Wildew. The black mouth of the ironstone cave looked grim and forbidding, and, peering in, the birds could see the charred ends of the dry sticks, scattered on the floor round a heap of ashes. Then from the inner recesses of the cave came a strange procession, and at the sight the kookaburra burst into a peal of laughter, for it was the wokala. They came slowly, but where were their white feathers of which they had been so proud? All were gone, singed off close to their bodies, and their bodies were blackened with smoke. Queer naked birds they looked, creeping out into the sunshine, and there was no pride left in them. They looked up and saw Wildew and the laughing birds of all the bush, and with a loud, miserable cawing they fled back into the cave. No one saw the Wakala again for a time, but after a long while they came out again, this time with all their feathers fully grown. No longer, however, were they white, the whitest of all birds. Their new feathers were a glossy black. They looked at each other for a moment with a kind of horror. Then they rose into the air with the swift beating of their jet-black wings, and, calling, Caw! Caw! they fled across the sky. And as they flew another cawing was heard, and a white bird rose and flew to meet them, the Wokala hen who had been left behind, and who had taken refuge in the possum-hole. She was now the only white Wokala left in all the world. They met in mid-air, and at the sight of the strange black birds with the familiar voices the white wakala uttered a scream and fled away, never to be seen again. Since then, always the crows have been black. They found their old impudence again after a while, and became what they had been when they were white, always the nuisance of the bush, vagabonds and robbers and bullies. 
but still the terror of the ironstone whirly is upon them and they never venture into caves but live in the big trees where they can see far and wide and where no creeping enemy can come upon them in the darkness and will do the king of the birds never finds them near his nest nor need he ever speak to them one glance from him is enough for the wokala they would fly to the deepest recesses of the bush rather than face the gleam of his yellow eyes end of section 18「Section 19 of The Stone Axe of Burkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. The Stone Axe of Burkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. Kerburu the Bear, Chapter One. Kerburu was a little black boy baby. His father and mother had no other children, and so they were very proud of him, and he always had enough to eat. It is often very different when there are many hungry pickaninnies to be fed, especially in dry seasons when roots and yams and berries are hard to find, and a black mother's task of filling her dilly bag becomes more difficult every day. Then it may happen that the children are quite often hungry, and their ribs show plainly through their black skins, and they learn to pick up all kinds of odd food that white children would consider horrible. Insects, grubs, and moths and queer fungi which may sometimes give them bad pains although it is not an easy thing to give a black child indigestion but kerburu had not known any hard times he was born a cheerful round baby quite light in colour at first and as he darkened he became rounder and jollier his hair curled in tight little rings all over his head and his nose was beautifully flat, so flat that his mother did not need to press it down to make him good-looking, as most of the black mothers do to their babies. He was very strong too, with a straight little back and well-muscled limbs, and when his teeth came, they would crunch up bones quite easily, or even the hard nardoo berries. His mother thought he was the most beautiful pickaninny that was ever born, which is an idea all mothers have about their babies. But Kerburu's mother knew that she was right. He had so many good things to eat that he grew fatter and fatter. His father brought home game, wallaby, wombat, iguana, lace lizards, porcupines, bandicoots, opossums. And though it was polite to give away a good deal to his wife's father, there were always plenty for little Kerburu. Then delicious bits of snake came his way, and long white tree grubs, as well as all the native fruits and berries that the black women find. And he had plenty of creek water to drink. So long as you give a wild black fellow good water, he will always manage to forage for food. Kuburu did not have to forage. It interested his father and mother tremendously to do all that they could for him and watch him grow. As soon as he could toddle about, his father made him tiny growing sticks and a boomerang and tried to teach him to throw them. And his mother, squatting in the shade of the whirly, would laugh to see the baby things struggling and the weapons of a man. And while she laughed, she was prouder than ever she used to rub his limbs to make them supple and strong. He did not wear any clothes at all, so that she was never worried about keeping his wardrobe in order. Instead, she was able to give all her time to making him into what she thought to be the best possible kind of boy. And however that may have been, it is quite certain that there was never a happier piccaninny. 
it was when koburu was nearly six years old that the evil spirit of trouble came to him sickness fell upon the tribe no one knew how it came and the medicine men could not drive it away first of all the people had terrible headaches and the mekigar or doctor used to treat them in the usual manner he would dig out a round sod of earth and make the patient lie down with his head in the hole would put the sod on his head and stand on it or sit on it to squeeze out the pain if this was not successful he would tie a cord tightly round the patient's head and cut him with a sharp shell or flint beating his head with a little stick to make the blood flow freely these excellent measures had in the past cured many severe headaches but they could not cure the sickness now so the mekigar and the patient carried out the camp the bearers carried him slowly singing a mournful chant and behind them came all the sick man's friends sweeping the ground with boughs to sweep away the bad power that had caused the disease this bad power was the mekigar said the work of a terrible thing called bori but whether it was bori's fault or whether the tribe had simply brought sickness on themselves by allowing the camp to become very dirty the mekigar could not drive away the sickness it grew worse and worse and people died every day kurbaru was only a little lad but he was unhappy and frightened although he did not understand at all the air was always full of sound of the groaning and crying of those people who were ill and of lamenting and mourning for the dead everybody was terribly afraid the blacks believed that their bad spirits were angry with them and that nothing could do them any good and so many died from sheer fright thinking that once they were taken ill they were doomed and that it was no good to make a fight against the mysterious enemy that was stupid but they did not know any better then there came a heavy rain and after it was over and the sun had come out to smile upon a fresh clean world the sickness began to get better and pass away but just at the last it came to the worldly where kurburu lived with his father and mother kurburu could not understand why his parents could not get up and go to find food they lay in the worldly together shivering under all the possum rugs and talking quickly in queer high voices that he could not make out at all they called often for water and he brought it to them in his little tanak or drinking vessel going backwards and forwards to the creek and up and down its banks until his little legs were very tired long after he was tired he kept on going for water then there came a time when they could not lift the tanuk and he tried to hold it to their lips so that they could drink but he was not very successful and much of the water was spilt you see he was only a very little afraid boy he woke up one morning cold and hungry there was no more food in the worldly and no voices only a great silence he crept under the possum rug to his father and mother but they were quite still and when he called to them they did not answer he rubbed their cold faces with a shaking little hand but no warmth came to them then he broke into loud frightened crying like any other lonely little boy presently some of the blacks came to the worldly and pointed at the quiet bodies under the possum rug and jabbered very hard beckoning to others to come kurburu heard them say tumble down a great many times and he knew that it meant dead but he did not know that his father and mother would never speak to him any more only when an old woman picked him up and carried him away he understood that a terrible thing had happened to him and he cried more bitterly than ever calling to his mother she had always run to him when he called but now she did not come end of kerberu the bear chapter 1
Section 20 of The Stone Axe of Burkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Cool Buru the Bear. Chapter 2 after that hard times came upon little kurburu there were none of his own family left for the sickness had taken them all his father and mother had been the last to die and that made the blacks think that very probably bori the evil spirit had been specially angry with kurburu's family because so many of them had died and the last terrible blow of the disease had fallen on their whirly indeed for a while they argued as to whether it would not be better to kill kurburu too so that so troublesome a family should be quite stamped out with no further chance of annoying bori and bringing trouble upon the tribe they did not spare him out of any idea of pity but because so many men and boys had died that the tribe had become seriously weakened and it seemed foolish to kill a strong and healthy fellow like Kurburu. It was very important for a tribe to keep up its fighting strength, for there was always a chance that another band of blacks might come upon them and want to fight, in which case the weaker tribe might be swallowed up. So boy babies were thought a good deal of, and for that reason the blacks did not make an end of little Kurburu but he had a very bad time for all that no one wanted him he was nobody's boy and that hurts just the same whether a boy be black or white never was there so lonely a little fellow the other children were half afraid of him because the fear of bori's anger yet hung about him they would not let him join in their games and took a savage delight in hunting him away from their whirlies Another black family had taken possession of his father's whirly, and no home was left to him. He used to wander about miserably, often sleeping in the open air, curled up in the shadow of a bush or in a hollow tree stump. If it were cold or wet, he would creep noiselessly into a hut when he thought everyone would be asleep, and quite often he was kicked out again he was always hungry now his father and mother had taken such care of him and had loved so much to keep him fed that he had never learned how to find food for himself he would wander about in the bush looking for such things as his mother had brought him for he knew so little that often he ate quite the wrong things which made him very sick he learned a good deal about food in that way but the learning was not pleasant work it was a bad year for food dry weather had come and game was scarce it was hard for the fighting men to bring home enough for their own children without having to provide for a hungry boy of six who belonged to nobody kurburu used to hang about the cooking places in the hope of having scraps of food thrown to him but not many came his way when so many were hungry, the food was quickly eaten up. Sometimes a woman, pitying the shrinking little lad, would hastily toss him a bone or a fragment of meat, and though you would not have cared for the way it was cooked, Kurburu thought that these morsels were the most delicious he had ever tasted. You see, a wild black fellow has not much to think about except food. He has no schools, no daily papers, no market days, or picture shows, or telephones. The wild bush is his, and all he asks or expects of it is that it shall supply him with food. He knows that it means strength to him, and that strength means happiness as a rule, when all that he has depends upon his own ability to keep it for himself. He does not reason things that way for the black fellow is simple but he just eats as much as he can whenever he can get it and that seems to agree with him excellently 
that was the principle on which Kurburu had been brought up and it had made him the round black shiny baby that he had been until his parents died he was not nearly so round and shiny now his little body was thin and hard and he did not look so strong as before it was not altogether lack of food that had weakened him the want of happiness had a great deal to do with it he had found out that the tribe did not like him not only was he nobody's boy but he was the object of a kind of distrust that he could feel without at all understanding it and he had learnt to shrink and cringe from blows and bitter words once he had found a lace lizard asleep on a rock and grasping his tiny waddy had stolen up to it very carefully all the instinct of the hunter blazing in his dark sad eyes the lizard when it woke was quick but kurburu was quicker the stick came down with all the force of his arm and he carried off his prey in triumph meaning to ask a woman who had sometimes been kind to him if she would cook it for him but just outside the camp three big boys had come upon him as he was carrying his prey and that had been the last that kurburu had seen of his lizard he had fought for it like a little tiger quite hopelessly of course but to fight had been a kind of dismal satisfaction to him even though he was badly beaten in addition to losing his dinner and that was specially unfortunate for blacks think lizard a very great delicacy indeed the boys ran off with it jeering at the sobbing little figure on the ground and they called him names that even in his angry soreness made him think they said something to do with an evil spirit he pondered over it and creeping into a clump of bushes why should they call him that blacks always want a reason for any happening sometimes they are satisfied with very foolish reasons but they must have something to explain occurrences especially if they are unpleasant ones the sickness that had fallen on their tribe they put down to bori as the medicine man told them but when the sickness had gone it seemed only reasonable to believe that bori was satisfied and would leave them alone for a while so they could not understand why misfortune should still pursue them another tribe had stolen part of their country and they had been too weakened by the sickness to fight for it and now had come the drought making food harder than ever to obtain and causing some of the babies to fall sick and die they turned to the magic pen or sorcerers for explanation and these clever people performed a great many extraordinary tricks to make things better then as they were really hard up for some object on which to throw the blame of their failure it occurred to them to turn suspicion towards little kurburu kurburu went on with his unhappy little life quite ignorant of the storms gathered round his woolly head no one was ever kind to him and he could scarcely distinguish one day from another although he gathered a vague idea that in some way they were linking his name to the evil spirit he did not understand what that meant he kept on hunting round for food and water and dodging blows and angry faces if he had guessed that the magic men were busily persuading the people that his family and he were the cause of the terrible year through which they had passed he might have been more uneasy but in any case he was only a very little boy and perhaps he would not have understood he had enough troubles to think of without looking out for more End of Cool Buru the Bear, Chapter Two. Section Twenty One of the Stone Axe of Burkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. Kurburu, the Bear, Chapter Three. Then the worst part of the drought happened, for the creek began to run dry. Day after day it ran a little more slowly, and the deep holes at the bends shrank and dwindled away. The fish disappeared completely, having swum downstream to where deeper waters awaited them, and so another source of food was lost to the tribe. There only remained the black mud eels, and soon it was hard to find any of these, try as they might. That was bad, but it was nothing in comparison to the loss of the water supply. Without the creek, the tribe could not exist for the only other drinking places in their country were swamps and morasses, and these too were dried up and useless. So the magic men and headmen became very anxious, and many were the black glances cast upon the unconscious Kurburu as he slunk round the camp or hunted for food in the scrub. Then the headman issued a command that no one should drink from the creek itself lest the little water remaining should be stirred up and made muddy or lest anyone should drink too much instead of going to the creek to drink they were permitted to fill the tarnuks or drinking vessels each morning and then no one was allowed to approach the creek again that day so in the mornings a long procession of women went down to the bank where a headman watched them fill the tarnuks, remaining until the last had hurried away, very much afraid of his fierce eyes. But the new law fell very heavily on Kurburu, for he had now no tarnuk. The little one made for him by his father long ago had disappeared when he lost everything, and since then he had always been accustomed to drink at the creek. Now, however, he could not do so, and no one would give him a tarnuk or let him drink from theirs. He would have stolen it very readily, for he was now not at all a well brought up little boy, but the tarnuks were hung far beyond his reach. Of course, the magic men knew how the new law would affect the little fellow. They knew that now it would be impossible for Kurburu to drink, and after a little he would tumble down and be dead. And then perhaps the evil spirit would be satisfied and go away from the tribe. They watched him carefully and were glad that he became weak and wretched. They had uttered such savage penalties against him drinking from the creek that it never occurred to them that he would dare to disobey. But sometimes in the darkness Kurburu used to creep down for a drink, being indeed as desperate as a boy can be, and quite sure that unless he went, he must die. And he had become so stealthy in his movements that he was never caught. It did not satisfy his thirst, of course, for it was the hottest part of the summer, and all the blacks were accustomed to drinking a great deal. Still, it was something. At least, it kept him alive. Then, one morning, came news of a number of kangaroo feeding two miles away by the creek and all the camp fell into a state of tremendous excitement at the very idea of a chance of food. All the men and big boys dashed off at once, and presently the women made up their minds that they would follow them, as it was not at all unlikely that if the men had good luck in their hunt, they might immediately sit down and eat a great portion of the game they had killed, in which case there was only a poor lookout for those left in camp. So they gathered up their dilly bags and sticks, slung their babies on their backs, and ran off into the bush after the men, leaving the camp deserted. Now it chanced that Kurburu knew nothing of all this. He had not spent the night in camp, because on the evening before he had been savagely beaten up by two big boys, who had caught him alone in the scrub, and when they had finished with him, he was too sick and sore to crawl back to the whirlies. He had crept under a bush and slept there uneasily, for the pain of his bruises kept waking him up. The sun was quite high in the sky before he made up his mind to go back to the camp, in the faint hope 
that some one would give him food so he limped slowly through the bush wincing when the harsh boughs rubbed against his sore limbs he stopped at the edge of the camp and rubbed his fists into his eyes blinking in surprise no one was in sight instead of the hum and bustle of the camp the men sitting about carving their spears and throwing sticks the women clattering around the whirlies the babies rolling on the ground and playing with the dogs there was only desolation and silence he approached one hut after another and poked in a timid head but he saw no one and the stillness seemed almost terrible to him then in a corner of one whirly he saw a rush basket and from it came a smell that would have been disgusting to anyone but a black but was pure delight to kuburu his fear vanished as he seized upon the food and ate it ravenously he came out presently his thin little body not nearly so hollow as before and looked about him the food had made him feel better but he was terribly thirsty and then he saw with a little glad shout that all about the camp were drinking vessels brimming with water put down wherever their owners had happened to be when they had rushed away to the hunt kurburu did not know anything about that of course he only knew that there was water enough to make him forget that he had ever been thirsty he ran eagerly to the nearest tarnuk and drank drank until he could drink no more and with that drink so the blacks say a great change came upon little kurburu kurburu put down the tarnuk and stood upright throwing his head back in sheer bodily happiness at once more having had enough to eat and drink all his bruises and soreness had suddenly gone he was no longer tired and lonely and unhappy but strong and well and glad how wonderfully strong he felt a new feeling ran through all his body i am stronger than anybody ever was before he said aloud and he believed that it was true he glanced round the deserted camp it was quiet now but he felt sure that soon the blacks would come hurrying back perhaps they would be there in a moment kurburu listened half dreading to hear the quick pad pad of bare feet over the hard baked ground no sound came but he knew that they would return and then what would await him his new strength seemed to burn him he stretched his arms out wondering at their hard muscles although he felt that the drink had been magic and so he need not wonder at anything at all some good spirit perhaps sorry for lonely little boys had evidently come to help him fear suddenly left him altogether and with its going came a mighty desire for revenge he did not know what he was going to do but the new power that was in him urged him on a little tree grew in front of him he began to gather up all the drinking vessels and one by one to hang them upon the boughs there were very many and it took a long time but at last the task was completed and not a tarnuk was left in the camp he looked in the whirlies and found many empty vessels and these also he hung up in the tree then he took the biggest tarnuk of all and a little tarnuk and went down to the creek and with the little tarnuk he filled the big one dipping up all the water from the creek until there was none left there was much water yet still the big tarnuk held it all and only the mud of the creek bed remained where the stream had been rippling past even as he looked that grew dry and hard then kurburu turned and carried his burden up the bank to his tree and from the big tarnuk he filled all the empty ones they held a great deal and yet the big tarnuk remained quite full for now there was magic in everything that kurburu touched he climbed up into the little tree and seated himself comfortably in a fork where he could see everything and yet lean back comfortably a quiver ran through the tree as if something far underground had shaken it and suddenly it began to grow it grew and grew spreading wide arms to the sky 
until it was as large as very many big trees all put together and its trunk was tall and straight and very smooth all the time kurburu sat in the fork and smiled when the tree had finished growing he heard a sound of voices far below him and looking down he saw the tribe hurrying back through the scrub to their camp their hunt had been unsuccessful for all the kangaroo had got away into the country of another tribe where they dared not follow so they were returning hungry and thirsty and in a very bad temper for they had not found any water in the places where they had been they came angrily back to the camp and from his seat in the fork of the great tree kurburu looked down at them and smiled the blacks were far too thirsty to look up at any tree they hurried to the whirlies then the first said where is my tanuk and another said wah my tanuk has gone and a third who has taken all our tanuks they became very angry and beat their wives because they could find no drinking vessels and no water then becoming desperate because of their thirst they hurried to the creek and lo the creek was dry they came back from the creek jabbering and afraid believing that the evil spirits had done this wonderful thing presently one saw the big tree and cried out in astonishment kai what tree is that he exclaimed they gathered round staring in amazement at the huge tree and so they saw all their tanuks hanging in its branches and little kurburu sitting smiling in the fork wah is that you they called have you any water yes here am i and i have plenty of water said kurburu but i will not give you one drop because you would give me none although i died of thirst some threatened him and some begged of him and the women and children wailed round the base of the tree but kurburu smiled down at them and took no heed of all their anger and their crying then a couple of young men took their tomahawks of stone and began to climb the tree although they were afraid because it was so big still thirst drove them and so they came up the tree cutting notches for their fingers and toes in the smooth trunk and coming wonderfully quickly but kurburu laughed and let fall a little water on them from a tanuk and as soon as the water touched them they fell to the ground and were killed again and again other men tried to climb the tree becoming desperate with their own thirst and the crying of women and children but always they met the same fate always kurburu smiled and splashed a few drops of water upon them only a drop on each of them but as the drops touched them their hold loosened the grip of their toes relaxed and they fell from the great height to meet their death on the ground below so it went on until nearly all the men of the tribe were gone and kurburu sat in the fork of the tree and smiled and it still went on all through the moonlit night but in the dawn two men came back from hunting tajer and tanin the sons of panjal maker of men they were very cunning as well as being very brave and after they had taken counsel together they began to climb the tree but they did not climb as the other men had done straight up the long line of the smooth trunk instead they climbed round and round as the clematis creeps when it throws its tendrils about a branch kurburu laughed just as he had laughed at the others and waited until they had ascended to a great height then he took water and let it fall but the men were no longer in the same place but on the other side climbing round and round and he missed them again and again he ran to get more and poured it down they were very quick circling about the trunk and always managed to escape the falling drops they came to the place where the trunk forked and swung themselves into the high boughs then little kurburu began to cry in a terrified voice but they seized him not heeding and beat him until all his bones were broken and then threw him down the other blacks uttered a great shout of triumph and ran to kill him but the magic that had helped him came to the aid of little kurburu once more 
and so he did not die suddenly just as the angry blacks were upon him with uplifted waddies and threatening faces he changed under their gaze and where there had been a little black boy there lay for a moment a native bear his grey fur bristling and fear filling his soft eyes then very swiftly he gathered himself and ran up a tree until he was out of sight among the branches just then the blacks were too thirsty to pursue him overhead tarjer and tan min were cutting at the branches of the great tree that held the tanuks and all the water came out and flowed back to the creek and again the creek became wide and clear running swiftly in its bed so that there was drink for all then tarjer and tan min came down to the ground and the tribe hailed them as heroes but when they looked for little kurburu the native bear he had fled into another tree and had disappeared from that time the native bears became food for the black people but it is law that they must not break their bones when they kill them nor must they take off their skin before they cook them so they take them carefully hitting them on the head and they cook them by roasting them whole in an oven of stones sunk in the ground if the law were broken kurburu would again become powerful the magic men say and the first thing he would do would be to dry up all the creeks now kurburu lives near the creeks and water holes so that if the people broke the law he might at once carry away the water he is not very wise because he was only quite a little boy before he became a native bear and so had not much time to gain wisdom but he is soft and fat and gentle unless you interfere with him when he wants to climb a tree and then he can scratch very hard with his sharp claws all he can do is to climb and he does not see very well in the daytime therefore he thinks that whatever he meets is a tree and at once he tries to climb it if the blacks throw things at him when he is sitting in the fork of a tree he blinks down at them and sometimes you might think he smiles but if they climb his tree and come near to knock him down he cries always very terribly just as he cried long ago when he was magic and tajer and tanin climbed his great tree and threw him to the people far below end of kurburu chapter 3section 22 of the stone axe of berkemuk this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the stone axe of berkemuk by mary grant bruce wurip the firebringer chapter 1 once there was a time when the blacks had no fire they had not learned the way to make it by rubbing two sticks together or if they had once known the way they had forgotten it and they were very miserable for it was often cold and wintry and they had no fire to warm them nor any way of cooking food fire had been theirs once but there came two women upon the earth strange women speaking in unknown tongues with great eyes in which there was no fear they did not love the blacks they lived in their camps for a time and built for themselves a whirly coming and going as they pleased but always there was hatred in their wild eyes and the blacks feared them exceedingly because they feared them although they hated them they gave them food and the women cooked it for themselves for at that time the fire blossomed at the door of every hut but one day the blacks awoke to find the women gone they had gone in the night silently and with them they took all the fire that the blacks had there was not even a coal left to start the hearth-blaze for the shivering people 
the fighting men made haste to arm themselves and started in pursuit of the women they travelled through swamps and morasses across boggy lands and creeks fringed with reeds and sedges all the time seeing nothing of the women but knowing that they were on the right track by the faint smell of fire that still hung in the air they have gone this way carrying fire they said soon we shall overtake them and they pressed on going faster and faster as the smell of burning wood became stronger and stronger at last they came out upon a little open space and looking across it they saw a new whirly made of bushes interlaced with reeds in front of it smoke curled up lazily and they caught the gleam of red coals and yellow flame the two women sat by the fire motionless the fighting men broke into a run shouting now we will make an end of these women they cried fiercely to each other as they ran gripping their spears and throwing sticks the women sat by the fire taking no heed so little did they seem to notice the running warriors that it seemed that they did not see them or if they did see them they cared no more than for a line of black swans flying westward into the sunset one stirred the fire gently and laid across the red embers a dried stick of she oak the other weaved a mat of rushes in a curious device of green and white and as she twisted them in and out she smiled even when the long shout of the fighting men sent its echoes rolling round the sky they did not look up the glow of the flames shone reflected deep in their eyes so the fighting men came on grim and relentless burning with the anger of all their long chase and the hot desire for revenge they tightened their grip on their wadis since there was nothing to be gained by risking a throwing stick or a spear when the enemy to be slain was only two women weak and unarmed for such defenceless creatures a blow with a wadi would be sufficient but half a spears cast from the whirly something they could not see brought them to a sudden gasping halt it was as though a wall were there soft and invisible but yet a wall they could not touch it to climb over it neither could they force their way through they struck at it and it was as if their sticks struck the empty air there was nothing to see but the whirly and the fire and the quiet women and the air was clear and bright but no step farther could they advance they circled around the camp trying at every step to get nearer to the whirly it was all to no purpose always the wall met them though they could not see it so they came back to the point whence they had started breathless angry and a little afraid they were brave men and used to battle but it is easier to fight a visible enemy than one that lurks unseen in the air it was magic and they knew it still their anger burned furiously within them and one lifted a spear tipped with poison bone and flung it at the women to see him lift his hand was enough for the band a storm of spears went hurtling through the air for a few yards the spears flew straight and true but then they stopped suddenly in mid-flight as though an unseen wall had met them for a moment they seemed to hang in the air then they fell in a jangling heap among the tussocks and beyond them while the terrified warriors shrank together gesticulating and trembling the women laid more sticks upon the fire and smiled the fighting men were cunning and they did not give in easily 
Not only were they smarting with the fury of defeat, but the tale was not one they wished to carry back to the tribe, lest they should become a laughing stock even to the women and young boys. So they drew off thinking under cover of night to renew the attack in the hope that when the women slept their magic would also sleep so when darkness had fallen they crept up again on noiseless feet but the invisible wall was there and they could find no gap in its circle while all the time the fire burned redly before the whirly and the women sat by it feeding it and weaving their mats of white and green at length the warriors became weak for want of food and weary of the useless struggle and so they gave up the fight and slowly made their way back across swampland and morass to the tribe that waited for them shivering and fireless in the shadow of the hills great and bitter were the lamentations at the news of their defeat they had been eagerly watched for, and when they came slowly back to the camp, trailing their spears, a long cry of angry disappointment rent the air. It was difficult to believe their story. Who could imagine a wall strong enough to stop warriors, yet that could not be seen? So they found themselves coldly looked upon and their wives said unpleasant things to them in their whirlies that night quite a number of wives had sore heads next morning since it was easier to deal with a talkative wife by means of a wadi than by argument but the wives had the last word for all that and the small boys of the tribe used to call jeering words at the disgraced warriors from the safe concealment of a clump of dogwood or fern meanwhile there was no cooked food the tribe was very far from being happy then a band of young men who were not picked warriors but were anxious to distinguish themselves made up their minds that they would go forth to find the fire women and slay them and bring back fire to the tribe they were very young men and so they were confident that they could succeed where the warriors had failed and for at least a week before they started they went about the camp telling every one how they meant to do it when they were not doing this or singing songs about the great deeds they meant to perform and very queer songs they were they were polishing their weapons and making new ones and talking together at a great rate of their secret plans when they were ready at last they painted themselves with as much pipe clay as they were allowed to use and gathered together to start when we have killed the fire women they said to the tribe some of us will turn homewards and wait here and there along the way then the others will run with the fire stick and as they grow tired those that have gone ahead will take it and run very swiftly back to you in three days the tribe will be cooking food with the fire which we shall bring then we shall get married and have whirlies and fires of our own all the blacks listened gravely except the fighting men who had not brought back anything at all these men laughed a little but no one took any notice of their laughter because they had failed and it is the way of the world not to think well of failures the girls thought the band of young warriors wonderfully noble and smiled upon them a great deal as they marched out of the camp of course the boys were much too proud to smile back again but then the girls did not expect them to and were quite content to do all the smiling so the little band marched off with a great flourish and the bush swallowed them up may they come back soon said one girl as she and her companions dug for yams next day ay said the others we are weary of eating things which are not cooked i am weary of being cold said one there is but one possum rug in our whirly and my father takes it always there will be great feasting and joy when they bring fire back said another perhaps some of us will be married too 
and they laughed and made fun of each other after the fashion of girls of any color. But the three days had not passed when the young men returned, and when they came they sneaked back quietly into the camp and tried to look as if they had not gone at all. They had washed the pipe clay from their bodies and were all quite anxious to work very hard and make themselves exceedingly useful to the older men, nor were they at all anxious to talk. They gave severe blows to the young boys who clustered round them, clamoring for news, and told them to go and play. But when they were summoned before the leaders, they hung their heads and told the same story as the warriors. They had seen the fire women, they said, and they still sat before their whirly and fed the fire. But the young men could not come near them, nor could any of their weapons reach them. And when they were wearied with much throwing, and their arms had grown stiff and sore, a great fear came suddenly upon them, and they turned and fled homeward through the scrub, never stopping until they came upon the huts they knew. Now they were very much ashamed, and the girls mocked at them, but the warriors shook their heads understandingly. "'To fight is no good,' they said unless the magic men can tell us how to beat down the magic wall and conquer the firewomen the tribe will go forever without fire we are wonderfully brave but we cannot fight witchcraft let the magic men undertake the task for indeed it is a thing beyond the power of simple men but is it not for such matters that we keep the magic men then all the tribe said, Yes, that is what we have been thinking all along, and they looked expectantly at the magic men, demanding that they should at once accomplish the business without any further trouble. Every one became quite pleased and hopeful, except the magic men themselves, and they were in a very bad temper, because they did not like the task. Still, they held their heads high and made little of the matter, because to do anything else would have been imprudent, and they looked as wise as possible, a thing they had trained themselves to do, whether they knew anything about a matter or not. All kinds of wise men can do this, and it is a very handy habit, because it makes people think them even wiser than they are. They went away by themselves with dreadful threats of what might happen if the people came near them. Not that there was any need for them to take such precautions, for the blacks were much too terrified by them to venture near when they were working any kind of magic. A great deal of what the blacks called magic would seem very stupid to you if you watched it now. But they all believed in it firmly, and even those who knew that they deceived others still thought that magic was a real thing, and that it could be practiced upon them. The magic men shut themselves up for a time, and then they told the men that they had made themselves into crows, and had flown over to watch what the firewomen were doing as all the tribe believed that they could turn themselves into any animal they chose and be invisible nobody thought of doubting this the magic men then began to weave spells they chopped the branches from a young she-oak tree and cleared away grass and sticks in a circle round it then they sharpened the end of the trunk and drew on the ground the figure of a woman with the lopped tree growing out of her chest Afterwards they rubbed themselves all over with charcoal and grease, and danced and sang songs round the tree for some days, expecting the firewomen to feel their magic, so that they would have to rise from their camp and walk as if in a sleep to the place of the dance. But the women did not come, and so the magic men told themselves that they were not yet strong enough. Meanwhile the tribe clustered some distance off, very frightened and respectful, and also very cold. The magic men tried other plans, although they were much hampered because many of their spells needed the use of fire, and there was none to be had. They tried to kill the women by pointing magic things in the direction of their camp, 
such as bones and pieces of quartz crystal, which were believed to be very deadly. And, going to their old whirly, they put sharp fragments of bone in any footprints they could find, thinking that the women would fall ill and become very lame and so lose their power. But nothing happened. So they sent one of their number secretly through the bush, and he returned to tell them that the women were well and unharmed, and that the invisible wall about their camp was just as strong as ever. Then the magic men knew that they could do no more. They told the people that the only spells that would conquer the fire women were spells in which fire formed a part, and until they could bring them fire they must not expect to be freed from the power of the women. The tribe did not like this, and much lamentation went up, but they were much too afraid of the magic men to object openly to anything they did. End of section 22 of The Stone Axe of Berkamuk Section 23 of The Stone Axe of Berkamuk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamuk by Mary Grant Bruce. Section 23. At this time there lived in the tribe a man called Wurip. He was not a lucky man. Once in a big tribal fight most of his relations had been killed, and when he was still quite a young man his wife died of a mysterious sickness before they had been married very long. Then one night he tripped and fell into a big fire, burning himself terribly. He got better, but his left arm and hand were quite twisted and withered, and were of very little use to him. Had he been a different kind of man, it is not unlikely that he would have been killed by the tribe, for the blacks had no use for maimed or deformed persons. But Wurip was strong apart from his twisted arm and also he had a way of muttering to himself that rather frightened people. It was only a habit, but the blacks were always afraid of what they could not understand, so they left him alone. He lived in a little whirly by himself, and though he was lonely and would have liked to take another wife, he knew that no girl would want a man whose arm and hand were not like those of other men. So he did not try to get married, and gradually he became very solitary. He thought the other men disliked him, and he would go away by himself on hunting expeditions, and wander through the scrub alone. Although he was half a cripple, he soon learned to know the bush more thoroughly than any man in the tribe, and he trained his shriveled arm to do a great deal, although at first it had seemed that it must be useless forever. The other blacks at first gave him nicknames about his arm, but he did not like them, and his eyes were so fierce that they did not let him hear them any more and to his face only called him by his own name, Wurip, which means a little bird. Now Wurip loved his tribe. He had no special friends in it, which was partly his own fault, for he had grown very unsociable, but he was proud of the tribe itself, because it was brave and owned good country, and had been successful in many fights. It made him sore at heart to see it suffering from the want of fire, and also it hurt his pride that it should have been beaten by women. So he made up his mind that he would try to recover fire from the wicked fire women. He thought about it for a long time, and laid his plans very carefully. One day he left the camp carrying no weapons but only a single wadi. The other blacks said to him, Where are you going? Wurip said, I go to try to get fire back. 
You, they said, a little man and crippled. That is very funny. And all the people laughed at him. Wurip hesitated, and a gleam came into his eyes so quick and fierce that those who had laughed shrank back. Then he turned on his heel and walked off into the scrub, and the black said, Let him go, he is mad, and he will most likely be killed, and it really does not matter, he is not much use. Into the wild bush Wurrup went, taking short, noiseless strides. He was a little man, but he had the quick movements of many little men, and at all times he could move rapidly through the bush, scarcely making a sound as he went. He passed through the scrub, and came to boggy lands and morasses. His light feet carried him over swamps and across creeks fringed with reeds and sedges. Then he saw a light curl of smoke going lazily skywards, and at the sight his heart gave a leap, for it was long since he had seen fire. Until then he had travelled very quickly, but now he slackened his speed and went slowly across the plain towards the firewomen's camp. As he drew near he could see them, sitting in front of the whirly and weaving their rushes. They did not look up as he came and he advanced so near them that he began to think that the magic wall could be there no longer. Just as he was wondering if this were indeed true, one of the firewomen glanced up and saw him, and almost immediately Wurrup felt some invisible object blocking his way, and knew he could go no farther. He stopped and burst out laughing, and at the sound of his merriment the other firewoman glanced up sharply from her weaving, and the first one paused with a stick of she-oak wood in her hand and looked at him in blank astonishment. So silent was the place that Wurip's shout of laughter echoed like a thunderclap. The firewomen looked at the little black figure standing among the harsh tussocks of swamp grass and he waved to them with his withered arm. But they took no further notice, going on scornfully with their work. Wurip had expected nothing else, and he was not discouraged. He began collecting sticks and brushwood for a whirly, singing as he went about his work, in full view of the two women. He made no further attempt to get through the invisible wall. There was not much timber about, and to find suitable material for his whirly was a difficult task. He walked slowly, using his crippled arm very little, because he hoped that the women would be less careful about him if they regarded him as a one-armed man. Sometimes he felt that they were looking at him, and then he would work with particular awkwardness. Always, however, he sang, and went about with a merry countenance, as if he had not a single care in the world. He built his whirly, and went off into the swamp to hunt, returning with some lizards and grubs, and a duck that he had caught just as it settled on a sedgy pool. Standing a little way back from the wall, he called out, and threw the duck towards the file where the women sat, but it fell before it reached them, meeting the unseen obstacle. "'What a pity it is for you!' called Wurip, slowly, so that they could hear easily. "'It is a fat duck!' And saying this he laughed again, and went into his whirly, where he ate his supper contentedly, although it was not cooked, and went to sleep. In the morning the women were sitting as before, but the duck had gone, and, looking closely across the little space, Wurip saw that there were feathers lying about near their fire. Also there was a pleasant smell of cooking in the air. This gladdened his heart, for it showed that the women did not mind making him useful, and that was exactly what he wanted. 
So the days went by, and Wurip lived in his whirly and the women in theirs. He never saw them away from it. Neither did he try any more to go near it. From time to time he made them friendly signals or called cheerful greetings to them, but that was all. Each day he went hunting, and good luck always attended him, because it was the time when waterfowl are plentiful, and as no others hunted there the birds were not afraid. It was quite easy to fill the bag he had made out of rushes, and each evening he put the best of the game on a big stone some distance from his whirly, and in the morning it was always gone. This went on for fourteen days. When he was not hunting, Wurip lay about his camp, always singing contentedly, as he carved himself boomerangs or whittled heads for throwing spears that he never used. Once he carved a bowl from a root that he found, and this also he put on the stone, for the firewomen, and they took it. He gathered bundles of the rushes that women of the tribes use in weaving, and left them too so that he became very useful to them, although he had never heard their voices. Then, after fourteen days, Wurip pretended that he had fallen sick. He did not go out hunting any more, neither did he place offerings upon the big stone. In his whirly he had hidden sufficient food for himself to last him for several days, but he did not let the firewomen see him eating. Instead he crawled out, dragging himself along the ground, and cried out sorrowfully, waving his withered arm to them. He crawled back into his whirly, and ate, and slept. But they did not come, as he had hoped they would. Next day he did not go out into the open at all. He kept close within his whirly, and all the exercise he took was to groan very mournfully. He groaned nearly all day, and by the time it was evening he was more tired than if he had hunted for three days. Because he was tired he ate nearly all that remained of his food, after which he felt discouraged, for he realized that it would soon be necessary to go out hunting again and he wanted to seem ill. So he groaned more loudly than ever, and once or twice cried out, as if in pain. Then he fell asleep. The firewomen were fierce creatures, but still they were women. It troubled them that this crippled little black fellow should be ill, too ill to bring them gifts, or to busy himself singing and laughing about his camp to sit over a fire and weave mats of white and green may, in time, become dull. And it cheered the women to see Wurip and listen to his songs. When he did not appear, they took counsel together, agreeing that so small a fellow with a withered arm could not be dangerous. So in the morning Wurip heard steps, and opening his eyes he saw one of the women entering his whirly. He almost jumped up. Then, remembering, he groaned heavily and looked at her with a stupid stare. She spoke to him, asking what was the matter, but he only moaned in answer. So she picked him up. It was not difficult, for she was very powerful, and Wurip was quite light, and carried him over to where her sister sat. There seemed to be no invisible wall now. The firewoman walked to the fire and put Wurip down before it. He nearly shouted. It was so long since he had been near a fire. But luckily he remembered to turn the shout into a groan. For some days Wurip pretended to be very ill, and the firewomen nursed him, not in the harsh fashion of the medicine men, but in gentler manner, feeding him and giving him a comfortable bed to lie on. Wurip was only too glad to lie still and be fed, 
and it was not hard for him to pretend to be ill, because being black he was not required to look pale. Moreover, to taste cooked food once more nearly made him weep with joy. He was very grateful to the firewomen, and told them that he was an outcast from the tribe, because of his crippled arm, and he begged that when he grew better they would allow him to serve them. The firewomen were not sorry to have a servant. Getting food and firewood was not very entertaining for them, and the gathering of rushes was a long and laborious task, which they hated. There could, they thought, be no risk in taking so harmless a person as Wu Rip to work for them. Still, they were stern with him. They told him that when he was well he must live in his own whirly, and only come near theirs when it was necessary. Also, they assured him that if he were unfaithful to them, their magic would strike him dead immediately. This made Wu Rip think very hard for he did not want to meet such an unpleasant fate, although he was quite determined to take fire back to his tribe. He showed great horror at the idea of being unfaithful, and when he thought it was prudent to get better, he recovered his strength, not too quickly, for it was very pleasant to be nursed, and then began his duties. The firewomen found him an excellent servant. He was always at hand when he was wanted, and he did his work well. There was plenty of food at all times, and very long fine rushes that he found when he was hunting far from the camp. Wood he brought also, but the firewomen would never allow him to go near the fire. He laid the sticks at a little distance away, and they tended the fire and cooked the food, giving him a share. Altogether they were very happy and comfortable, and if he had been able to forget the shivering tribe, Wu Rip would have been content. Although he was only a servant, he was less lonely than he had been in the company of the other blacks. The firewomen were stern with him, but they never made him remember that his arm was crippled, and when he had been with the tribe he could not forget for an instant that he was different to the others. Sometimes in the evenings as he lay in his whirly the thought came to him that it would be better to forget the tribe and stay with the firewomen. After all, they were good to him in their fierce fashion, and he remembered that he had very little to look forward to in returning to the big camp. Even if he took back the long-lost fire, they might be grateful to him for a little while, but he would never be as the other men were. And then memory would come to him, bringing back pictures of the tribe half-starved and shivering, of the little children who were dying for want of proper food and warmth, and of the cold hearthstones of his people. However they might treat him, he could not forget that they were his own people. He knew that he must go back to them. End of section 23 Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Section 24 of The Stone Axe of Berkamook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stone Axe of Berkamook by Mary Grant Bruce Section 24 Wurip the Firebringer Chapter 3 Wurip lay on his back in the shade of a golden wattle and listened idly to the bush voices talking round him. He heard far more than you would ever hear, voices of whispering leaves and boughs, of rustling grass and softly moving bodies. Not a grasshopper could brush through a tussock, but Wurip knew that it had passed. 
Overhead, birds were twittering gaily in the branches. He knew them all. Had he been hungry, he might have wanted to set snares for some of the little chirping things. But just then he was too well-fed and lazy to trouble about such tiny morsels. He bit long grass stems lazily and tried to sleep. A pair of jays flew into a tree close by and began to chatter to each other, and suddenly Wurip found that he knew what they were saying. Somehow it did not seem surprising that he should know. Afterwards he wondered if he had dreamed it, but at the moment nothing was strange to him. The jays, eager and chattering, did not notice the little black figure in the grass. They were too full of their subject. "'The firewomen have nearly finished their weaving,' said one. "'Soon the last mat will be done. They have worked very quickly since Wurip brought them rushes.' "'And then they will go away?' said the other. "'Yes, then they will go quite away, and there will be no more fire for ever. <laughs> what would the tribe say?' "'And Wurip?' "'Yes, Wurip also. What will he do when they have gone? "'He will go back to his people, I suppose. He cannot go with the fire women. I think, brother, said the smaller jay, that they mean to sail away on their mats to another country, taking fire with them. Certainly they mean to go, and to take fire with them. Did we not hear them talking about it while we perched on their whirly? said the other. As for sailing away on their mats, I do not see how that can be. Mats are not like wings. You are a foolish young bird. Well, why do they make them so strong and large, and how else will they get away? asked the other, looking down his beak in an abashed way, but still sticking to his point. You cannot tell me those things. I do not care to know, said the big jay, and that was untrue, because jays are very inquisitive. What does it matter? They are only humans. But I wonder what Wurip would say if he knew. Wurip thinks he will take fire back to the tribe, but I do not think he will ever get it. The fire women watch him too closely, and anyhow, he is only a little cripple. He would be excited if he knew what we heard them say that if they lost any of it now, all the rest would go out, and then their power would leave them, so that they could work no more magic. He <laughs> he chattered the other jay, but he will never know that. They do not talk when he is near. No, they are wise. It is a very foolish thing to talk, said his brother solemnly. Yet they chattered for a little while longer and then they flew away. Wurip lay motionless under the wattle tree, and forgot to bite grass stems any more. He was not sure whether he was awake or dreaming, and he did not greatly care, because he felt that the warning that had come to him was true, whether he had dreamed it or not. It fitted in with the little things he had noticed. Lately the firewomen had been very busy at their weaving, working day and night, so that he could hardly bring them rushes quickly enough. A great pile of mats lay ready in a corner of their whirly, and now they were working together at the largest of all. They had seemed restless and excited, too, and talked earnestly together, although they were careful not to let him hear anything and never to let him go near the fire. Not that they seemed to fear now that he would try to approach it. Wurip had been very careful, never even glancing towards it, as he worked about the camp. He was allowed to place his firewood at a certain spot, and took great pains not to go beyond it. 
in every way in his power he used to try to make them think that he was afraid of fire and dreaded to go too close to it since he had burned his arm by this means he seemed to have put their suspicions to sleep and they regarded him as a harmless little fellow of whom they need have no fear he made his way back to the camp slowly thinking hard if the fire women were really going away he must act and act quickly at any time they might finish their work and then they would disappear for ever and there would be no more fire to warm the people of the earth wurip drew up his thin little body as he walked and clenched his fist he made up his mind that he would act that very night he found the camp just as usual with the fire women working at their greatest mat of all weaving it in and out in a curious device of green and white one held the white strands and the other the green and their black hands worked so quickly that wurip could scarcely see to which women they belonged he looked at it with great admiration and ventured a timid word of praise then he went a little way off and began to skin the native cats and bandicoots that he had brought home when he had prepared them for cooking he laid them carefully on crossed sticks and put them in a shady corner it was growing dusk and he hurried off to find firewood all the time he was turning many plans over and over in his mind and rejecting one after another as useless well he thought he must trust to luck he came back to the camp with his bundle of wood and began to heap it in the accustomed place keeping a respectful distance from the fire and bending down his eyes lest their burning desire should be seen already the sun had gone away over the edge of the world and darkness was coming fast the fire women had been forced to stop weaving for the pattern of the great mat was too fine to weave by firelight generally when they had finished one carried the work into the whirly while the other remained outside to watch wurip and begin the cooking but the great mat was now too heavy for one to lift and so they rolled it up and carried it away together wurip crouching over his heap of firewood felt his body suddenly stiffen like a steel spring under his brows he watched them and as the whirly hid them he darted forward snatched a big fire stick from the glowing coals and fled with great noiseless bounds that carried him in a moment far into the dusk behind him he heard a sudden loud anguished cry and knew that the fire women had found out his theft for a moment he feared that the magic wall would spring up to bar his way and he ran as he had never run before but it did not come and into his mind swept the words of the jay that if fire were taken from the women they would lose their power of magic he hardly dared to think that could be so but as he ran on finding no unseen obstacle in his way hope surged over him magic was a thing against which no man could fight but if he had only ordinary women to deal with he was not afraid a few hundred yards from the whirly he glanced back and saw that their fire no longer sent its red gleam into the dusk his heart leapt with joy for it seemed as if the jay's story must be true and if so the fire women's hearth was cold and already the only fire in the world was what he carried the greatness of the thought caught his breath surely such an honor should be for the bravest warrior of the tribe and not for a half crippled undersized weakling like him and behind him came a sudden trampling of running feet and a cry of such terrible anger that the very waterfowl in the swamps hid themselves in fear the fire women were on his track 
Wurip ran forward, leaping from tussock to tussock, sometimes slipping into bog holes and scratching his bare limbs on great clumps of sword grass. In his withered hand he clutched the fire stick, the other held his waddy, and sometimes he was glad to use it to help himself over rough places. Luckily he knew the ground well. There was no part of it that he had not studied on his days out hunting, knowing that at any time he might have to make his dash for home. He hid the glow of the fire stick as much as he could, holding it so close to him that his skin was scorched by it. But his precautions could not conceal it altogether, and to the firewomen behind him it was like a red star twinkling low down upon earth. They came after Wurip swiftly. At first they had uttered savage cries of wrath and fierce threats of what they would do to Wurip when they caught him, but soon it seemed that they knew that shouts and threats were useless, and after that they hunted him silently, only the quick pad of their feet being heard in the darkness. They were terribly quick feet. Wurip had not dreamed that women could run so fast. Sometimes, as the moon rose, he could see them in pursuit, grim and revengeful, looking like giants in the darkness. His soul was full of terror at the thought of what they would do if they caught him, for he knew that he would be but a little child in their hands. They crossed the swamps and morasses and the reed-fringed creeks, and here Wurip lost ground, for he had to go very carefully, lest he should slip and so drown the precious fire-stick that he held so close to him. Only a black fellow could have kept it alight so long, but Wurip knew just how to hold it so that the air fanned it enough to keep the dull coals glowing without letting it burn too quickly away. He heard the fire women splash through the creeks not far behind him. Then they came into the scrub country, all running at their wildest speed, for this was the last part of the journey back to the tribe. Then Wurip knew that he must be beaten. He was nearly done. His breath came unevenly, and his limbs were like lead, and would no longer do his bidding. Fierce and untired, close behind him came the fire women. A little ahead he knew of a bed of green bracken fern in a gully, and he set his teeth in the resolve to get thus far. They were quite near him when the dark line of the gully showed somewhat to his left. He threw all his remaining strength into a last spurt of energy, and then, turning from the straight line towards the camp of the tribe, he crept through the scrub to the gully, holding both hands over the fire so that it might not guide the firewomen to his place of refuge, and heedless of the cruel burning, he reached the gully safely and flung himself face downwards among the rank ferns and nettles, panting as if his heart would burst from his body. He heard the women run past, tirelessly swift. There came to him their angry voices, calling softly, lest they should miss each other in the dim scrub. They had not seen him swerve, that was clear, and Wurip hugged himself with joy to think that, for the moment, he was safe. When they had passed, and the sound of their feet had died away, he crept from his gully and fled in a northerly direction. He ran all through the dark hours, with long trotting strides, as a dingo runs, and circling round so that he might miss the firewomen and come upon the camp from the other side. Sometimes he paused to rest, listening for the sound of the other hastening feet. But they did not come, and at last he believed that he had escaped pursuit. He was very tired, so tired that at last he lost something of the black fellow's keenness that guides him through even unknown country in the dark. Something seemed to have broken in his chest from the time of his last mad spurt from the firewomen, and now each breath stabbed him. Perhaps it was because he was so tired that at last he became confused altogether and swerved from the track he had mapped out for himself to get back to the camp. 
and when dawn broke he was back in the direction where he might expect to meet pursuit. Even as this dawned upon him, he looked up and saw the firewomen running silently towards him, their fierce eyes gleaming. Wurip knew it was the end. He fled, knowing as he went that he could not run far. Behind him came the women, tireless, as though they had not spent the night in fruitless chase. He clutched the fire-stick to him, scarcely knowing that it burned his hands and his naked chest. Rounding a clump of saplings, a sob burst from his laboring chest. Before him he saw the familiar camp, the whirlies clustered together. It seemed to smile at him in home-like fashion, so near home to fail. He spurred himself to the last effort. Then from the camp burst a knot of fighting men, racing towards him. He caught the glint of the rising sun on their spears and throwing sticks, and he waved to them, for he could not shout. They came on with great strides. There was music in the sound of their trampling feet. When they came to him they divided, running past him, and Wurip staggered through the lane they formed. He heard fierce cries and blows behind him, but he did not stop. Before him the camp lay, and never had it smiled to him a welcome so sweet. There were people running out to meet him, men, women, and little children. He could hear their voices, amazed and rejoicing. Wurip! It is Wurip bringing us fire! He tried to smile at them, but his lips would not move. So he staggered into the circle of the huts, and there fell upon his face, still grasping the red fire-stick in his blistered hand. It was all red now, for it had burned down to the last few inches. Then as they clustered round him, lifting him with gentle hands and blessing his name, he smiled at them a little, and died peacefully, happy that he had brought back fire to his own people. But to the people he did not die. Ever after they honored his name, calling him the benefactor of the tribe so that in death he found that honor that forgot he had ever been little and weak and a cripple. And when you see the little fire-tailed finch that hops about so fearlessly, with the bright red feathers making a patch of flame on its sober plumage, you are looking at Wurip, the fire-bringer, who gave his life to vanquish the wicked fire-women and to lay fire once more upon the hearthstones of his tribe. End of section 24. Read for you by Ted DeLorm in Fort Mill, South Carolina. If you like, you may follow me on Twitter at that darn Ted. And end of The Stone Axe of Berkamook by Mary Grant Bruce.